Okay, good morning council, staff. Looks like we just about have everyone. I'm just counting up the number of councillors here. Councillor Schumacher, I know you're here. I can see your name. I don't see Councillor Withy yet, but we will get started. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. And I will confirm that we have quorum. Looks like Councillor Withy is still missing, but I'm sure he'll be with us momentarily. Um, the clerks have assigned all the movers and seconders for the motions today. And if there's any objections, please just let me know. Um, just a reminder, Council, that this is Workers' Day of Morning. I believe our flags would be have been lowered to half mast today. And uh, it's also Administrative Assistant Day and uh, Administ Administrative Assistant Professional Day. Anyways, um, and our Administrative Professional is Brenda Jones, and uh, she certainly keeps me on the straight and narrow, as I'm sure she does most of you guys too, so thanks for that. And um, just one other note, Council, we are short staffed today as far as the clerk's department goes. Crystal's not with us, so um, Tanya's probably doing triple duty, bringing people in and out of the meeting as well as everything else she does. So patience if we um, slow down at any point. And with that, I have a motion moved by Councillor Armour and seconded by Councillor Weeb is recommended that the general committee meeting agenda dated Wednesday, April 28, 2021 be adopted as printed and circulated. All in favor. And that carries. And are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest today? That's pretty good because we have a long agenda. Um, we have a very long agenda. We have uh, multiple delegations today. So I will ask everyone to um, keep their presentations as short as possible. We do have a 10 minute uh, time line, but uh, if you can keep it shorter, that would be better. But first we're gonna start with an invited and ceremonial presentation to a very long serving um, member of our staff. Morvan, will you, will you show yourself on screen? Oh, there you were, and now you're back. Morvin, on behalf of Council. Good morning. On Good behalf morning. of Council, I, uh, I really want to thank you for 27 years of service, all I think in the aquatics department, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, a, a department that I'm sure had its challenges over the year, but years, but also um, lots of excitement and, and lots of uh, leaps and bounds. That's almost as long as our pool's been open, I think. Not quite. Not, Not quite. quite. <laughs> Anyways, it's a long time and uh, we certainly appreciate all the years you put in and we wish you the very best for your retirement and hope that you have uh, a good, long and healthy retirement. Thank so on you. On behalf of council, thank you very much. And I am going to, great. And there's, there's some silent applause going on and I'm going to ask um, your director, Simone, to say a few words as well. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mayor Terziano. Um, Morvin Barnes, I, I, I hope I don't embarrass you too much, Morvin, but you're going to have to sit through this for just a minute, and then it's all going to be over. Quick like <laughs> Band-Aid, we'll take this off. Um, Morvin Barnes is aka the Morvinator. She has <laughs> dedicated 27 years to the town of Huntsville. And in many ways, she has um, exceeded the challenging requirements and expectations that have come with the job. Her outstanding leadership, her tireless efforts, extra miles, and her significant contributions to the aquatics industry and this community make her highly deserving of her earned time off and her next great adventures of camping, kayaking, and traveling. Morvin is unfailingly passionate about aquatics, her colleagues, her staff, and her customers. Morvin has been known to cook dinner for her staff on training nights and they look forward to every one of them, the meals and the training. Um, her customers love her and consider her family and her colleagues know her as the example to follow. I have had the extreme pleasure to know and work alongside Morvin for the past 10 years. Morvin has dedicated her career and, and has continued to make lasting contributions to the aquatics and recreation industry. She is professional, a leader of vision and innovation and has always been determined to strive for excellence. 
congratulations, Morvan, on your retirement. You will be missed here as the aquatics manager, but we know that we will see you often at the pool. Yes, you will. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. So Morvan, I, I hope they have some parting gifts for you, which we can't do over the screen, but I'm sure there are some. And uh, so once again, just all the very best. And Thank you're still you with so us much. till June, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Ho hopefully we get the doors open and we see you before you're gone. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. It'd be, ni it'd be nice to retire from an open pool as opposed to a closed <laughs> one, wouldn't it? <laughs> I know. How do you leave from home when you're already there? Yeah. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Again, all the best. Thanks for thanks for coming in this morning. Thank you. Okay, Council, we have five deputations. So we're going to start with the first one, and that is Deanna Levine and Suzanne Riverin. And they have a verbal presentation for us. And who's going to take the lead on that? I can see you both here, I think. Deanna, yeah. I showed my, I, I'm on screen, I think I'm okay. Yeah. So I'm Deanna Levine, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, we are on the board of Enliven. I'm a kinesiologist on the board with Enliven Cancer Care, and we support uh, people in Muskoka with cancer or their caregivers and uh, medical health professionals that, that work with people with cancer. And I have been leading an exercise program since COVID, partly through COVID, I guess, when our cancer program at Motivations was shut down due to COVID. And I've been doing it lately on Zoom. We would like to use the Avery Beach, Beach Shelter outside when it's safe, when it's possible, under all restrictions or um, under all uh, safety precautions that we can that we can take. But I was just wondering if we could use that space for free uh, and have the fees waived to using it once a week for about an hour when it's safe and possible. We work with most of the people that I work with um, in the cancer exercise program don't get up and down off the floor very easily. So we don't do a lot of floor work and that shelter allows for a place to sit. It allows for the railing. It allows for bands to be wrapped around the posts uh, and there's some support there. I can bring equipment that we keep clean and sh don't share, but it's just, that's a nice opportunity. It's a nice location that could be used uh, for an exercise class and there would only be six to eight people. I would make sure that we followed all precautions necessary. So I was just uh, wanted to present that and ask um, that of council if that's possible to use that location uh, probably later in the summer, depending on the depending on everything COVID and into the fall maybe. Okay, thanks for that. And I'm 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 guessing it probably won't be a problem, and we will get to it at, at towards the end of our agenda under new business. But I will just ask if there's any questions from council for you before um, you go. Council questions, Councilor Armour. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Through you to Dan. So, um, do you look at this? So it's once a week, or is it every day? No, once a week. We once a week. And how many how many people are you looking at having? Uh, right now, there's six to eight that right. are going on the Zoom class. Uh, oh. When I looked at the shelter, I think that's possible to keep us apart at six to eight. Uh, that's perfect. I think that whole area is underutilized, so that's great that you're bringing this forward. Okay. Well done. Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I just wanted to say, Deanna, thank you for bringing this forward. I think it's it's uh, really neat that we have a, a, a facility that actually looks like it would be really appropriate. And, and so um, I'm absolutely supportive. And um, I really admire the work that Enliven does. So thank you. Kudos for bringing it forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks for that, Deanne and Suzanne. And um, we will uh, have a resolution probably at the end of the meeting and, the, and our parks and rec staff will, will contact you and, and work out the details with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this time and uh, I appreciate you. Okay, Take care. thanks. Have a good day.
Have a good day. Bye bye. Uh, our second delegation is a request to use River Mill Park for summer activities. And Dan Watson from the Huntsville Festival of the Arts is here somewhere. Dan, there he is. Hi Welcome, there. Dan. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I think I can do that. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Council. I'm here to talk about uh, some initiatives that the Huntsville Art Festival of the Arts is, is planning for June. Uh, we have an initiative called the Huntsville Art Crawl, which is a, um, a self-guided art tour that will be happening in and around downtown Huntsville. It's a partnership between the Huntsville Municipal Accommodation Tax Association, the BIA, uh, the Huntsville Art Society, Muskoka Unlimited, and, uh, and we're looking for support from the, the town of Huntsville through waiving some permit fees. Um, so the initiative itself is, um, the concept is that local artists get paired with local businesses and the local businesses will exhibit the artist's work. And then we promote the tour uh, so that we try to bring increased visitation to the businesses uh, and bring increased sales to the artists um, and, uh, and increased sales to the businesses as well, as well as, as um, supporting downtown businesses during this uh, challenging time uh, and bringing art in public spaces. Um, so there's, uh, no fee for any entry from the artist or the business's perspective. Um, the, what we do is we work with, uh, with the businesses and the artists to find the right venue for the right art and, uh, and that any sales of art in those businesses, the, the, the businesses will get a commission, a 20% commission on any sales. So there's, there's also a financial incentive and, uh, and benefit for, for the local businesses. Um, we're planning on doing this in June and uh, we realize there's lots of uncertainty. So we are, uh, we're being flexible, but the idea of this is because it is self-guided, um, it doesn't require, you know, large groups of people. People can do it on their own. They can do it, um, it within their own bubbles. And, um, and we're hoping that it will, uh, will support people who have been really affected by the, not only the pandemic, but by streetscape. Um, so in addition to the uh, art in the businesses, we're also looking at doing some public exhibits. Um, and the first thing that we wanted to do was to, again, exhibit the group of seven canoe murals. Uh, some of you may have seen it last year. Uh, so we worked with Jerry Lantain and in celebration of the group of seven's uh, 100th anniversary, he painted seven different canoes, each one featuring the work of one of the group of seven. Uh, very popular and a super success. So we what uh, we would like to do is to exhibit them again uh, throughout June in River Mill Park. And at the end of June, uh, working with Jerry again, and this time um, six other artists, including uh, plus Jerry, that we would make seven more uh, canoes, this time featuring the work of Tom Thompson. And those canoes, they would be with the BIA, so the, the, those canoes would be sticking with the BIA and we'd work with them to find um, a home for after. Um, we're hoping that we can uh, uh, exhibit them throughout the summer. Um, the canoes themselves, you can see, uh, are... Here's a picture of us. Uh, that's with uh, Randy Mitz Mitzen from AO. So you can see that they are on um, custom built uh, saw horses so they can be moved quite easily. Uh, so that uh, if, if there are other events in the park or for maintenance, obviously um, we can move them away or we can take them to different spaces. Um, so that is, one of the one of the asks the other the other element that we want to have is a mobile art gallery uh, so we are creating a, a a movable art gallery that's basically a display case for artists that can be locked up um, so the idea would be to to place it on the town docks near river mill park just in front of river mill park it's quite small six six feet but it opens up so that you can have uh, sort of a 12 foot display area, basically a wall um, where artists, again, no, no 
charge for using this, but artists could display their work um, and it could be a nice walk by um, extra addition for people that are strolling down on the dock to, to look at some public art. Um, again, it is movable. Um, the idea being that we would open it up, you know, at 9 a.m. in the morning and close it up at 6 p.m. Um, it would be locked and that we would work on, on anchoring it to, to the dock itself. Uh, and that the Festival of the Arts would be, um, again, uh, taking it on and, and organizing it to make sure that it, it runs smoothly and that everybody gets a fair shake at it. Um, so it's not just certain artists, it's, it's open to anybody. Uh, and the, uh, so this is a proposed design. This is me sketching, so I'm not a carpenter, but, uh, but we are working with a legitimate <laughs> carpenter. So I just want you to know that. Um, we, don't want, we want it to fit in with the aesthetic of, of down there. So it's, it would be built, I think, using uh, some nice um, wood side paneling so that it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb and that it is uh, made to, to fit in with the rocks, the trees and, and the, the, the beauty of down by the river. Um, and the last uh, initiative that we're hoping to do is, is to create a, in the same spot, a busker pitch. Um, so as you can imagine, COVID has really, uh, really, really affected performing artists um, uh, with the amount of, of work. Uh, so the idea with this would be to create uh, something like you see, where we have an aluminum arch that's again, removable, um, and that we set up a tent just behind it with some signage and we create a, 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 a plexiglass barrier, which is what, which is what is needed um, so that performing artists could, could sign up to again, do um, uh, performances down on the town dock. The idea being it's not, um, not a concert, but more like when you're strolling through the subway and there's a busker there. And um, so that the opportunity to play, to put out the guitar case or, or the hat to, to have a few donations. Um, and the idea with that is not, it wouldn't be there permanent again. It would be um, Thursdays, you can see Thursdays and Fridays, five to eight, Saturday noon to eight, Sunday noon to five. And we would go with, you know, the amount of interest that there is. So for example, if nobody signs up uh, for a Saturday, we just wouldn't set it up. Um, uh, so that we're, we, we understand that this one, the busker pitch may be something that's a bit harder to do because, uh, it could, um, uh, there could be gatherings, but, uh, but we, given the, um, where we're setting it up, we, we think that it will be, um, more of a pass by experience. Um, so you can see Highlighted in yellow is where we're imagining having both the mobile art gallery and the busker pitch so that we've having spent a lot of time down there doing art in the in the park. Um, I've seen a lot of people stroll by there. They tend to stroll by there along the docks and into River Mill Park. Uh, so that's where we're we're hoping to set that up. Um, so our ask today, yes, is to waive permit fees for use of River Mill Park uh, and the town docks during the summer of 2021. Uh, we'll be working with Greg Pilling. I've already had lots of conversations with him um, and, uh, and obviously putting together COVID safe uh, practices with the health unit. Um, we understand that, uh, again, this is very uncertain times. Uh, so we're going to be flexible and obviously we will always be working within the health unit uh, restrictions and, uh, and trying to do best practices. Um, so that's our request um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Dan. Uh, questions, Council? Uh, Council Stone. Um, hi Dan. Uh, I love all the activities and, and that they can be done safely. The busker pitch, um, buskers don't usually have tents or the, that aluminum frame. Uh, would not just a, a rope fence at a distance be enough to have buskers there? Uh, thank you, through, through you, Mayor Terziano. Uh, Yes, it, it could very well be. Um, we What we wanted to do is just add a little bit of an ambiance, I think, uh, in terms of, um, 
having a, a, a tent there and an aluminum frame with some signage so that it's, uh, it looks a little bit more official and um, that, that even there may be a day in, in terms of rain uh, where obviously I don't think a busker is going to be out there in the pouring rain, but there may be one of those days that's sort of, you know, is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain kind of days? And we'd love to give the busker a little bit of um, uh, protection from the elements. Uh, just as a follow-up, uh, we do have the band shell uh, on a day like that. Um, anyways, it's just a thought. Um, thank you, and through you, Mayor Terziano. So we we did consider the band shell. I think that the the for us the site itself it actually lends itself to gathering. Uh, there is what we found um, with the band shell because there is a large open space in front of it. Um, it's not a thoroughfare. It's a place you go and you sit, right? Uh, as opposed to what what I have seen and witnessed on the docks is that's kind of a thoroughfare. People get their ice cream or their um, their food and they sort of pass by. And so that's what we were we were looking for. the The, the band shell could be an option, but our concern would be that uh, it would attract more um, uh, gathering. Deputy Mayor Alcock. Thank you, Your Worship. And thanks, Dan, for the presentation. Um, it was fun reading it uh, last night and um, equally fun listening to it. Um, I think the art crawl, I've heard about it for a little while. And, and so it was really fun to see what it actually how it will roll out. I think that's a fantastic idea. And um, I, I suspect could be highly successful for both businesses and artists. So uh, kudos to the festival for, for coming up with that. That's really cool. Um, I do have a, and I also love the pop-up trailer. Um, I've seen that elsewhere. And I, I just think that's, again, it's another wonderful opportunity for artists. And it's a, a great thing for, for people for tourists, for locals who, who want to see exhibits. It's bringing vibrancy to that side, to the River Mill Park. And that's always a really important goal. Uh, the, my question is, um, it's around the, the canoes. I looked at the space that the canoes take up. Again, this is not a negative. I think it's, it's you know, uh, the, the work that Jerry does is amazing. And, and how lucky are we? Um, you said that they're, they're easily moved. And I, I see the River Mill Park as being really a primo spot during COVID. And so there are a lot of competing interests, you know, whether it's people who just want to go and relax in the park or whatever. And I, or if we ever host, a, have events again, you know, whatever. Um, how easy is it to move, you know, move the, the installation, because I see that sort of as if it's an installation. And I know you said it's easy to lift the um, horses up and move them, but who would be on tap to do that if, if it needed to happen? Uh, thank you through you, Mayor Terziano. Um, yeah, the Huntsman Festival of the Arts would essentially is, is the short answer to that question. Uh, we we are, as you may know, our studio is actually right uh, lo overlooking the park. Um, so it's it's right uh, below uh, the Friendly Fox, right next to the Mill on Main. So we would be having, uh, we would be there and uh, we would be on tap to, to move them if needed. Uh, this is a, also, I just want to mention, this is a proposed site and uh, we'd be working with um, Greg Pilling to, to make sure that, you know, if you're finding that there's lots of different stakeholders, as you say, and, and, and ask for use, uh, we can be flexible about where they go. As you may have seen last year, we actually had them in a lot of different places downtown, which, right. which worked well, but it was, uh, what I was quite surprised was when we put them all in the park, how much that actually attracted attention and kind of captured people's imaginations. Uh, we had a video on Facebook that was shared over 700 times and seen, you know, by 60,000 people. And it was just me uh, <laughs> with a video with my, with my iPhone. So it's, it's something that does really get a lot of attention. I think when they're all together, you really get the sense of the scope of, of the, the kind of work. Thank you for that answer. And, and again, fantastic ideas, Dan. Thank you. 
Okay, Dan, thanks for that. Again, like the previous one, we will be dealing with it towards the end of the meeting and, um, and then uh, um, we'll have the appropriate people contact you. And, and uh, I think, I, did I see one more hand there just as I, yeah, I did. It's Councilor Schumacher, sorry. Yeah, it was me. So, somewhat Dan did answer um, when he answered uh, Deputy Mayor Alcock though, so through you. Um, Again, echoing uh, what Deputy Mayor Alcock said is that I do appreciate the art installation and everything. I mean, one of the things I did notice last fall was a lot of people doing the weekend, you know, group of seven walking tours. Uh, the amount of people doing that group of seven walking tour last fall was phenomenal when I was downtown just seeing people out and doing that. So I know there's a huge market for that, um, for getting people in and being able to, to tour the town and, and showcase that. The question, I guess, to me, and you sort of did allude to it, you're going to work with Greg. I mean, last year we had some people want to do like yoga on the dock and different things in, in the park to create Again, we just had a presentation about fitness and, and exercise. And I know that there's been sort of a, a bit of a push because people with COVID are kind of have been stuck at home and muscles have atrophied. So any opportunity for somebody to get out and do a bit of yoga is probably not a bad thing either on the dock. So you'd work with Greg and the other, you know, people. I mean, it was mostly, I think, mornings they were using the dock. So you'd sort of work around that. Yeah, thank you, uh, through you, Mayor Terziano. Yeah, absolutely. And and if we if we found that, hey, this is only something that it probably makes sense in June during the art crawl, we can absolutely be adaptable to to that as well. Um, where as you can see, we're, we're we're we've learned if if we've learned anything over the last year, it's it's that we have to be flexible. So um, and this is this initiative is trying to do that and trying to support uh, and find creative ways to do it. Okay. Again, Dan, thanks so much for an exciting series of ideas there, and uh, we will get to it later on. Thank you very much. Okay, Council, we have a third request for uh, uh, space um, in River, this is another one in River Mill Park, and we have John Gallagher and Aaron Asir. Did I say that right, Aaron? So. Good morning, Council. John Gallagher here, and I'm here with Aaron Nasir. Um, we're here today to uh, ask, quest uh, the potential of leasing a portion of the River Mill Park and a dock at the end of uh, the existing dockage for an exciting new tourist attraction. The proposal involves uh, two parts, one uh, on the water and one on the land. And the first section with the water is these unique dining uh, vessels. And these vessels uh, are used in different uh, parts of Europe in tourist uh, areas. And what they have is approximately five to eight, eight people on each of the boats. And they go out there, enjoy their meal in a closed setting, traveling along the river for about an hour and a half to two hours and then coming back to the main dock. The operation is proposed to run from uh, May to the till November, hours of operation 9 to 8.30. The boats themselves will be uh, approved, have, have been approved by uh, Canada. Um, with the uh, boating section, we would be requesting uh, to build a dock at the beyond the existing dock uh, that's already to the north uh, west of River Mill Park. The, the second component, and we have provided some uh, photographs in the agenda, I believe you have them. The second component uh, involves uh, the land portion and we've identified a location that uh, they would like to lease for uh, seating for around 50 persons. It would be licensed for beer and wine as well. There would be an eight by uh, 40 uh, food uh, preparation uh, unit. Um, as I had said, uh, we are looking at um, you know, a unique situation. There hasn't been any of these, I don't believe in Canada. Um, and we think that uh, it's a lot different than 
going out for a boat cruise with 40 other people. This offers opportunities for families to get together and dine on the water, uh, do their time, and then come back into shore. The, um, I think that uh, we did meet with um, we did meet with staff prior to our submission, and they advised us to uh, put forth the submission to the general committee. And uh, the uh, with respect to the uh, food uh, and any other questions that might be available, I shall turn it over to Aaron, and then he can uh, sort of go over his items. Thank you. Thanks, John. Hey, Councillors. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to to be on online speaking with uh, with everyone. Uh, I'm very interested in the uh, Huntsville opportunity in introducing um, authentic barbecue. Uh, currently, uh, been invited to the World Championship with uh, Myron Mixon to compete in Memphis uh, this May. Um, what I what I'd love to do is. Uh, just bring real authentic barbecue to city of city of Huntsville. Okay, I am going to go to questions. Uh, Councillor Withy. Thank you, Worship. That that sort of sounded like a question to me. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, I see motors on these things. Uh, who's driving them? And do you, are you supplying a driver? Or are you just letting people go out and run them themselves? And maybe, you know, you could, what, and then what happens? I mean, you got to make sure they have boater licenses and I'm just, just, there's that question. Uh, first of all, uh, and then I have a, another one. Uh, to, answer, so to answer your first question, it's a very small motor, about four four cylinders. Um, it doesn't require a boating license because it, it doesn't even create a wake on the water. It's it's very maneuverable and very simple to operate. So um, that brings up another question. How did so you're 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 sort of renting out these crafts and is there somebody who's going to check on the competency of of who's running these and is there age restrictions is there if there's yeah. no border license uh, i guess um, yes um, we, we make sure that they have a valid driver's license to begin with um and that uh i mean in terms of operating we're already operating these units in over 60 countries and we haven't had any issues with driving competency, it's it's like I said, it's very simple maneuvering uh, boat, and the and the motor is so small, you, you're not you're not on those for speeding up and down the uh, canals and what have you. It's uh, very slow going, and the purpose of it really is just to uh, to be able to maneuver a little bit. But again, it doesn't create wakes. Uh, this is very very easy to to drive these things, and we've done it with over at this point probably over a million tourists around the world. So if I may, uh, Your Worship, um, do you have any kind of rescue boat or something if somebody gets hung up somewhere or gets out into the lake and gets the wind yeah. pushes them all the way to Deerhurst or something? <laughs> yes, <laughs> sir. Uh, Councillor, uh, yes, we do have a, a, a smaller little boat in case uh, it, it, it runs out of, of, of juice or what have you, but uh, we haven't had an issue like that at all. So uh, they're basically out there for an hour to two hours max, and then they're back. So we haven't had any issues at all with the boats or those type of scenarios. It, is there a way to keep in communication with these things when they're out there? Yes, uh, there's a small walkie talkie uh, that is on board of the, these vessels. Should there be any, any issues, uh, they could utilize that. And we can also notify them of the time that uh, they have uh, spent on it. And it doesn't look like they require life jackets or anything. No, no, they don't. Okay, Councilor Withy, I think you've had your share for now. <laughs> Deputy Mayor <laughs> Elkhorn. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, thank you for the presentation, both Aaron and, and John. 
Um, my question is, is uh, related to the uh, parkland proposal itself and uh, the selection of, of that site. And so if I'm correct, John, the, the area that is being proposed is what is currently sort of a naturalized area of the, the riverfront. And so, um, and I know that when we used to do the swim for hospice, that's actually where some of the swimmers would walk out of the water was right at that location. So for people who are not comfortable going in and off the dock, that is, if I'm right, that's the area that's being proposed. That, so that's the first part of my question. Then I have a follow-up if I may. So, so the area, is, as you see on the uh, Barclay proposal sheet, uh, that walkway is just to the uh, northwest of the existing dock. So that's not uh, where we're looking at, uh, you know, taking up any of the waterfront. As you move further up, there's a natural uh, jet out from the shore. And so any docking would be coming off the end of that area. We've tried to uh, pull back into uh, the one area, but we didn't want to intrude too far into um, the parkland either. So we tried to set a location that was on the fringe of the current development. And uh, so as far as people accessing the water, it's not our intent to block that off. There'll be a substantial uh, distance between the edge of the existing dock and a proposed new dock off the point there. If I may have follow up to that, so when you say a substantial distance, it, it, it just generally in the ballpark, what might that be? Well, if I'm looking at the scale of these drawings, I would say it would be at least uh, 35 to 40 feet. Okay, and then the second part of this question, if I may, Your Worship, is, um, given you're working on this, I'm assuming you've talked to planning about any sort of planning issues that might be related to putting a, a new structure on the waterfront at that point. And um, if we have any planning feedback on that. We don't have any planning feedback on it at this point. This is a uh, very you know, preliminary. We had to approach a committee first to get some direction from the committee. And uh, again, with the, I don't believe there was an issue with the, uh, the tour boat through planning and any of those issues, no, but definitely but the, but the they would have to review the location for sure. Well, I guess, and when you say the tour boat, you did talk about a structure that is a permanent eating um, where you can eat on land as well, right? Yes, a patio, I agree. Right, so so that's that's the part. Sorry, John, that's that's, that's the part. Okay. I would, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Councillor Armour. Thank you, Worship. Just a quick one. I, I know when Councillor Withy was asking about the motor, did you refer to it being a four-cylinder gas engine or gas motor, or is it electric? Uh, it, that would be gas, sir. Thank you. Councillor Stone. Um, it is, it's just a, a couple comments. Um, I don't know if you heard our discussion about food trucks on Monday night. Um, so uh, you plan on having a food truck type of vehicle in River Mill Park, is that correct? Um, not, a, not a vehicle, it would be a, a container. So uh, like you see like a shipping container and that would be designed inside as a, as a finishing prep area for the uh, barbecue itself. Um, if I may follow up, just, uh, I'm really intrigued by this. I think it's a, a, a neat idea. Um, I, I can't support the location. Um, the, there's lots of kids that play at the end of the dock uh, where the, the water's shallow right there uh, all day long in the sun. Um, so that location really is a problem as well as having a, another food not vehicle, but container rate right in River Mill Park like that, um, I would have concern with. But uh, another location in Huntsville might be very intriguing. Hmm. Councillor Weeb. Uh, thank you for your worship. Um, I'm just wondering if this was intended to be, uh, to go in this year and then perhaps uh, stay there permanently as a year, like year after year, if that was the intention. Um, and 
uh, yeah, I guess that's it for now. I, I, I'm really struggling with this. I have to be honest. I, I, I find it not just with the COVID thing happening now. I just, I find it incongruent somehow with what um, that area is, is about. So I, I'm, I'm struggling with it. But my first question is the, the intention long term. Who wants to take that? I can take that. The, the intention is it for, for it to be uh, seasonal. Um, uh, that, that's our plan. And then obviously in the winter, we would, uh, remove the unit and then, uh, resume it again, um, come, um, c come the next season. So it would, wouldn't be permanent. It would be seasonal. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Worship. Not through uh, you to Aaron or John. Um, is there an allowance or, or, uh, have you allowed for uh, washroom facilities um, uh, with, 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 this, uh, with this particular proposal? I think uh, looking at uh, a lot of these different uh, areas, uh, there would be a portable outhouse that's maintained uh, on a daily basis and uh, cleaned, et cetera. Um, there was the uh, washrooms at the old chamber building. I'm not certain of uh, what's uh, happened to those public washrooms, but uh, that's, uh, again, it's a seasonal use, and uh, that would be the intent there. Councillor Armour? Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, through you to John. Uh, John, I don't know if you're aware that um, we currently have hired a consultant to work on the waterfront design brief, and we've asked the public for input. So that encompasses that whole thing. So have you spoke to anybody about that? I wasn't aware of that, so... If uh, someone wants to pass that information along to me, uh, we'd be glad to uh, have discussions with them. Councillor Schumacher. Thank you through you, Your Worship. Um, so Aaron, you say this is sort of all over the world. What type of possible garbage or refuse might end up flowing out of the boats and into water? Does that happen? Um, Who cleans it up? It I haven't personally seen this happen. Uh, it's everything self-contained within the boat. Um, if, if, if somebody throws something out, which I have not seen done, uh, yeah, we would definitely go and pick that up right away. But honestly, most of the, everything that, that is cooked or, or placed in little containers all go back into one specific little picnic basket. So we haven't seen any, 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 any situations where people are throwing trays and all of that over the boat. Uh, and we also tell people ahead of time uh, while they're going on the journey, not to be throwing stuff over. I haven't seen it myself. Could it happen? Yes. And, it, and if it did, we would make sure that we pick, pick it up right away. I, I'm, I'm a guy that doesn't like to, to pollute or uh, have things floating in the water. So uh, I, I take care of that personally myself. Okay. Thank you. And just sort of follow up, Again, I might be dating myself here, which sounds kind of funny, but is that sort of location you're talking, is that the old like Navco space, the original Nav Navigation Company restaurant? No, the Navco was uh, further down where the, uh, the Huntsville Arts guy was just explaining that was their previous location. Okay, so John, just before you guys go, and we will have this on the agenda later on, but. I want to clarify a couple of things. So we have a request to actually build that you want to build a dock on a, on a piece of land to be determined. You also want to lease some of the town dock for permanent seating areas. For a, or lease the or space. Restaurant. Lease, right? Lease you the space, also, yeah. You also want to lease space to put your food container. On the land, yeah. And so it would be a dock and, and a portion on land. Okay. And you talked about having spoken with staff about this previously. So do they have the actual square footage and everything that you're talking about? No, we just identified a location on the map just to, you know, get some initial feedback. And uh, so that's okay. why we just kind of showed it where it is. Okay. I just want to make sure that when we get to the discussion that staff might have the answers we would need to make a, a decision. So, okay. Um, 
See no further questions. I, I thank you for the presentation. And as I said, we will be dealing with it later on. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, fourth delegation, deputation, uh, request for a reduction in security mount for a plan of subdivision. Lanny Dennis. Good morning. Good morning, Lanny. Welcome. I'm Marty Mayor Teresiano and committee. Um, I guess, would you like me just to proceed with what I'm about to say? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, Lanny Dennis, uh, Wayne Simpson and Associates, uh, 3-76 King William Street, Huntsville, Ontario, P1H uh, 184. Uh, represent the owners, Huntsville Highlands. Hopefully I won't take up much of uh, committee's time. I know you folks are extremely busy and have lots of deputations. Um, I think it's a fairly straightforward ask um, consideration for a different way to look at securities. Uh, the request is being made in order to allow for a, a realistic approach to having the project appropriately move forward. And the request is to mirror what the district is already doing. Uh, and the request is to remove is to move the internal works secured amount from 100% to 20%. Uh, in September 2020, uh, District Council <clears throat> approved a revised amount uh, to secure uh, municipal infrastructure required for the registration of draft plan. Uh, the historical requirement uh, was 100% uh, for securing those on-site works. Uh, the recent approval uh, now requires 20% uh, of these private on-site works to be secured. Any off-site works uh, would still require 100% uh, security uh, since the developer would be disturbing uh, existing municipal uh, infrastructure. Uh, the owners are moving forward with the registration of the first phase and the balance of the of the draft plan has received a, a two-year uh, extension. The um, upfront servicing costs uh, to facilitate the registration of the of the draft plan are in the neighborhood of about $2.7 uh, million required to be secured with the town and about a half million dollars to be required uh, secured with the district, uh, which includes the 20% uh, reduction uh, already applied to the securities. Otherwise, it would be about two million. So all in about uh, 4.7 million dollars. Uh, the 20 percent uh, would remain uh, until a building permit was available. In other words, all the works uh, required to facilitate the issuance of a building permit, um, including the connection permits to district services, would have to be uh, installed. What I what I what I liken this to or akin to is sort of <clears throat> it would be sort of the initial acceptance of the works that are required. So rather than holding, rather than posting 100% uh, to secure the works until initial acceptance, it would be 20% initial acceptance, and then the 20% would be held until uh, final acceptance of the uh, of the works. Um, the works, of course, would have to be uh, <clears throat> would have to be monitored by a by a qualified uh, uh, professional. Uh, they'd have to note uh, any deficiencies, uh, any outstanding works that would uh, uh, that are required, and those deficiencies and and the work that hasn't been completed uh, would require 100% uh, security, and that 100% uh, security would also be held in tandem with the 20% uh, that's already uh, posted. Uh, the approach, in my mind, ensures the works. Um, um, are completed uh, because the building permit is the ultimate approval in a draft plan of subdivision uh, for a new lot. Uh, while at the same time, this approach frees up some substantial and much needed cash flow uh, for the developer. The, uh, the result uh, is the developer's capital requirements are, are not doubled. So currently the developer is to pay 100% of the cost for the works and provide the town with 100% security for those works. Just in terms of a bit of background, in terms of the mechanism, uh, the LC amount is held in, a, in, your, in your bank account. Um, you pay a fee based on the amount of the LC. And as I've already mentioned, uh, what is in effect the LC amount out to your contractor to construct the works. So there's a fair amount of costs in there to secure works in order to facilitate the registration um, of a draft plan. I'm just gonna suggest that if, uh, if the developer does uh, default, uh, I'm not suggesting that here, but in, 
moving forward with any uh, reduction in the security amount, um, quite likely the town wouldn't go in to finish the subdivision, but rather restore it to a, to a safe condition. Um, as such, 100% security uh, likely isn't required and rather the 20% would be appropriate sufficient funds uh, to ensure that the subdivision is, is restored to a, to a safe, safe condition. And of course, the town is uh, fully protected as there'd be no building permits issued uh, unless the works are completed uh, or there is a top up to the outstanding amount, which is what I just, which is what I just said. Um, I, know, I know this is a specific request and I'm sure it would help uh, other developers bring along housing projects uh, at a more attainable price. And we know there's a significant shortfall on attainable rental uh, and ownership uh, for those wishing to live in, in the town of Huntsville and, and quite frankly, district wide. Uh, these costs are, are borne by the ultimate, uh, by the consumer, uh, the ultimate purchaser of the property and, and in part would help, uh, you know, uh, marginalize the cost of, of, uh, of bringing housing on stream. Um, so my ask is uh, uh, respect, respect the request committee consider a reduction to 20% uh, specifically for this project, but understanding um, it's a policy that's going to impact um, the town uh, across the board and other projects. Uh, so that's uh, that's my uh, that's my request. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lanny. Uh, are there any questions of council at this time? Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you for the presentation, Lanny. Um, you made reference to the fact that the district has already gone through a reduction and correct me if I'm wrong, but that was specifically for affordable housing projects. Uh, uh, no, um, it wasn't. <laughs> and I have a, I have a, a live example. Uh, we just registered a subdivision in uh, Mac tier in Georgia Bay township. Yep. And it certainly wasn't an affordable housing project. And we had an LC posted at hundred percent and they said, whoa, we're not doing that anymore. You can reduce it to 20%. So um, it was not just, at the, I, I think, I think uh, <laughs> Deputy Mayor Alcock, I think the impetus was there from, uh, um, what should I say, uh, a developer who specializes in affordable housing, but I think the policy was made globally across the board. It's funny, I, I can't remember, because that's a really interesting. I should know that. Um, I guess it, the, the, if I may follow up on that, that you mentioned this would help um, the developer for the Highlands. And um, so is there any intent for the developer to uh, pr produce attainable market housing? Would this would would this be the trigger to help the developer do that? Well, I or think are you saying that generally speaking, it might. I, I'm I'm saying generally speaking, it might. I don't think. I mean, um, uh, this first initial uh, phase um, is um, um, there's a there's an there's an offer between the purchaser and and the, uh, the vendor to yeah. purchase the property. And I don't think there, I don't think it's going to be what the term would be affordable housing. My terminology would be attainable with the cost soaring for building construction, um, as well as the, the extreme demand that the COVID market has created uh, is forcing the price of housing out of reach for most people in, you know, in, yeah. in the town of Huntsville who want to stay here. Right. They just can't afford to get into the housing market. So what I'm what I'm saying is, if if we look at, e even though it's not uh, it's not the ultimate uh, solution to it, everything that you can do to help bring that cost down mm -hmm. is helpful, because those people are the ones that ultimately pay the price to buy or rent. Well, I I, th I think you're right. I think it's an incredibly important issue, no doubt about it. And uh, so thank you for bringing it to the attention. Any further questions? Okay, Lanny, I, I, we will be dealing with this later on. I suspect we'll be looking for a report from, from our planning, building, probably roads department to uh, all combined on this to, to find out what the, what the impact would be, but, uh, but we will deal with it 
at the end of the meeting. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot for your time. Hopefully I didn't waste too much. <laughs> nope, thanks, thanks, thanks again. All right, take care, all right. Okay, and our final deputation today is Rob Taylor about an, a refreshment vehicle on town property in Port Sydney. Rob, welcome. How's now? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first, I just want to take a quick uh, moment to say thank you to uh, to the Honourable Mayor and to Council for uh, hearing hearing uh, this delegation today. I know everyone's very busy. It's been a long, it'll be a long meeting, so I'll try to keep it as brief as I possibly can. I also wanted to say a quick thank you to uh, Crystal Perogi and administration. Uh, she was really helpful and um, yeah, she was very helpful and very uh, organized and good to work with. Uh, also, um, Andrew Stiller in the bylaw office has been really great to work with. So, uh, so far, this has been a really good experience. Everyone has, I believe, has the information that I've so far sent out. Um, so in interest of time, I won't uh, go over much of uh, any of that at this point and really just get to our objective. Uh, currently, we have uh, three trucks. Uh, we had, uh, we rented one last year. We had owned one this winter. We've invested in building two new trucks. Two of them are currently placed. Uh, all locations, unfortunately, are changing from last year, so we're working hard to, to land things. Um, the third location, we see Port Sydney as a really great opportunity. I've been born and raised in this town and lived in Huntsville uh, for most of my life until coming back uh, about 20, uh, after about 20 years. So we think Port Sydney is a really fantastic location. We think that there is uh, a large amount of people and an underserviced market. Uh, in that space, no, with no disrespect to the current businesses that are currently uh, operating there, of course. Um, our objective here would be to locate our third and final truck in Port Sydney. Um, I, am, I have built this truck to be a year-round facility, although I don't think that the waterfront is a great space for year-round. I think it would just be too cold. Uh, and we are currently looking for a commercial space in the Port Sydney area uh, to move that to for the winter. So really our objective here is to look um, at being, being able to provide service to, uh, to the Port Sydney area specifically uh, for a hopefully the longest term possible of a, of a summer lease and uh, with renewing options. Um, what we've identified as a space that we think would work the best, but again, we're very amiable to uh, to council and to other suggestions. We know other people would know the area quite well as well, but we think that the area that's uh, down by the waterfront and um, off to the side of the parking lot, close to the washroom facilities down at uh, Port Sydney Beach at Mary Lake would be um, would be a good a good location both for parking, for accessibility, for visibility, and to provide a service for the people who actually go to that beach to be able to have a nice simple meal without having to cross traffic or or go any further away. Plus, that uh, particular power or sorry that particular location would be close to a power source. Um, power would be an important element to uh, to our uh, what I like to call an outdoor dining establishment because we feel like we can do much more than a typical sort of food truck. Uh, menu types. Uh, we would like to say that um, being, as we see it as an outdoor dining establishment, we think the right scenario would to be able to provide the right service to customers, Your Honor, would be to uh, to be able to have it licensed. Um, we're currently going through the process of licensing one of our other trucks. Uh, our other truck won't be licensed, but we'd like to see that as an opportunity. Nothing, we're not pinned to any specific requirement to be able to want that space, but we think that would be the right that would be the right service to be able to provide for what people would want for that area. And we're talking about our hours of operation being you know, closed by seven o'clock. So nothing that would be uh, excessive and um, just more simple light fare, um, families in and out. Um, we would like to enter, as I said, to begin a discussion on a lease of that space. Um, I have other examples. Uh, one of my spaces is, is in another township. Uh, so we have examples of those leases and one is with a private uh, citizen here in Huntsville as well. Um, we we feel with our expansion, we will be adding to our core staff. We'll have uh, up to 15 people uh, between those three trucks, um, combination of full-time and part-time. Certainly hiring locals is our best interest. I've got a lot of uh, history in the uh, restaurant business. We think there's jobs that would be, uh, people be needing jobs at this point because there has been some slowdown. 
Uh, so we think that we're adding to the local economy and we're adding to local economy at a time where our particular product and service benefits the requirements that people have at this point. Uh, to be able to just walk up and take away food uh, and to be able to do it in a safe dining establishment, which we have experience of. Our management team, as I said, we in, our, in my um, brief proposal there, we have about 80 years of experience uh, collectively between us. So we feel we've got the right experience to, to pull off a product that makes good sense and does a good job for the area and that we can all be proud of. Uh, and I guess that I would at this point, just for the timeline, turn it over to council because I'm sure there's questions and we'll see what we can do from there. Thanks, Thank you. Rob. I'm sure there will be some questions, and I'll turn to Council now. Questions from Council. Councillor Armour. Uh, thank you, Worship. Too. I'm just curious, does somebody have a, uh, be able to put a map up that you actually show the location of where the food truck would be? It's, um, is that the east part of the parking lot or away from the beach? Oh, that would be... Uh, just what I've identified as uh, I think the right space, and I'm sorry that I don't have a picture here for you, although we could pull, I could uh, pull one up here, right by the washrooms there, and either backing into the hill or backing onto the tree line, but close to the washroom so that we're away from parking, we're not, um, you know, we're not having people, I'd, ideally I'd like to see customers come into a grassed area where it's, you know, something that's, um, away from traffic and so on. So in that space, right by the washrooms would be what I've identified as, as opportunity number one. There certainly are other options as well. Although the further we go away to um, from that particular space, the increased cost of installation due to power would be. So now that being said, there may be power in other locations uh, on that waterfront, but certainly the beach would have, that washroom would have power Sorry to interrupt. There. Are you talking the current Creekside Park area? Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. On Mary Lake. Okay. Um, Director Hearn, maybe while we go to the next question, I know that you often have your Google Maps up or your whatever. If you could find the area on a Google map and maybe share with us in a, in a moment or two, that might be helpful. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Weave next. Thank you, Worship, through you. Um, Rob, can you tell me where your other two trucks are located for this upcoming season? Yeah, for sure. Uh, first, I'll say where they were last year. Uh, we had a very successful season in our first year at Deerhurst Resort. Um, it was a short season, unfortunately, but it was uh, fairly successful. And uh, successful enough that I think that Deerhurst is renting a truck and doing their own. So we are moving that particular truck. Uh, we're in the process. Uh, the NTO uh, approvals are being worked on right now for uh, 869 Highway 60 at uh, Grandview Drive. I can't say that that is locked in stone because I don't have the MTO uh, permit in front of me yet, but um, I've been through the MTO permit process before and we should be just fine for that particular space. Uh, the other location is actually uh, in Armour Township at uh, Doe Lake Park uh, at Katrine Beach. So very similar sort of uh, installation to what I'm proposing here. Okay, I see Director Hearn and do you have that, Steve? Can you share that or just so we know exactly where we're talking about? Sure Thank you. Can. So just to familiarize everybody with the, uh, uh, the beach area, uh, down here is the beach. We've got the, the new dock that was just installed, as you know, uh, the washroom building, uh, Muskoka Road 10, and I believe the area this gentleman is talking about is right here. Um, that is where the septic bed is for the washrooms. Okay. Uh, may I, Mr. Hernan, if I could, the other space that I was uh, potentially speaking of would be on the tree line on the other side. Certainly we don't want to interfere with any septic beds. Is that the one, Rob, where, where the yes. first yes. one? Yeah, that's exactly right. And possibly, if I may, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking at a turn, I'm not that familiar. This is my third deputation, but I'm becoming a little more familiar. Um, may I ask if maybe possibly if Mr. Hernan might have ideas of other power locations in that space besides the power that would be servicing that washroom facility? Steve, do you, do you know if there's other power in that area? I know that the, uh, the, the skate, uh, when the rink is put in, they steal a little bit of power for a couple lights. And we've got a couple lights over here, but I don't believe there's near enough power to, to run a, 
a food truck, but without knowing his requirements, we'd have to do a little bit more work in it. I don't believe there's any power. Okay. Okay. Other than the washroom, I'm assuming is what you're saying. Correct. Thank okay. you. Thanks for that, Steve. Uh, further questions? Councillor Stone. Um, can you tell me uh, how close you are to permanent year round eating establishments? The closest establishment um, would be uh, across from the general store, the uh, Lakeside Inn, I believe it's called. And I think it's changed hands there recently. Uh, as far as the distance, to be honest, I wouldn't know the exact measurement, but I know it's probably about a five minute walk or so. Councilor Schumacher. Thank you, Three Your Worship. Yeah, Mary's Lakeside Grill. Um, Jameson's also has pizza and ice cream. So I know when we sort of do food trucks in town, we're looking at different fare than are normally in the area. So you've got Jimmy Z's Excellent Wings, you've got Heart of Muskoka Fries, you've got the Tap and Grill out at North Granite in those areas. Are you gonna offer something that would be different? Or are you gonna have the same type of menu that would pull from the established? Uh, through your mayor or through uh, the mayor, if I may answer that, uh, that's a great question. And no, our goal here, uh, I think it makes best sense for business practice. And we, I firmly believe that a rising tide raises all boats. And that certainly is our goal. Uh, we think the best opportunity for our business and, you know, the people who we would hope to have as uh, commercial neighbors in the future is for us to offer something that's slightly different. Uh, so we don't actually have, um, we've decided in this truck to not put a deep fryer in. So we are not doing um, fresh cut fries or French fries. Uh, we're doing warm, like hot served kettle chips. So we'll be making kettle chips in one of my other trucks that has those facilities and uh, doing the prep work there and then serving hot kettle chips here. Um, the concept itself is, well, if I may, it's so far it's sitting as called uh, praised cheeses, uh, gourmet grilled cheese, burgers and dogs. Uh, in addition to that, I actually, at my uh, my property, I grow as much uh, produce as I can for these trucks. So we actually have a very light fared menu as well. Salads and caprese salads and uh, different uh, fare that's meant to be lighter. We don't want to be just seen as a particular, you know, standard food truck operation. So uh, I'm sure any menu to be successful has to have some items that will have some crossover. But generally, the scope of that menu needs to be um different and it needs to be something that's identifiable and it needs to stand out um from from competitive purposes so i would think that there may be some crossover but no generally our goal would be to be um completely different okay and follow up so you say you are looking for something more permanent i get that you're trying to look at the beach traffic there but yeah would you look to maybe the strip mall out at port sydney or where Smith's gas station is, where you could get that sort of traffic down the road as opposed to taking public space at the beach. Smith gas station would be, that is, uh, that would be what I've highlighted as a space for um, a winter location for sure. We think that there's an opportunity to service snowmobilers and so on. Um, I would say to be all on, to be quite honest here, I would think that the right product, the right opportunity we want to service the customer and we want the customer to have a great experience. And we think that the waterfront area provides a great experience for, um, for our customers and for the, and to be able to provide that service at that waterfront, I think enriches the experience available to people uh, accessing the waterfront. I don't know that I honestly don't know that sitting in a strip mall beside the highway is really something I'd want to put my investment into because I don't know that uh, I don't know that's a great experience for our customer base. And the other big concern is as we really look to locate things uh, during these particular times, we have to look at where our particular uh, customer base might be coming from. And with restrictions and so on, uh, I feel it's extremely important to land our location in, in a place that has small veins of potential revenue from a broad scope of people. So some locals, which I don't think we'd get uh, as much up at the highway, um, although we would maybe get some passerbys, but then some some tourism as well. I think we need to have a broad mix across the board of who our potential customer base is so that we've got our best chance to be successful during somewhat uncertain times. Okay. One, one last one, sorry. Again, we're talking public sort of land. 
excess garbage? Who's cleaning that up? What is that yes. going to look like? And again, I guess looking at your fees on a public space versus what somebody else is going to pay to have their own private, I do have a bit of issue that I'm grappling with on that. But that's personally myself. I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. Um, Are you cleaning up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So basically, yeah, the biggest part of my job as someone with uh, three trucks is my job. I have a truck and a trailer designed to go around and service all three trucks where we pull fresh water out or sorry, put fresh water in, pull wastewater out, take garbage away, restock food. Uh, yeah. So absolutely. There'd be no requirements from, uh, from the township at all, as far as maintenance or any garbage, raking the lawn. Like our job would be to, and it behooves us to make sure our, our location looks as good as possible. So as far as raking, keeping things clean, uh, I did provide some pictures of what we've done in the past. Our goal is not just to put a box out there with an awning and hope people will stop. We try to put tables and planter boxes and uh, fencing and just make it a really, the term outdoor dining experience is very important to me because it's a real, it's a real scenario in the marketplace that, uh, and we feel it's really on point for what's necessary at this point. So our goal would be to have that space look as beautiful as possible. And for us to be able to maintain that really the town just needs to collect my check. Listen, I think if, if we if we do grant any licenses or enter into licenses, there will be lots of details in there about who's responsible for what. So, um, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a, a question for, for Rob. Thanks for your presentation. And your other two locations, I realize one's potential location. Um, are they look they're both located on public property or private property one is on private property um and uh, councilor fitzgerald and the other is on public property and which one is the public property public right. property is at doe lake park in katrine beach in armor township and that is our truck uh, called pulled barbecue and smokeria and, and you've made an arrangement with the township for that lease yes okay yeah, we have our lease signed and uh, we're just about to go through the installation process there. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we've exhausted the questions, Rob, and like everything else through the deputations, we will be dealing with it later on in our meeting and you will be advised. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again. Okay, council, that brings us to the end of our deputations. Um, I do have a, a bit more of a deputation in a way or an invited presentation, I guess, and that's if we go to new business in our town hall working group and the replacement of the, the front stairs at town hall, which we determined a couple of meetings ago uh, had to be done because they were crumbling. So we've got some updates from the working group and from um, an architect and uh, Mr. Nagy is going to give us a brief introduction before um, the architect shows council some pictures. Chris? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Your Worship, and thank you, committee, for uh, having me this morning. Um, as uh, Mayor Terziano suggested, um, we do have a, we, or sorry, we do have Heather Gib Gibbons from uh, Duncan Ross Architecture um, with some concept drawings for the front entryway. Um, just so you know, there are uh, about five options. The last three are kind of reconfiguration of the, in in the, of the inside. Um, two of them reflect a staircase coming off of the, off the front um, as it's uh, in its current state. And the last actually incorporate an interior staircase um, to achieve that fire access route that we need from that second floor. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to, uh, to Heather, but I will stay um, part of the Zoom if there are any uh, questions. So Council, just before Heather starts, um, I think it's probably going to be important that she's able to um, keep these pictures on the screen when we go to questions. Um, so it might be such that if I can't see everybody, just be patient and I'll keep scrolling through. I just don't want her to take the pictures down for the question period if we don't have to, okay? Go ahead, Heather, whenever you're ready. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I will start sharing my screen and then you can all see the images that I'm looking at. 
Okay. Um, so if you see right now, uh, right now I have a floor plan and a 3D image. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure everyone you, you're seeing that clearly. Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. So this is option one and option one, it maintains an exterior stair um, and the public washrooms. So um, this, the first two options really maintain a similar design language to the original town hall building. Um, and uh, what was important here is for this option, yes, we maintain a similar language, but we also created a platform for what we could call the Skoka moment and a platform for future festivals or performances. And this option, well, unfortunately, this, this existing door has been removed, but there, that door would be maintained. And the door um, here would be the entrance to the existing Club 55. So I don't know if you really want me to, ex to expand a little bit more. Or do we want to open up to questions after each design? I, I think, Heather, if you don't mind going through all of the designs first, and then maybe we'll come back. Okay. So I'll go to option two. So option two, this, this design really reflects what the original intent of the stair was. So if you look at the original designs of the building, the stair was very similar to how it's represented in this design. So like option one, we are maintaining a public washroom. Um, the entrance to Club 55 would be tucked under the stair. And again, we're creating an area for festival performance and um, you know, for public use every day. Uh, right now, there are vines that go up the side of the front here of Town Hall. If those want to be maintained, we could uh, protect this uh, garden bed in this option. So in the plan, you can see um, from the main sidewalk, you would enter underneath the stair into the existing Club 55 area. So for option three, Option three is the first of the options that explores taking the exit stair and putting it uh, inside. So this really would decrease the amount of maintenance that would be needed. I uh, hopefully wouldn't have any more of that crumbling stair. <laughs> um, so you can kind of see in the 2D, the stair would take over the existing public washrooms. So to provide public washrooms, we would cut the existing kitchen in half and we would provide uh, a public washroom there. So the existing public washroom, this door here would now be the exterior stair, or sorry, would be the exit stair. And then the public washroom would be put on to this side over here. So this really gives um, a, a presence to the front of town hall and a, night, a beautiful entrance into the Club 55 area. Uh, the design language uh, took cue from what's happening at Algonquin Theatre. So the two spaces would, the two design styles there tie into each other. Uh, whoops. So the other options for A, for B, uh, and five, all have a very similar exterior, so I only really modeled it once. So I'll just give you a little tour of that first. And in plan, you can see that there's a large vestibule area that's just dedicated for the Club 55 area. Um, from this vestibule, you can enter into the public, uh, public washrooms here, but there's also a separate exterior entrance here to the public washrooms. So this vestibule could be 
that entryway could be locked off and really there would just be access here at a certain time of day. Uh, and again, we have an interior exit stair. For B is very similar, but we just put a little bit more area into the vestibule and there will only be two public washrooms. This, you could have some information here. It just creates just a little bit more of a larger vestibule space. And in option five, um, in this option, we took the ramp and the ramp was now in the Club 55 space and the vestibule is at the top of the ramp. Again, there is entrance um, to two public washrooms from the exterior, but also from the vestibule space. So if people are using this Club 55 area, they don't have to go outside to get entered the washrooms. They can go through the vestibule and into the public corridor spaces. So those three options all are very similar to what this option, this 3D is. So that was my attempt to keep things nice and short and give a synopsis of each design so I can open if I guess we can open to questions. Okay, thanks Heather. And I, what I will do is maybe get you to stop sharing your screen for a minute, okay. we may have to come back to it. So, so basically council, the, we, we started with a couple of designs to replace the front stairs in front of town hall. And then we, somebody came up with a great idea that maybe because we just need those stairs as a, as a basically a fire exit that we should look at putting them inside. And then we start to play with ideas about making the outside of, of that area look similar to the outside of the entrance into the theater. So that's how we got to there. So I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions or lots of comments as to what people think of the different ideas, but, but there's, there's sort of two ideas, inside steps or outside steps that we should probably focus on first. And I will start with Councillor Withy. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, wondering about, uh, I like these. Um, I think just in my mind, I'm thinking 4A, but I was wondering about costs. Do we have pricing for these options and, and what are the differences there? Because, um, you know, moving bathrooms and stuff like that is not necessarily cheap. Um, so that's my question. Are we going to see a, a comparison of the of the options for prices? We 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 will before we end up making any final decisions. But um, ironically, there's not a huge difference between um, the pricing on exterior stairs or interior stairs. So the work done for for both modeling there's not a there's not a um, there's not a very significant difference. Is that fair to say, Chris? Yeah, um, absolutely. The other thing I was going to um, state is, you know, through this process, we would be going out for an RFP as well. Um, so we would have the competitive competitive bidding on the on the overall project, which would be brought back to uh, um, to uh, councils for their consideration as well. So um, if I if I can add a little bit um, about the discussion on the interior stairs versus the exterior stairs. Um, I'm sure council could understand that the way that the stairs are situated right now and with it being a fire exit, there's obviously year round maintenance that, uh, that our facility staff have to ma uh, maintain uh, with that set of stairs. So by um, pushing the stairs on the inside, um, that would obviously alleviate a fair amount of uh, staffing time to, um, to maintain those um, because They've already, they already need to uh, snow blow out in front of the Algonquin Theater. They could potentially just snow blow a trail directly to Main Street. So something to definitely consider when you're, uh, when you're looking at these proposals. So. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Deputy Mayor Alcott. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, thank you for that presentation. That was, uh, that was interesting, Heather, I, um, and exciting all at the same time. Um, I, I, I do have a question. I think initially at the face of it, I, I like the first proposal, not because it's, you know, um, I guess what I liked about it was the, the gathering space that's a little above the street, but closer to the street. 
um, and I, I could see how that, you know, people would use it. And on the third proposal, you've got when the stairs are on the inside, you've got a gathering spot that's up higher that you access from the inside. And I, I was sort of curious um, what the thinking is about who might use that, that space um, as it's not sort of readily accessible to people walking along the street. So I, I, any thought around that um, would be um, interesting. And um, that, that's my question. I think probably not so much a question for Heather, but the working group did talk about that. And you're absolutely right. The, the upper balcony would not be readily accessible to the public. So it might not be a public space as a rule. Um, I think what Heather showed in that drawing was another gathering space a little lower down that was accessible though. Is that fair to say, Heather? Or do you want to see that third drawing again? Yeah, do you want me, I can show the sure. drawings again if sure. you want to take a look at them. And while Heather's grabbing that, if I may, Your Worship, just um, if the working group did talk about it, who, who did they think might use that uh, gathering space above? We just we just talked about it in in terms of it would not be a convenient space for the public to use because you would have to access it through the town hall. So we didn't really discuss who would use it. Just that it would be there would be some limitations, you know, or the access has to come from within town hall. Right, okay, so, all right, thank you. Your Worship, if I could uh, add to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, as most uh, as most of you know, this, this building is um, uh, heritage designation. So that front entryway is uh, noted as a heritage aspect. So there would be no you know, real intent or reason to remove that that doorway. So that patio space, first and foremost, is more or less, the, you know, the roof of that uh, of that section below. So, as uh, as um, Mayor Terziano pointed out, it's really more or less, you know, kind of a, a benefited area having a door there. However, the door is a heritage mechanism in itself, and probably wouldn't be. Uh, accessible to the public uh, to reiterate that so so it, so I understand that correctly then it does feedback to at least with that first proposal there isn't you know it's not only been nicely um, cleaned up um, and and looks I like the windows at the front at the bottom at the first proposal not not that one very first yep that where the chairs are, and it does offer this integration with the streetscape from my perspective. So those are my comments on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, you're next. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thanks for the presentation. Appreciate the, uh, the ideas, Heather, and the, the conceptual drawings and layout drawings. It's definitely helpful. I think that, uh, and I, I guess this may be a question for the working group or a member of the working group. Are the public washrooms there reasonable or are they in need of repair? That's my first question. Chris, I'm gonna let you have that one. Sure. I haven't been in them recently, so. <laughs> so um, to my knowledge, there aren't any issues with the washroom in the, uh, in the lower level. Um, that being said, uh, you know, it is a amenity that the town has provided to, uh, to um, people in the downtown core. And that's why we felt it necessary to include those within the uh, design scope of any of the options, right? So um, I do know, you know, the, the idea of taking away from the kitchen down in Club 55, it is a fairly large space. Um, so you know, yes, it would be reduced down to probably a dinette or something along those lines, or in the other options where it doesn't get impacted, it's just on the uh, outer portion, which, you know, um, for the age of the plumbing and uh, and everything in that space, it may be, you know, worthwhile to, uh, to look at redoing that at this stage as well, so. Thank you. 
in a follow-up, yeah. Um, I would kind of like to see a rendition where we mimic the heritage feature of the door system and bring that out closer to the street and try and incorporate stairs in that. Being a heritage structure, I think that having the theater attached to the side of town hall is, is okay. We, we made an effort to provide a different venue and it doesn't need to meet the heritage features we're trying to maintain on town hall. So I'm wondering if we should make more of an effort to preserve rather than to try and incorporate aspects of the theater into the town hall. I'm, I'm talking from purely a heritage point of view. Um, I think that if we could maintain the, that front entrance system and have a roof line very similar to that and mimic it out front with a window system and have your interior stairs incorporated there, I think we'd be doing a better service to, to preserving the heritage of town hall. Chris? Yeah, your worship. If I could just ask for clarity. Um, so, uh, Councillor, are you looking for uh, within the design features to incorporate like similar stone and uh, window features uh, within a potential um, suggestion of, uh, say, option three or something along those lines? Is that is that what you're getting at? Or? So can we can we pull option three back up? Yeah. So if I may, Your Worship? Yeah, go ahead. My thought process is, can we not incorporate the existing heritage entrance system, the original entrance system, in interior? So a two-story structure that mimics, the roof line would mimic the, the, the transom over the door system. And you come out the same size as that uh, square patio surface is on the town hall sign rendition there and have your stairs in that area. And then you still have seating where the Muskoka chairs are, your Muskoka moment, the washroom stay where they are, Club 55 stays where the access stays where it is. We haven't moved bathrooms and mimic the old entrance system out front in that second story above the town hall sign. So, so your worship, I, I believe I understand what Councillor uh, Fitzgerald is saying is almost putting a two-story addition onto the front and having the interior stairs within that uh, within that kind of front entry block. Is that that's correct? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I'm, exactly. I'm glad you understand that because I yeah. missed it. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Thompson next. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I'm totally uh, in favor of options one and or two, and probably preferably two, um, for the same reasons that... Uh, that have been touched on by Councillor Fitzgerald, the heritage aspect of what is there now, but also from Deputy Mayor Alcock with regards to a gathering place, it provides for that. So um, I, I, uh, I, I just can't see um, how moving everything inside and, and then um, creating a whole new entrance way. And I, and I appreciate what uh, Chris is uh, coming from in terms of uh, maintenance and that kind of thing for the winter time. But um, I think for heritage aspects and uh, overall appearance, I just like uh, option number two better than any of the others. Just my opinion. No questions, just my opinion, Your Worship. Thank you. Well, thanks for that. Councillor uh, Weeb is next. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I kind of want to echo those sentiments. I think that uh, when in doubt, uh, stay kind of away from modernizing. I, I don't. 
I don't, I think that Councillor Alcock mentioned it. She said it well in that I think it takes away from the community space if we enclose the front. Uh, so I, I would say that it becomes almost not usable for the public. So I, that's why I would, I would eliminate the last, the latter options. Um, I also don't like the idea of putting in all kinds of glazing on the north facing side of the building. I think we could just freeze. So I would limit that as well, just from a practical standpoint. I like option one right away. It seemed to me that it flowed well. Uh, it gave lots of room to use for different things. I think it really invites the public to just, uh, I mean, the summers when we have all the public downtown, that's what we want. We want people to interact and just engage. So I'm firmly in the, the number one camp, but would take number two as a, thanks. Uh, Councilor Schumacher. Thank you through you, your worship. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm same sentiments. I'm, I'm all about the heritage and keeping that. If we did look to sort of the closed in spaces, I guess looking at that switchback option beside the town hall that we're creating the accessible pathway, would there be an option to create a gathering space, I guess? as a tie-in over there, if we did go with the latter options, because I really do agree with Deputy Mayor Alcock, we need that sort of gathering space to create for, for a public option. So I, I, I get where Chris is going. I know the maintenance is a big issue. So what is, I guess, the compromise there if we do look at the other ones? My, my vote is more the heritage and keeping the, the one or two, but if we do want to look at the other ones, is there an option to keep sort of a, a tie-in maybe to that switchback because I know they were looking at being able to create some stuff off to the sides when they switch back on that path. Um, so if I may, um, Your Worship, uh, suggest that Heather bring up uh, option one um, there because I believe that does have a tie-in with, uh, with the ramp switchback and everything, so. Okay, this is option one here. Uh, we didn't really look into tying it in with the ramp because the ramp apparently already is out to tender and has a contract, I do believe. So we kind of looked at the ramp being a separate entity than our intervention. Now, um, with it, within this option, that, that first platform would be incorporated with the elevations of the, uh, of the sidewalks. So there would be that larger meeting space that um, Councillor Schumacher was, uh, was talking about to, to have that access point, right? No, fair enough. I mean, again, I just wanna keep that feel too of our Christmas tree out there and some of the, you know, when we do the, the Santa Claus parade, hopefully at some point again. And I know that um, I believe Grant and, and Helena do the you know commentary along and they sort of sit out at that area to be able to still have that, that aspect. Yeah. And then I guess lastly, with the washrooms, is there some where there's only one washroom? Is there some where there's two? Because I do believe we need to keep the public washroom space. Yeah, every, every design still has public washrooms, every single one. And, but one has, one of them had only one washroom space and the others had two, is that correct? Yeah, one, I think one had a family washroom and then the, the rest of the designs had a male and female. Again, I would prefer to not go male and female. I would prefer to go gender neutral in 2021, but that would be my call. Councilor Armour. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I assume we're too late now with Streetscape to tie this all in. So um, I just wondered, Chris, do you have a time frame on this? Because if we keep re trying to redesign this all the time, I think we're going to go months, just like we did with Kent Park. So I like design one or two, um, but um, what's your time frame? So yeah, through you, your worship, um, the working group has been uh, incorporating Steve Hernan um, being head of uh, Streetscape and everything like that. So um, because we're 
currently in concept drawings. Um, we would need to go out for RFP and, and so on and so forth. So um, I wouldn't be surprised, um, you know, probably the earliest to get a contractor into that situation would probably be uh, September, September-ish, right? So um, we've kind of past the window of incorporating this when the uh, when they've torn up all the road and everything in front of town hall, but uh, an understanding that with Ken Park um, still needing to uh, um, needed to be done, there would be um, there would be that opportunity uh, later on to uh, to get this going. The other aspect of it is um, because of uh, insurance purposes, they would you would only be able to have one contractor within that area. Um, so you couldn't actually have that complete overlap um, uh, with removing the stairs and rebuilding it um, while there's a contractor on, uh, on Main Street as well, right? So, um, so yeah, and uh, I don't know if Steve Hernan's there to kind of confirm that, but I would, I would probably suggest it wouldn't be any earlier than September. Okay. Oh, if I may. Sure. I did. Um, when do you have plan on having public input into this? Do you have any dates in mind? Well, we were, we thought that if, uh, we certainly thought that if we were to change the concept and, and move the stairs inside, that we would want to go to public con uh, con consultation. If we're just replacing the stairs, which really is like for like, although, you know, the design's a little different. I don't know whether we need public consultation for option one or two. I don't know that there's that big of a difference between them. And I'm, my guess is you're probably gonna get a 50-50 split on them anyway. So I think we wanted to get council's sense on whether or not they were interested in the stairs going inside or, or just more interested in, in, in something like what we have today. Are there any other questions? We don't have any resolutions. We're not making any decisions. Um, we just wanted you to see the drawings and um, we'll probably send it back to the working group and then uh, come back with, uh, with the request for a decision probably next month. Okay. With that, I think we're gonna call a short recess, a biological break, it's 10.42. Um, let's come back at 10.52.
Okay, let's wait for all of council to get back. Okay, welcome back, Councillor Withy and Councillor Armour. I hope you're back with us. It's 10.53. And we are moving into our corporate services part of the agenda. And we got lots there too. Um, so I have a resolution moved by a councillor that's not back yet. So I either wait or change that. We'll just wait one one more second. Councilor Withy. I have a resolution moved by Councilor Armour and seconded by Councilor Stone. It is recommended that committee approve the 2020 Q4 budget deviations as outlined in Appendix B of Report Corp 2021-28. And with that, I will turn it over to Reva, I think. Thank you, Chair Terziano. So I'm just gonna share my screen so you can follow along what I'm talking about here. Um, okay, so can everybody see this 2020 financial results report? Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. So overall, the town of Huntsville ended 2020 with a surplus of just over $890,000 right here. So it's exactly $891 and $13. Reva, yes? I'm just going to interrupt for a minute. If you can make the screen just a little bit bigger, I think it will, would be helpful. Thanks. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is the difference between the budgeted net levy and what the actual net levy was for 2020. So there wasn't one specific division that you can that this came from, as you can see here. So the majority of divisions had fairly large surpluses due to a number of factors. Uh, most notable, obviously, uh, was the effects of COVID-19, um, which resulted in facility and program closures and temporary layoffs of staff. So even though there were substantial revenue losses from these program and facility closures, the town was able to control costs to offset these lost revenues. A few of the large items, the larger items that contributed to this surplus include things like the revenue reductions because the program and facility closures. Um, so in community services alone, the revenues lost were about $1.1 million. Um, so these revenue reductions were offset by a number of things. So uh, utility savings from facility closures of over $225,000. Um, there was also significant savings in SWB. Um, so overall, um, organizationally, there was $1.8 million um, savings in the SWB line. So this is largely due to the COVID-19 temporary layoffs. However, there were also several vacancies throughout the year um, due to retirement, staff turnover, um, and that resulted in some significant savings as well. There was also the corporate services restructuring, um, which contributed savings of over $100,000, um, which was included in this overall SWB reduction. Um, the the COVID-19 Assessment Centre funding of 102000 also contributed to the surplus. So this was used to offset direct and indirect costs associated with running the assessment centre. So direct costs like specific materials um, and, and contracted services that were required for running the centre. But also there were, you know, SWB costs for the CAO's time, for the treasurer's time, for facility staff. Um, all of those things were, are included in those specific departments' budgets and not directly offset against this COVID assessment center funding, but they did contribute to, they, they were a cost of running the center. 
Um, there's also the net effect of some other property tax items. So things like the PIL levy, tax write-offs and supplementary taxes. So all of those um, over and above the budget were about $127,000, which contributed to that um, $891,000 surplus. So I'm just gonna skip down a little bit into um, some of the meat of the report here. So this is on page 32 of the agenda package or page six of appendix, appendix C. So this is showing us the five-year operating expenses. Um, and the next page is gonna show us the five-year operating revenues. So I think it's fairly evident um, by looking at these 2020 year over year changes. Um, all of those red figures mean that there was you know, significant reduction in those expense line items largely because of the, the impacts of COVID-19. Um, so it is important to note that these tables and charts do not include reserve transfers or long-term debt. These are strictly expenses and revenues. So there's the expenses and this one is revenue. So you can see there was huge impacts in 2020 to, um, to, to the revenues from, from our 2019 uh, amounts. Okay, so throughout the next several pages, um, the operating revenues and expenses are broken down by division. Again, these pages don't include reserve transfers or long-term debt. So each of the divisional breakdowns also includes, similar to these charts here, um, a five-year operating expense and revenue comparisons. So I wasn't gonna go into detail of the divisional summaries unless there are specific questions, um, and I can address those at the end of the presentation. So moving on to capital, actual capital expenditures were about $817,000 less than what was budgeted. This was largely due to a few items. Um, so a number of 2020 budgeted capital projects didn't occur um, because of either spending limits or supplier restrictions because of COVID. Um, and these amounted to approximately $597,000. Many of, the, many of these projects that were deferred um, have been deferred to 2021 or even future years. So additional projects that were to be funded through the 2019 Ontario Service Delivery Funding were also approved in 2020, and these amounted to about $365,000. Um, the MHP locomotive project for $88,000 was deferred to 2021 uh, because this, this project is contingent upon receiving funding and, and we didn't receive funding in 2020. So that's why that didn't move forward. Um, the Macaulay Robertson renovation project, which began in 2019 was completed in 2020. So the 2020 budget included about $821,000 um, worth of costs, but actual costs for 2020 came in at just over 474,000. So this resulted in a kind of a difference between what was budgeted and the actual spending of about $347,000. Um, so the next several pages in this report uh, detail the capital projects that were budgeted for 2020 and any variances for each project. So again, I won't go into detail um, unless there are specific questions at the end of the report. So also included in the staff report package as Appendix B um, is a deviation sheet. So this outlines the deviations at the end of 2020. Um, I just wanted to note that only the items that are dated April 28th, so you can see these highlighted items here, um, these are the items that have not been previously approved or have been changed from what was previously approved. So everything else has been approved through, through previous staff reports or other quarterly deviation reporting and, and the items that aren't dated April 28th haven't changed. Um, so I can go through this listing in more detail if you'd like at this point. Um, yeah, I think the ones that are specific to the Q4 deviations, we should see. Okay. Um, so I'll go through the highlighted items because these are the items that um, that really have changed either changed from previous reportings or haven't haven't been previously reported as a deviation. So this first one is the is a result of the uh, corporate services restructuring. So in pre in previous quarters. Um, 
there, there was a deviation reported, um, but this specific deviation has been, uh, has been reduced, or sorry, that the cost savings has been reduced from Q3. And that was because in the Q3 reporting, um, this line item actually grouped other legislative services and financial services, SWB changes, including things that don't qualify as deviations. So things like the council remuneration savings, there was you know about $24,000 there that, that was saved um, and other staff vacancies for the financial services division. Um, that, was, that was grouped in with the deviation last time. And so this is just splitting it out. Um, this next line item here is insurance deductible line. So this cost savings actually increased by just under $100,000. Um, so, and it was based on, you know, where we actually ended up at the end of Q4 in 2020. This next line, uh, line item again, um, increased from what was reported in the Q3 deviations. And that again is based on actual year end amounts. So this is showing that the surplus in the insurance budget um, is, is transferred into the insurance reserve. Um, so overall, you know, there, there's really no net effect on the 2021 net levy. Um, the next slide item down is the tax penalties. So tax penalties were waived from March 31st to September 30th. Um, and this is actually reducing lost revenues. So we actually ended up getting more in penalties, um, in tax penalties than we were anticipating at Q3. So, so our, our revenue reduction at Q3 um, was around $100,000. And now at the end of, of Q4, it's actually you know, where we ended up is actually only about $62,000 of lost revenue. These next two items are, or sorry, next three items are new deviations for Q4. And they all have to do with um, investment income. So this first line item here is investment income earned on the prudent investor um, investments and um, specifically related to Forbes Hill uh, reserve funds. So this has been transferred into the Forbes Hill Reserve and, and Julia has a report um, right after this one that talks about the investment income and the treatment of that. Um, the next item down is investment income again with respect to the prudent investor, but this relates to um, funds that aren't required immediately. So um, essentially capital reserve amounts that have been invested um, for future use. So, this again does not have a net levy effect in 2021 um, as the investment income was transferred into the capital reserves to help fund those future um, capital projects. Um, so this next item was actually approved in a, in a staff report in February and this was the gain on sale of um, the legal list investment. Um, and it, it, was, um, it was approved to be transferred to the public works capital reserve. So this next line item down, um, it is now being reported separately in the Q4 deviations. This was included in the corporate services restructuring deviation in Q3. Um, so I, how I had mentioned it was split out. Um, so this is the savings um, from vacancies and staff turnover in the financial services division. Um, you know, we had a retirement early in the year and didn't replace her position until later on because of COVID and, and hiring procedures and, and all of that stuff. Um, so that's where that savings came from. The next line item down is uh, with respect to capital. So this is a work order system costs um, that were to be funded through the Ontario Service Delivery Funds. So the costs in 2020 ended up being slightly above um, what we were anticipating, but the costs for 2021 have, have been reduced because of that. So overall, the project is within the, the, the spending um, anticipated for the project. Um, so the next line item down is the grants um, for COVID Assessment Center. So this was the 102,000 that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, and this was increased from what was originally um, reported in the Q3. And that was just based on, um, on, on the information that we had at the time. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a little one behind me here. Um, 
and again, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there were direct and indirect costs associated with running this center that um, that, that 102,000 is, is used against. The next line item down is the PIL levy. So again, this, this is a new deviation for Q4 um, because we didn't know what the amount was gonna be at, at Q3. Um, and it, it's just based on what we actually received. So the tax write-off amount, um, again, this is, uh, it's only changed $491 from what was originally reported in Q3. So not a big change there. And it's just based on, on the actual year end amounts that we, we actually received. Um, the supplementary taxes, we have increased since Q3 um, by about $90,000. And this again is just based on what we actually received in 2020. So moving on to community services, um, at the end of Q3, uh, we had reported a deviation in our estimated lost revenues, where we actually ended up was, um, was a little bit about $72,000, $73,000 more in lost revenues than what we were anticipating at the end of Q3. And again, that's just based on our actual amounts that we received um, for revenue in 2020. So in community services, there was a significant reductions um, related to COVID um, program facility closures, um, that type of thing. So uh, there was an increased savings from what we reported in Q3 um, of about $66,000 um, specifically for community services, SWB. Um, in, in materials and supplies, um, again, this is because of reductions um, reductions in costs because of COVID uh, program facility closures. Um, so we actually saved $33,000 more than we were anticipating at Q3. This next line item down, um, there's no date in here and that's because this, this deviation has been removed. So at the end of Q3, we were expecting cost savings of about $32,000 um, between budget and actual. Um, and, and at the end of the year, we actually ended up being less than $25,000 um, different from the budget, which is why the deviation has been removed. It's no longer a deviation. So this uh, next slide item, item down is the MHP admissions. Um, and again, you can see from the, the comments in the blue here, we, we reduced the lost revenues by $13. <laughs> so. Not, big, not a big difference from what was previously reported, but it is a difference, so we wanted to highlight that. Um, so the next line item here is the reduction in, um, in hydro. So we actually saw an extra $18,000 more in cost savings than we were anticipating at the end of Q3. Um, so, and, and I mean, with, with many of the utilities at the summit center, because there's, especially with hydro, because there's no separate meters, it's very difficult to estimate what our savings are gonna be. Um, so, and I think staff at the summit center did a really great job of, of trying to be relatively conservative with our cost savings estimates throughout the year. Um, and, and, you know, we ended up saving about $142,000 just in hydro alone at the summit center. Um, so again, the next few of them are related to, to utility savings at the Summit Center. Um, so, you know, we saw cost, additional cost savings in natural gas of $93 from what was previously reported. So not a big saving or not a big change from, from what was previously approved, but again, it changed. So we wanted to highlight that. Um, for water and sewer, these were actually new deviations because at the end of the Q, at the end of Q3, we weren't anticipating um, more than $25,000 in savings, but we actually saved about $29,000, $28,000 in both water and sewer. Um, so, you know, quite a bit more savings there than we were anticipating. Um, so with building repairs and maintenance, um, so this was largely due to repairs and maintenance required at the library building throughout the year. Um, and at the end of Q3, um, this, this, um, 
uh, the additional cost we were anticipating was going to be slightly higher. So we saved a little bit. Um, we saved about $9,000 from what was previously reported at Q3. So the next three items here, um, these are changes in our lost revenues um, for specific items. So the, the lacrosse, um, minor lacrosse revenue, minor hockey revenues and ice um, revenues. So, you know, these were, um, this first one here is a reduction in the revenue loss. So we were anticipating a little bit more of a revenue loss in Q3, but again, it only changed by $95. So not a big change. Um, these two, these two items here, there's actually an increase in lost revenues um, from what was reported in Q3. So again, this item, because there's no date, this is a deviation that was removed. So we previously reported in Q3 that we were anticipating um, lost revenues of 34,000, almost 35,000. But at the end of the day, at the end of 2020, our lost revenues were actually less than 25,000. So it no longer qualifies as a budget deviation. So these next items here, this contributions to others, this is the waiving of um, tenant fees at the Summit Center. Um, so there was a, an increase of about $2,700 from what was previously reported in Q3. Again, these next few items are revenue, lost revenue items. Um, and, and I mean, the change from the Q3 deviation is all um, outlined with the blue comments. So, you know, there was a reduction in lost revenues for, um, for instructional courses. So we, we actually took in more than we were anticipating at Q3. Um, membership revenues, same thing. We, we reduced the, the expected revenue loss. Um, by, you know, $5,800 there. So we took in more money than we were anticipating at Q3. Um, same thing with registration fees. So the next one um, is the deferral of the Civic Furnace Project. So this is a new Q4 deviation. So at the end of Q3, um, this is a project that was anticipated to be completed, um, but upon further assessment, um, the project has actually been deferred to 2022. Um, just condition assessments and everything done by staff, um, we anticipate we can move that to 2022. Moving down, again, there was the deferral of the uh, Summit Center exhaust rooftop project. Um, so we actually increased our cost savings here from the Q3 deviation. So it was anticipated at Q3 that some spending would occur before the end of the year. Um, however, all of the costs have been, have been deferred to future years for this project. So the deferral of the Stevenson Roof Project, um, again, this is a new Q4 deviation. So it was anticipated at Q3 that this project would be completed, but because of time constraints, um, it has been carried forward to 2021 and was included in our, in our budget submission for 2021. So in development services, there was a reduction in part-time SWB in bylaw. Um, so this is actually an increase in our, our Q3 deviation. So we, we saved an extra $1,900 than what we were anticipating. So with building permits, um, we've actually increased revenues here by $96,000 from what we were forecasting in Q3. And this is just based on our actuals at the end of the year. Because the building department is self-funded, there's no net levy impact. Um, because everything flows through the, the building reserve fund. So affordable housing um, rebates. So uh, there, there is an increased cost savings here of $6,000 from what we reported in Q3. Um, and that's just based on actual year end amounts. So in planning, um, so we've actually reduced our lost revenues from what we anticipated at Q3 uh, by about $4,200, $4,300. Um, so, you know, we ended up taking in more revenue than we were anticipating. For consulting fees, um, this is a reduction in our cost savings of $16,000. And this is based on actual spending for um, the, for, for um, consulting fees in the planning department. Um, there is no net levy impact or current year net levy impact to this um, because it was funded through the reserves. 
Um, so consulting fees and economic development. Um, this is a new Q4 deviation. Um, so it was anticipated at Q3 that these projects would move forward, but because of, because of timing, the projects have been carried forward to 2021. Um, so in the uh, municipal accommodation tax uh, budget sheet, so there, there was an increase in revenues from what we reported at Q3 um, of about $460,000. Um, so the forecasting for the mat is, is based on what we've actually received to date in the mat, um, because it's, it's not quite clear what, um, what necessarily we'll get from month to month, especially during COVID. Um, so this, this, uh, deviation has been adjusted based on what we actually received. Um, there was actually a large adjustment, um, for the, um, for receivable balances. So um, accommodation tax that's been reported, but not yet collected. Um, so that year end receivable was about $241,000. Um, and that is expected to be received in 2021. Um, so kind of two sides of the same coin here, the, um, the contributions to others in the um, municipal accommodation tax. So again, um, this is an increase in cost of about $298,000 um, since the Q3 deviation that was reported. Um, and it's based on what's been received to date. Um, and um, so related to that $241,000 MAT receivable amount, there's $167,000 included in this deviation. Um, that is the, the MAT Association's um, portion of that, of, of those amounts to be collected. Um, so that's also been recorded. So in operations and protective services, um, there were SWB savings related to, um, to the delay of fire chief position. There were um, some, some delays in, in other um, positions being hired. There were some staff turnovers and vacancies throughout the year. Um, so there was an increase in cost savings here, but $144,000 from what we reported in Q3. So um, the, the next two items, fuel, materials, and supplies, these are new items um, based on, you know, actual usage and actual costs throughout the year. Um, you know, over the past few years, um, the fuel and materials and supplies in operations, specifically in the fleet department, um, you know, we've been, we've been looking at how we budget for those items. And in 2021, we have, you know, adjusted those items to be more in line with um, historical trends and, and what we actually need um, in terms of spending there. So the 2021 budget, I think, will better reflect what we actually need in terms of spending in those departments. Um, so the next item down, the consulting fees. So this was for the roads needs study, which was not budgeted in 2020, um, which was funded through some other divisional savings. Um, there was an increase in cost of about $21,000 from the Q3 reported deviation. Um, so this, you know, there was some increasing, increasing consulting that was required um, while we had some staff vacancies throughout the year. Um, the next line item is the, the contractors. So there, there was a reduction in, in contractors, um, some due to limited spending and COVID, some due to, um, you know, more, more work was done in-house. So things like the snow removal, um, you know, that also lended to the increase in materials and supplies and fuel. Um, you know, there was a reduction in contractors, but because we did it in-house, there was more cost in other areas. So this next line item down here is the Lake of Bays contribution. So in Q3, we had, we had anticipated that these lost revenues would be, you know, in the range of $60,000. Um, at the end of the day, it ended up being um, lost revenues of only about $34,000. So we took in more revenues than we were anticipating at Q3. So moving on to capital and operations and protective services, um, there was the deferral of the fleet auto greaser purchase. Um, this was a new, a new deviation 
from or for Q4. Um, and it was anticipated that this would be purchased, but due to time constraints, um, the project has been deferred to 2021. Um, and then there was the, uh, the snowblower for um, the loader costs. So not a big change from Q3. There's actually a reduction in, in our anticipated costs from what we reported in Q3 of about $2,200. Um, the capital uh, for Williams Port Road. So this was due to the, um, the beaver damage um, that was to be funded through the working capital reserve. So it, at the end of Q3, um, we didn't have the, um, the actual costs yet. We had an estimate of what the cost would be. And it actually came in to be about $28,000 less than we were anticipating in Q3. So we had some cost savings from our Q3 deviation there. Um, for the sidewalk replacement, um, so there were increased costs of about $42,000 from what we reported in Q3. Um, and this largely resulted from final billings that we got from the district related to the King William sidewalk work. Um, for the storm study projects, so there was actually a reduction in costs by about $21,000 from what we reported at Q3. And this was just based on actual amounts that um, actual costs for the year. And the uh, last but not least is the, um, the training ground containers live burn um, project that was to be funded through the uh, Ontario Service Delivery Funds. So the costs were slightly above the $30,000 to be funded through that, um, the Ontario Service Delivery Funds. So that was funded through the Fire Capital Reserve, um, that additional $3,300. So that's all of the budget deviations. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to call upon the senior management team um, to provide some insight into 2020's challenges and accomplishments in their respective divisions. Um, so first up is Lisa in HR. Well, I wonder if, um, Reba, if you don't mind, just because we've just gone through the deviations, if we can maybe just go to questions first and then we'll come back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I see Deputy Mayor Alcock's hand up. Is that first? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, thank you, Reva. Uh, your report is so fulsome, and uh, I love the way you lay it out. Um, I'm blown away with you. You seem to have a handle on every service and program we do. <laughs> we have. So, but I do have a specific, and, and it was on. You made, you made reference to it when you did the line by line, but on the affordable housing rebate in the report, it makes reference to $10,000 of unused in 2020. And so it reverts back to the affordable housing reserve. And so the first question is very specific. How much do we have in the affordable housing reserve now? And, and the second question maybe gets parked as the senior management talks about the various programs. Um, I, I guess we've had this discussion before. Why is it being unused? And, and maybe, you know, we need to rethink what this program is all about. And if I'm absolutely happy to direct that to you as well. Um, but I just think that we've been here before. It's not being used. And yet we have an affordable housing crisis. So something's not thicking. And Again, it would be interesting to know how much we have in the reserve. Yep, through you, um, Mayor Terziano. Um, I, I can't give you the exact number right now, but I will look it up. Uh, <laughs> no worries at all. I just, I, I, I would sort of, given that's the direction with that, um, I think it's it behooves council to consider what's happening with that anyway. Thank you. I think, I think I actually saw it somewhere in the report at about $60,000 is in that reserve right now. But we will check to be sure that that is the correct number. Comes to Rithy. Thank you. Sorry, you took me off guard. I didn't think Councillor Alcock was done. Um, anyways, uh, my question's more general. Uh, again, Reva, uh, excellent report, uh, excellent presentation, um, very understandable. Uh, quite a lot of deviations, not a big surprise with COVID and everything. I was just, I'm wondering how these deviations 
are being brought forward into our 2021 budget? Or are they yet, or are they going to be or reflected? Because these numbers should change some of those numbers or at least be, be circled and put in their columns, I would expect. Rita? Yeah, so through you, Mayor Terziano. Um, so the, the deviations are, are specific to, like they're, they're the difference between the budget and what actually happened in the year, right? So um, essentially these Q4 deviations stay in 2020. Um, for our Q1 forecast, and I will go through it a little bit later um, in today's meeting, um, we do have a Q1 deviation sheet. So every quarter when we bring forward a forecast, we will have um, an updated deviation sheet um, and, and go through any differences at that point in time. So whenever we know that there's a deviation, um, we will report them um, kind of as they, as they pop up um, throughout the year. So for every quarter this year, we will have we will have these deviations and, and we will speak to them. Then if I may, uh, Your Worship, um, quick follow up. So we've got about $900,000 of money that we didn't expect to have. And maybe I'm a little premature with this, but what are we planning uh, to do with that? If, if anything at this point? Yeah, um, through you, Mayor Terziano. So um, I don't know, Julia, if you want to speak to that. Um, sure. So, so that money does, um, as per reserve policy, it does get put into the working capital reserve, which is a reserve of council that is, is um, it's up to council's discretion how to use that reserve. Um, but it's not specifically earmarked at this time for anything um, in particular. So it hasn't, that, that money hasn't really been assigned to a future project right now. So I think at this point, um, we'd still have to get a little bit further into this year to see how 2021 is playing out to see how we think, um, you know, we would recommend um, using that fund. The 2021 budget's already been set, so we can't change the tax rates at this time, but um, we can certainly use that money um, to offset future projects or look at if it can be used in, in future um, budgets. I'm going to ask a follow-up because it's along the same lines, and that would be if uh, this surplus of nearly nine hundred thousand dollars just ballparked, what kind of a surplus would we have been facing without COVID? So, how much of the sur surplus is COVID-related, and how much is regular, regularly related um, dollars? I mean, we we often will have a surplus in in um, Winter maintenance, sometimes we're over in winter maintenance. So what, what is not COVID related out of this 900,000? Julia, do you want me to answer that? <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's kind of, that's kind of a really difficult question to answer um, because the effects of COVID-19 were so pervasive across the entire organization. Um, we can certainly try and figure that out. Um, but again, like um, how I alluded to the fact that for say, for the assessment center specifically, it's very hard to pinpoint the exact cost that that assessment center is because, um, so you know what, if, if we weren't in COVID, we would still have the CAO's um, you know, salary, we would still have the treasurer's salary, we would still have my salary. But a lot of time was spent by those positions related to COVID projects that they wouldn't otherwise have, have had to do. So a portion of those costs do need to still be allocated to COVID, right? It's, it's, it's not just a simple, we lost the revenue, we saved these expenses. We can certainly figure that out, but that doesn't give you the actual cost of COVID because there's, there's so many different ways to approach every single line item in our budget. Yeah. It, it, COVID almost hit every area of the town. <laughs> and, and, and I get that and I appreciate that, but that's also a very small number compared to 891. I think what I'm getting at is, I thought right from day one, we were pretty proactive in trying to figure out how to reduce expenses and, um, and mitigate the impacts of COVID. I want to know how well we did doing that. 
because when I look at some of these numbers, it suggests to me we didn't really do very well. We, we didn't win the whole, but we didn't actually do very well. If we hadn't had other savings, which are not COVID related and, and um, government assistance, we would not maybe have done very well. And that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. How well did we actually do so ourselves? I think it's important through your worship, I think it's important to note that the money that we did get for the provincial funding for the safe restart funds, um, they are showing as a revenue item, but they're also showing offset by a reserve transfer. So the net effect of that funding isn't actually um, showing in 2020. We're using that funding in 2021. So when you're looking at that almost $900,000 surplus, that doesn't include the government funding that we, that we received. So you could look at it to say that overall, you know, there was some supplementary tax tax revenue that is um, that you could argue is not COVID related, which I believe was about 125. So, I mean, you could attribute a large portion of the rest of that to, to COVID, to COVID savings that we were able to mitigate our expenses um, to offset that lost revenue. When you look at the lost revenue in community overall for programs and services, it's about um, 1.6 million. And um, just with salaries, wages and benefits, we were able to reduce it by um, 1.8 million. Um, as well as there's lots of other expenses there that we were able to, to look at cost reductions in there to, to mitigate those expenses. So I think, I think the town did quite well in, in mitigating the expenses due to COVID-19. Okay, thanks for that. Councillor Withy, back to you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so as everyone knows, unfortunately, COVID isn't over. Uh, and how um, are we doing as far as continuing the what we did last year as far as uh, accounting for lost revenues and savings as we move forward. And I know nobody's got a crystal ball, but it, here we are, it's end of April, you know, we're, we're, we're through uh, Q1 and um, wondering if there's any forecasting being done as we move through rather than you know, see where we are at the end of the year. Julia? Um, yep, yeah, so I just two things. That I just think it's important to note that, you know, our, our practice as per budget and financial reporting policy is to do um, three, three financial reports a year. And I think last year, I think this makes us number 10 for 2020. So we did quite a few reports along the way for 2020. Um, again, for 2021, we decided that we would do a Q1 report. It's not our um, policy to do that, but we thought to be proactive that, that we should do that exactly um, as you've suggested, Councillor uh, Withy. So you'll see um, just in about two reports from now, you'll see that coming forward. We're, we're showing you a forecast of where we think we are um, at this point. Uh, I don't see any other hands. I have one more question and, and it's the bottom of the total deviation page, Reba. And so we have 756,535 in total budget deviations from these pages. Is this, is this the number of Q4 or the number of the full year? So that's the total of all of the net levy changes that are included in the prior six pages. Um, so that's all of the, the deviations at the end of Q4. So that you know, the remaining budget difference there, the, the 134,000, that's all of the small little things that are not budget deviations. You know, you might have $1,000 savings here, you know, $15,000 here, that kind of stuff. It's all of those small things that added together that makes up that difference. So, um, you know, of our $891,000, we've, we've identified 756,000 specifically relating to deviations. Um, so anything over $25,000 different from the budget. Um, and then there, there, you know, there are almost no line items that are exactly on budget. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of little things here and there um, that, that make up that difference. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more hands. So if you want to go back to where you were going to introduce some people, We'll, we'll, we'll go for it now. Yeah, so um, I was just going to call on our SMT members to um, give a, a general overview and their insight into 2020's challenges and accomplishments um, specific to their respective divisions. So first up is Lisa from HR. 
<laughs> Thank you, Reva, and hello, everyone. Um, so as we know, our employees are the most valued asset we have. And in 2020, the pandemic presented itself as one of the greatest um, workplace transformations of our lifetime and continues um, to be in 2021. Uh, so the HR team's focus during this time um, is certainly protecting the health and well-being of employees, supporting departmental business continuity, supporting the transition to remote work and continued remote, mer remote work, uh, producing rapid policy and procedure changes, supporting employee mental health, managing the quick changes in openings and closings, excuse me, and color classifications. Um, and uh, deciphering the mass amounts of information that is coming in from the province, um, the health experts, uh, legal firms and health and safety organizations. In addition, it is also included and still includes the difficult task of laying off employees and in some cases, the closing of departments and services temporarily. So throughout all this, um, the HR team with the assistance of marketing and Caridon developed a COVID-19 employee information news and knowledge resource on the inner circle, which includes a large amount of information from policies, procedures, posters and signage to news feeds and links to information, to important information. Um, we changed the recruitment process from paper to electronic during this time. We completed a corporate services division reorganization worked with directors to review specific operational areas and provide guidance and options for continued or altered service, developed an online screening application process, research developed and reviewed onboarding and offboarding processes and procedures, um, processed over 32 recruitment opportunities ranging from full-time, part-time and contract positions in 2020. And to date in 2021, we have processed 24 recruitment opportunities ranging from full-time, part-time and seasonal. So we've been quite busy there. Researching and drafting corporate human resource, um, resources strategic plan, researched and produced succession planning stats for the municipality and presented those to senior management, conducted training in COVID operational plans and specific policies, and continued to manage claims in um, WSIB, short-term and long-term disability, um, return to work plans and accommodations for our employees, continue processing, obviously, of payroll, government remittances, um, managing benefit inquiries and changes, and then as well, our continued labor relations support. So all of this is certainly a team effort. And I send out a huge appreciation and thank you um, to both Keith Duncan and Barb Ingram uh, in our HR department um, for their tireless support and the workload they have managed during this time. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide you with that information. Thanks, Lisa. So next up uh, is the Director of Legislative Services, Tanya Kalea. Okay, thank you. So uh, last year was an interesting year as our division was created last year. So it has been, uh, it was the first six months last year of IT and corporate information and the clerk's department all together. Um, so the clerk's department, as you are well aware, we experienced lots of challenges and uh, with the preparing for meetings. So um, we were able to create policies, procedures and bylaw changes quite quickly. And um, you guys held the first meeting on March 26th, which was only eight days after the regulation changed. So that, that, was, that was pretty quick. Uh, another challenge we faced was issuing marriage licenses, what to do with marriage licenses during our closures and whatnot. We are fortunate to uh, already have online marriage uh, platform in place. So this reduced si significantly our, um, our time that we had to spend face-to-face you know, -face with applicants. So that was wonderful. We issued 119 marriage licenses in 2020. We usually issue between 125 and 135. So people still came in and got marriage licenses and got married. So that was, you'd think that maybe not, but yes, that happened. Um, the other thing that uh, the clerk's department did was they were able to arrange for virtual flag racings. As we mentioned uh, on Monday, there was a couple uh, going up for hospice and uh, community living, I believe they were. So those are very important to our community and we were able to continue some aspect of that for them. 
Uh, the other thing is the corporate information department. So technology and data continue to grow exponentially as staff and the public seek new improved ways to obtain information. The corporate information department is continually uh, exploring these advances to improve our service delivery. <clears throat> So a few highlights for the department in 2020 is um, the sharing of the GIS web services with the District of Muskoka and the GeoHub, the creation of seven new data sets, and the town received an excellent, an excellence award in municipal systems for the town, so that was wonderful. We also created 29 fillable forms, um, which is a feat in itself because they're not easy to do for online so we can continue uh, for public. The other thing we did, which was significant, was we implemented an e-signature software. So as the mayor receives lots of uh, contracts and agreements from, from us to have signed electronically, so that was, that was all brand new and uh, significant for us to continue. The IT department was, uh, felt some, also some significant um, challenges with the departure of uh, Ed Ross and Joel Duffield. We have now Mark Bauer and um, Ian Parker. So they were brand new in 220 right in the middle of it all and, and they've been doing a wonderful job and feeling their way uh, and uh, Dave McDonald has been helping and filling the gaps for them. So the department um, on very short notice they had to implement changes in technology to support all the staff working from home and uh, they didn't have months to do this. They had very very short window. That was a pretty tight timeline. So they also, during that time, they completed a phone system migration, a network migration, and a Windows 10 migration. So uh, every, everybody was hopping and, and moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tanya. Who's next, Reva? Uh, next up is Simone Babineau from, or sorry, no, Julia, <laughs> from Financial Services. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. So, um, so as, as you know, as we prepared the 2020 budget, um, it was before the onset of COVID-19 and obviously the effects of the worldwide pandemic were not incorporated into our, our budget assumptions that we had, that we had started out with. Um, however, staff brought back several financial forecasts as the situations changed in 2020. And although it was um, always anticipated there'd be a surplus of funds at the end of the year, due to the fact that many programs and services were not able to run uh, due to the provincial reg regulations, um, th there was a significant surplus at the end of the year. And although um, we weren't able to provide all these programs and services, um, staff managed the reductions in revenues with cost control measures to ensure that the finances were being um, effectively managed throughout the year. And I think you'll, you saw that in this report. So specifically in the finance department, we had um, two, two major variances. One was um, the supplementary and tax write-offs, the net effect of that. And that was mainly due to another significant year of growth for the town. I think you're all aware of um, the amount of growth that you see out in our community and that, that trickles down to the, to the tax department when we see our supplementary bills. Um, the other significant savings uh, was an in insurance. And that, and that was mainly due, I think, to the fact that a lot of our old claims were closed this year. And in speaking with some lawyers, I, I think a lot of lawyers had a lot of time on their hands this, this year and they were able to, to get in there and close those files. So I think that's why we, we originally thought that the, the claims might be higher than they ended up being. So with the finance department, I'd say one of the biggest accomplishments of 2020 was the fact that we saw the completion and the council approval of our town's asset management plan. We started this project um, back in 20 or two, 2009 um, and it has involved all the departments of the town and not only did we meet the requirements of OREG 58817, we did it two years ahead of the deadline um, as they've now um, extended that deadline for municipalities who haven't been able to, uh, to complete that. Um, we also saw a lot of other positive changes for the finance and customer service um, at Town Hall. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we had quite a few vacancies that we that we did hold um, as vacancies while we moved through the pandemic. But towards the end of the summer, um, we did have a full complement, and the new team um, hit the ground running. Uh, so we had three new staff members join um, the finance department, um, which have provided a lot of great value to our to the town. Uh, so we've moved forward uh, with working towards a paperless accounting system. A, 
paperless accounts payable system. Um, so as of today, we now have completed this project. So we have our AP system is completely paperless, um, which is great because staff can access invoices um, through our laser fiche system and nothing has to be printed um, from the time we get the invoice to the time that somebody wants to approve it to the time we file it. So that's a pretty amazing feat um, that, that our staff were able to do during this. Um, also, as uh, Tanya had mentioned, many more forms and payments have been added to the town's website. So this creates um, a lot better public access to those forms and um, easier payment methods as well. And we also implemented a fully electronic uh, public procurement system. So all submissions for tenders are now um, submitted electronically. So that whole system now is now paperless as well, which is, which is pretty great. So even though with Town Hall um, currently being closed physically, um, I'm really proud of the efforts of the, fi the finance department. Um, as they're making their way through the challenges of the pandemic, they still found um, innovative ways um, to improve the services that we provide and still continue to provide a high level of service um, to our internal and external customers. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Julia. Reva? Okay, so next up is Community Services Director Simone Babineau. Hello. Um, for most of our entire 2020 year, our pool, arenas, community centers, and halls, sports fields, and other sport and recreation spaces have been closed and devastated by this pandemic. These closures and cancellations have meant that our municipality was unable to provide regular and full access to the spaces that are vital to a healthy, active, and connected community. Substantial facility rental revenue is being foregone. Uh, program fees were not being paid and program and prepaid rental fees were being refunded. While all at the same time, non-variable costs for utilities and mandatory staffing and materials and supplies continued to be incurred. Many community, uh, community services staff have also been laid off for extended periods of time. And the remaining community services staff have taken on the challenge to remain fluid. They have continuously evolved and modified roles to stay on the ever-changing provincial framework and health department regulations, modify processes and systems, and communicate effectively to their customers in order to meet the community needs and safety precautions in these very complex times. Staff have um, have initiated our master plan process. They have found efficiencies and leveraged opportunities. We have invited um, our um, COVID vaccination and assessment centers into the building and made that happen. Um, with our very small complement, we've been able to service our customers, um, meet their needs as, as best as we can, maintain our partnerships, and do it with a very small staff complement. Um, uh, in spite of all of the revenue losses, the closed doors and the altered roles, the Community Services Division has been able to con control co costs resulting in approximately a $200,000 surplus. The focus is now on recovery, reinvention, and resilience. The 2020 uh, final results indicate how far we've had to pull back and how impactful this has been on our customers, our services, and our community. Um, I think we've done well. Thank you. Okay. Next. Thanks, Simone. So next up is Kirsten Maxwell from Development Services. You're on mute, Kirsten, we can't hear you. My apologies, I did unmute and it didn't work. Thank you for letting me speak as well. Good morning, everybody. Um, Development Services had a, a really challenging year last year, as, as did all of the town divisions, no question. Um, it's amazing how quickly we were able to adapt and continue our services with very little interruptions. The building department, for example, really had no um, interruptions in how they provided their service everyone was quickly able to move to um, a paperless email system. And they were able to fully implement the electronic building software that uh, the project had just started when uh, the pandemic hit. The um, planning department 
had some staffing challenges last year as um, we were down a person for several months and um, they were able to adjust how they were providing services. Ultimately, only two meetings were missed last year, which is quite amazing when you talk about committee of adjustment and planning committee, but they've had amazingly increased requests for information and services as well and managed to adapt um, really well. Um, bylaw as well had significant challenges with um, increased requests for service, adapting to requests for help from the OPP as well as from the Simcoe Muskoka Health Unit when it came to enforcement and the constantly changing rules and regulations. Uh, marketing did an amazing job keeping people up to date and updating our website and sending out press releases. I want to say there were more press releases issued between uh, March and July of last year than they've have been in the past for full years. It, it was astonishing how much work was going on. Um, economic development was faced with huge challenges trying to figure out the best ways they could help businesses and ensure that as much information was flowing and providing all the assistance they could to all of our, our uh, different areas that were being challenged. And we still managed to move forward with a few big projects, um, like the initiation of the community planning permit bylaw review, the community wayfinding strategy project got underway early this year. Um, and then we have also implemented this amazing plan for the downtown during construction with all of the streetscape communications and community improvement plan incentives that were all ready to go at the beginning of this year to assist our downtown as much as we could. The um, overall, um, there were some significant deviations in the budget, but I think that um, we reduced expenses wherever we could in order to accommodate those and try and keep ourselves as close to the original budget as possible. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any, thank you. Okay. And uh, thanks, Kirsten. Next. And um, lastly, but certainly certainly not least, is Steve Hernan with uh, Operations and Protective Services. Thank you, uh, Reba and Mayor Terziano. Um, so Delta Protection and Operations Services, we were quite fortunate in some regards that uh, COVID didn't affect us like other departments. Uh, we're an operational department. Uh, we're out doing work on the roads. We're outside, as you know, you know our line of work in the parks. So we didn't see some of the effects that other departments had to deal with, with the lost revenue. So we're quite fortunate. The good news for us is that we actually exceeded our work plans. So not only, as you can see in the budget numbers, and we'll talk about it, that we brought the, the department in overall under budget, we exceeded the amount of brushing we were going to plan on doing, the amount of ditching work. So we exceeded the, the original work plan, even given the COVID restrictions that we were dealing with. On the revenue side for our department, uh, we exceeded the, the expected revenue by $100,000. Um, I'd like to take credit for that, but I can't because 40 of that was directly from the province for transit. Uh, we did lose some money on transit and that was a, a, a grant from transit. And as uh, Julia is gonna speak about in a minute, there was some revenue that came in from some investments on the cemetery of approximately $60,000. So overall our revenue came in where we thought it would come in. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, overall in the division, we're down by about $300,000. Um, so when you look at that, um, uh, you know, without going through every line item, but I, I was quickly doing some math because Mayor Terziano asked the question, how much of that was COVA related? Um, out of that 300,000, I would suggest about 150,000 was COVA related. And that was due to some new hires that we were planning to do, example, the fire chief. But when COVA hit and with all the restrictions, we stopped all the hiring process. So we did save some money, and I guess you could relate that to COVID, even though we, we did, in the end of the day, hire those additional staff members, which council had approved and we had budgeted for. Um, overall, though, when you look at our division, and our division spends about 62 to 65% of every operational dollar that's brought into the municipality, and about 95% of every capital dollar, we were under last year by $150,000. Um, the, the biggest uh, compliment I give is to our roads and fleet. Uh, we've, we know we've struggled with them budgets to bring them under control and get handled on them. And uh, Kevin Bocock, our, our operations manager, and Chris Allen, our fleet manager, who unfortunately just left us for another employment opportunity, they managed to bring that division in um, $7,000 over budget. Um, the closest we've come to, to, to that in previous years is usually around 400000 over. 
So we brought that in with an overage of $7,000 on a little over $4 million budget, and we well exceeded our work plans. So, so my hat's off to the management and crew and the staff here. Um, I could go through every, every line item if you wanted and talk about it in general, but uh, uh, we had an exceptional year last year given the restrictions and we exceeded the work plans. Uh, the parks crews, obviously, they had to they had to switch from from field maintenance to park maintenance uh, when we seen the what was happening with parks and trails and the amount of added use. Um, but we weren't affected on the revenue side because it's community services that looks after the revenue, even though none of the facilities were used last year. So uh, that's where we are, and I'm happy to answer any questions. But uh, I really feel that as a division, um, we pulled together last year, and and we hope to to do the same this year. Thanks, Steve. Reva, is that the end? That's not the end. Oh. <laughs> I got a little bit more for you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to share my screen again. So you okay, can just before you do, I just want yeah. to say uh, to staff, uh, thanks for those updates. Um, we're certainly aware that you had challenges um, throughout the past year. Um, one, one thing we can say is uh, everybody everywhere had them. We, we weren't unique to, to the situation, but whether you were in a department that had to open and close consistently or one that had to stay open and serve the public nonstop, or were another department that opened and closed and uh, came into work and then worked from home, whatever, um, know that we realize it's been a tough year and that we appreciate what you've done. And uh, it looks like we're going to do a little bit of the same for a while, but maybe before the end of this year, we will actually do something that resembles things that were more like 2019. But thanks for, uh, thanks for those updates. Go ahead, Reba. Thank you, Mayor Terziana. So I'm just going to share my screen again. So you should see this other financial information screen. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so moving on to some other financial information contained in the year-end report. Um, Long-term debt owing by the town at the end of 2020 was just over 5.8 million, as you can see here. Um, so this is approximately 725,000 um, less than 2019. I'm just gonna make it a little bit bigger so you can see it better. Um, so there was no new debt in 2020. Um, or budgeted in 2021. And the last adventure was actually issued back in 2010. So it's been a while since any new debt was taken out. So this long-term debt graph is um, illustrating the balances and the payments um, and that they're steadily decreasing as the debt is paid off. So the next big drop in principal and interest payment is expected in 2024. So moving on to reserve funds. So reserves are funds that have already been set aside by the town and are to be held and used for future use. So at the end of the year, the town has approximately $15.6 million in these reserves, um, which is up from 2019 by about $2.8 million. So some of the significant reserve increases this year included the town surplus of 891,000, which was transferred into the working capital reserve. Um, the building department also had a surplus of about $244,000, which was transferred into the building department reserve. Um, so there were, uns there were unspent um, municipal accommodation tax funds of about $150,000, and that is in a, spe a specified um, municipal accommodation tax reserve fund. So there was also um, unspent Ontario Safe Restart funding, which we received related to COVID-19. Um, and this was about $660,000 that's in a, a separate reserve fund. Um, there were also investment gains um, and interest income, um, investment income that was transferred into reserves and that those totaled approximately $144,000 throughout the year. Uh, so the next several pages detail the balances and purposes of each of the reserves held by the town, but I won't go into detail unless there are specific questions. I did want to note um, to answer, answer Deputy Mayor Alcock's question about the affordable housing reserve, that it was about $60,000 at the end of 2020, that reserve fund balance. So obligatory reserves are a little bit different than reserve funds. Um, so these are funds that are tied to specific agreements um, or legislation and can only be used for certain purposes. 
So at the end of 2020, included in this $723,000 in um, federal gas tax funds, approximately 600,000 of that um, has been specifically earmarked for the Main Street Streetscape project. Um, in 2020, we did receive about $600,000 in development charges, um, and we only spent about $360,000. So lastly, but not least, uh, is property taxes. Um, so taxes outstanding at the end of 2020 are slightly higher than the five-year average at the end of 2020. Um, so I think it, it's really important to note a few things here. Um, so the year-end balance does include some large supplementary taxes received uh, around the end of the year that are in our system, but they aren't yet due. So those are expected to be received in 2021. And that's really just a timing difference around the year and, and of, of when we receive those supplemental bills. Um, tax prepayments uh, have actually increased by about $80,000 at the end of 2020. Um, and then, you know, kind of looking at a comparison of the March 31st balances between 2020 and 2021 um, actually shows a substantial reduction of approximately $2 million. So it really just lends to the fact that, you know, this increase in tax outstanding balance at the end of 2020 is really just a timing difference. Um, so the manager of taxation um, does regularly review the, the, the taxes outstanding listing. Um, and is preparing for some tax sales later in 2021 if they're necessary. Um, so the, the growth and assessment chart here is showing the real growth that was built into the 2020 assessment. So this chart is showing the supplementary taxes and write-offs um, over the last several years. Um, so over the past couple of years, the supplementary taxes have been increasing. Um, in 2020, the tax write-off increased substantially, but this was because of several large items from previous years, which have now been settled. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, so I wanted to end the year-end presentation by calling upon our CAO um, to provide some words on, on 2020 and, and her insights. Uh, thank you through you, Madam Chair. It, it is obviously very difficult to provide a lot of positive feedback to 2020. Um, the one good thing is that we've all been able to mean our good health, and I trust that all of our families have done the same. It's been a really tough year. Um, I, I'm also wanting to note that, you know, the team at the town of Huntsville, uh, as we all know, this came upon us very quickly. Uh, with COVID, we have the opportunity to fight, flight, or freeze, and I like to think that our team did a really good job um, on entering the flight mode. Um, as soon as uh, this uh, pandemic arrived, I saw an immediate response from our team to make an effort to make sure that we could still continue to provide the services to the community uh, that council supported us to do. Obviously limitations by the province kicked in and, and we weren't able to do all of that. Um, you know, the, it, is a, it is a good story that we were able to bring uh, in the 2020 budget with a surplus, but it's also a bit of a bittersweet thing. Uh, we weren't able to provide a lot of the services that were expected within our community. Um, as with many other businesses uh, across worldwide, uh, we had to say goodbye to a lot of our team members, whether it was for a short period of time or a longer period of time. Uh, that was very difficult, but we also knew that uh, we did have fiscal responsibility um, to council and to the community to make sure that we could cut expenses where possible. So I just have to say that, that our team in the town of Huntsville really did an amazing job. They always say in order to make change, you always have to show up. And I can honestly say that our team showed up each and every day. And they showed up to help in other areas that possibly weren't their responsibility. Uh, but they worked really hard to make sure that we could still keep things moving along. Uh, as Director Hernan alluded to, uh, COVID did affect many of us in many ways, but from an operational perspective, it was really our community services division that was hit extremely hard. Uh, and that was the division that we had to see lots of uh, cuts and expenses because we had the reduced revenue. But for the rest of the divisions, I can honestly say it was 100 miles an hour, if not more, every single day. Uh, we saw planning applications increase, customer service inquiries increase. We saw a huge influx on demands within our community. People weren't traveling. We saw a lot of change in the housing market, which had um, a positive effect through house sales and transfers through our tax department. So everything just exploded. 
Um, we were the only municipality in the district of Muskoka to open up to the public, and we did so very safely. And, and again, I have to commend our team for that. Uh, and we also know that the pandemic is still upon us, as Councillor Withy noted, and it's not going away anytime soon. I'm not sure about most of you, but I'm still patiently waiting for my vaccination call. Uh, and we know that 2022 is going to be a very difficult budget year. Uh, we've had to make some cuts in 2021 in order to bring the tax rate into an acceptable percentage that council and the community um, would be able to uh, hopefully afford. But 2022 is going to be extremely tough. And we also know that uh, with the assessment, the reassessments that have now been deferred, there was some hope that uh, we would have been able to utilize that to keep uh, the tax increase in the levy low. Um, but 2022 is going to be hard. So uh, the senior team and I have had that conversation and we are committed to do the best that we can to bring in a budget that's fair to our community. Um, but we know that uh, the struggle is not over yet. So, um, but we are here, we are showing up every day and we're committed. Uh, to make sure that we meet the, the needs of council, the desire of the community, and hopefully start bringing back our services online. So uh, I just want to take this opportunity to, to send a huge thank you to all of the staff in the town of Huntsville, because I can't think of a better team that I would have rather been with during a pandemic than them. So, so thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Reva, is that... That's everything I have, um, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Councillor Withy. Thank you, Your Worship. A um, couple quick ones here. Um, is there any, any thought or any, let me just get to my page here. Is there any, so we've got $5.8 million in debenture debt here. Um, which includes significant interest is, and we've got this, this, you know, 15 million, 15 and a half million dollars in reserves. Is, is there any sort of thought to eliminating some of this debt early? Is that even a possibility uh, to, to get rid of this debt uh, faster and therefore save interest payments? Julia? Um, thank you. So we, we did look. Into, sorry, we did look into the. You got an echo. I don't know. Why I have an echo. Um, we did look into that earlier, and be, because we it is a debenture, it is they, they've given us that rate because it is a long term um, uh, commitment. So you'll see that I, I think the fairly low interest rates that are that are on there that you'd see compared to maybe um, interest rates that you'd see on a mortgage that type of thing. Um, right now, we're, we're probably earning better money um, in our prudent investment fund than we would be if we had taken that money out and, and taken the money out of our prudent investment to pay for the debentures. So, um, so the short answer is no, we can't. They're, they are locked in to those debentures. Um, but, I, but I think fiscally, I think it's, it's, it, we're doing well with our prudent investment fund so far. Supplementary? Yep. Um, thank you for that answer that's kind of what I thought was going to going to be um, on growth on page 47 we've got a huge spike for 2019 and then back down for 2020 um, you know as we all know this town is exploding uh, houses are going up everywhere it, it where what explains that jump and what are we anticipating for 2021 in development fees? Do you have any idea? Julia or Rita? Um, I, I can I can send information for you for the, sorry what MPAC is looking at um, for 2021. They usually set out some targets. I, I think it was around one and a half percent growth. Um, but I, I'll I'll get that um, that information for you. Um, but it is, I think they were fairly similar with 2021 as they were with 2020. I think 2019 was, was a banner year for, for the amount of assessment that they picked up. Um, I know there were some large condos that, that were put on right at the end of 2019 that, that had a significant impact on our assessment. Thank you. Councilor Weeb. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I was just wondering, you know, in February of 2020, 
uh, our staff across the municipality was basically working on top of each other. We were bursting at the seams for office space uh, in every, seemed like in every department. Then we suddenly were forced to go mostly work, to, work from home. I guess this question is probably for Denise. Do you anticipate or have you set targets for permanent work from home complement of our staff in order to keep the stress down on or to keep the, the demands down on our um, physical workspace? Thank you very much for the question, Councillor Reed. It has absolutely been something that we have been discussing with our senior management team. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we are actually looking at the need for additional office space. And that is a true comment that we, we had staff that were pretty much on top of each other in, in areas and just, you know, having five people work in a really tight office space. So we have been having some conversations. Uh, HR has been reviewing uh, working from home policies. Uh, that we will be seriously considering moving forward. One thing we have learned during the pandemic, um, I can honestly speak for myself, is that you get just as much, if not more work done, regardless of your location, the work still gets done, whether you're eight hours in a Zoom meeting in your home office or eight hours in a Zoom meeting in your municipal office, you still get the work done. And then there's not the pressures on the infrastructure. So um, I actually attended a, a webinar with the city of, I think it was Burlington on Friday, <clears throat> pardon me. And they were looking at building a multi-million dollar municipal office, like millions of dollars. And they learned very quickly through the pandemic, they didn't need to do that. They saved their tax taxpayers millions of dollars. So I think it's something that we're all looking at across, certainly across Ontario, probably across Canada and even larger that we will be looking at ways to, to accommodate and to support staff working from home in various, in various locations. So absolutely top of mind. Okay, council, I'm gonna read the resolution again because it was about an hour and a half ago when I first read it. And it was moved by Councillor Armour and seconded by Councillor Stone. It is recommended that the committee approve the 2020 Q4 budget deviations as outlined in Appendix B of report 2021-28. All in favor. With that carries. I have a resolution moved by Councillor Weeb, seconded by Councillor Whitney, is recommended that committee approve the investment distribution plan as outlined in report 2021-29 for the prudent investor portfolio for years beginning 2020. And further that committee approved the transfers to reserves as outlined in Appendix B of the report 2129 for 2020. And further that committee approved future transfers to reserves for investment income based on the investment distribution plan as outlined in 2129 for the prudent investor portfolio. Julia. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll try to be short here. Um, I might have run a lot of questions. Uh, Go for it, go for another hour. <laughs> a lot of financial information. I know everybody loves that. Um, so I, I did just want to go over this. So this was the second half of our investment portfolio that I had promised that I, I believe the last meeting. So this was, um, this is the money that we have invested in our prudent investment portfolio. Um, so prudent investment, as you probably all remember, it, it came into the municipal act um, just a couple of years ago. And this is, um, this is our first year of it. And part of, part of, um, the reason they did go for that the, the municipal act was changed was to, to provide more powers to municipalities to have um, to have different revenue streams that weren't tax-based revenue streams. So this was to help municipals create these, um, these new um, income funds. So part of our, um, our uh, strategic investment policy is to be looking at ways that we can improve our funding for our capital asset plans. So that, that kind of came last year. So that was kind of the first stepping stone. So now we've actually have um, some revenue and we wanted to look at how, how we should be allocating it each year um, because this is a new revenue stream for us. So um, uh, kind of on, sec on the second page of the report, um, I I've got a, a list of kind of some different funds there. And I just wanted to kind of go over how, how the revenue will, will be allocated to each of them. So we, we, we put in about $8 million into this fund and it was comprised of money that was um, specifically for Forbes Hill, that reserve, um, for development charges, um, for parkland and other obligatory uh, reserves, 
or funds um, and then general funds. So we've kind of, we've looked at our um, Forbes Hill and, and, and we're, we're recommending that we still allocate a portion of that investment income to that fund based on the, the proportion that it holds in the fund. So we were doing that for the investment income as well or the interest income in prior years. So there's, there's not a big change for that one. So we're keeping that as is, but any uh, investment income would go to that fund. Also, um, then it would go to the development funds. So the proportion of funds that sit with development charges. So we, we have a couple of funds within the development charge funds. We've got, you know, in, indoor parkland, we've got outdoor parkland, we've got, or indoor recreation, we've got fire, library, and roads. So it would be allocated to each of those proportionately. Um, then we have parkland and other obligatory. So that's um, parkland, our park, parking in lieu, and our uh, federal gas tax. So whatever money's held in that balance, we would allocate a proportion of the in investment income to those funds as well. Then after that, we're gonna look at our, our general revenue and, and we would be allocating any money that we have in our interest bearing account. So that's our HISA account, the high interest uh, savings account. We would put that to the general levy as we have in the past and we would, we would keep that money there. Um, so the new part is basically the all other income. So the balance of everything else that's sitting in that those investment funds. And what we're proposing is that we allocate it annually to the capital asset or the capital reserves that we have held um, for capital asset plans. So um, we would take um, whatever we would take the whatever funding that we're putting into each um, each plan each year. So. If we put in, you know, if we've got total reserves or total contributions to reserves in the budget of, you know, 50% uh, for the roads department, then we would allocate that 50% over to, um, to the roads reserve. So that each year we're just growing, every time there's income, uh, investment income, we would be putting it to grow those reserve accounts so that there's a, a source of funding other than just the tax base. So that will help get us to a more sustainable um, funding for our capital asset plans. So I know it's a little little confusing, but um, on, on the last page, we do have a, a summary that shows how we did allocate the funds out just so that, that you can kind of have a visual of how it, how it does laid out. Um, you can see for, um, for the development charges, we have um, allocated a portion of each of the funds that we have out there to, um, to each of the development charges. Um, and you'll see, for example, for the parkland, um, you know, we're putting income earned of uh, just around $5,000 to that fund. And then to the Forbes Hill, I believe it was about uh, $60,000 between the three funds that would get allocated to that. So it just helps our, our reserve balances grow each year without having to, to, to tax more for them. Questions, Council? Okay, seeing none. I guess my one question was I was trying to figure out what percentage um, would be allocated between the five different areas. And uh, so, so Forbes Hill has $3 million worth of investment. Whatever investment income is earned there would go back to Forbes Hill. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So it'd be based on, on its proportionate share of, share of the total fund. Right, okay. All right, seeing no other questions, all in favor of the resolution? Not curious. Okay, I have a resolution moved by Councillor Withy, seconded by Councillor Thompson. It is recommended that the committee approve the 2021 Q1 budget deviations as outlined in Appendix B of Corp 2021-26. And this is a much shorter report, Reva, but go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Terziano. Um, so first of all, I wanted to note a couple of things with respect to the forecast. So the 2021 March year-to-date actuals column in Appendix A of the report only represents the actuals to the end of 2021. So the forecast is, is also based on staff 
staff's estimates at a point in time. So for this specific forecast, um, staff did their forecasting in early April. So there may be further refinements required to the forecast that have arisen since then um, that won't be reflected in, in this forecast report. So as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, departmental staff have, have prepared this first quarter forecast for 2021. Um, so the forecast, which is included in Appendix A of the report, shows an estimated operating surplus of about $127,000. So this means that the town was able to employ cost-saving measures to more than offset the lost revenues as a result of COVID restrictions so far in 2021. Included in Appendix C to the report um, is a summary of the Q1 forecasted capital project spending. Um, and that indicates that approximately $23,000 more spending um, is expected to occur than was originally budgeted. So this does not have a 2021 net levy impact, however. Um, the additional spending is the result of an increased scope of work for the, the Port Sydney Beach rehabil Rehabilitation Project. Um, so this increase in scope will be funded by the Inclusive Community Grant, uh, which has been recently approved for $60,000. Um, so there are some savings in other capital projects, um, which are offsetting these additional costs. Um, so things like the steamer, which was originally budgeted for $20,000, actual costs came at about $17,000. Um, so we, we saw about $3,000 savings there. Um, the freight liner purchase also came in under, under budget by approximately $7,500. So all of those things um, add up to help reduce that increase in scope to the, the Port Sydney Beach project costs. Um, the MHP station roof uh, has also been deferred to 2022, which reduces the capital spending in 2021 by another $20,000. And that was based on uh, a number of factors that are detailed in the, um, in the attachments to the report. Um, so in order to remain consistent with our quarterly forecasts, a summary of the budget deviations um, included in the Q1 forecast has been provided in Appendix B. Um, so these show the forecast deviations from the originally approved 2021 budget. Um, so I'd like to go through those deviations in detail. And I'm just going to share my screen. So this is a, a very similar deviation summary to what we had gone through for the 2020 year end report. Um, it is substantially shorter. <laughs> so because we haven't had any 2021 deviations reported so far, um, all of these, actually one of them has been reported, sorry, the, the beach rehab project, the increase in scope has been reported in, in a, a March staff report. Um, so all of these other than that one item are new, so I'll go through those in detail. So this first item, there's no actual dollar amount difference that, um, that's over 25,000, but because it, it's material, materially different from what we've put in the budget, um, it, it's a project that's not moving forward at all. So that's the um, virtual pedestrian and traffic tool for Streetscape. Um, we originally budgeted that for $10,000. Um, to be funded through the corporate information reserve and the project has been canceled. So we did need to report that because it, it um, it's, although it doesn't meet the dollar threshold for a deviation, it's still a, a substantial change from what was originally budgeted. So this next item down in the in financial services, um, there's lease revenue of $441,000 um, that was unknown at the time of budgeting. Um, so there is no net levy impact to this because all of the, that lease money will be transferred into the, um, a specific center street uh, reserve. So this next item um, for, related to COVID-19 is um, additional COVID recovery funding. Um, so the amount uh, has been transferred into the Safe Restart Reserve. Um, until, until such time as we know what to use the funds for, um, you know, if, if, and that will become more evident as the year progresses. Um, so the next item down, uh, more grant funding in our COVID-19 uh, budget sheets, and this is the uh, COVID assessment center funding. Um, so this is an increase in revenues, um, which is based on the actual funding formula in our agreement for the assessment center. 
Um, so this money is gonna go towards offsetting all of the direct and indirect costs of running the assessment center. Um, also in our COVID-19 uh, budget sheet, there is part-time um, SWB that has been specifically allocated to the COVID-19 sheet, um, which was not budgeted for. Um, this is specific for custodial time so that, um, you know, it was budgeted in the facilities department and now the actual costs are showing up in this COVID-19 um, budget sheet. So in community services, um, you know, as we saw in 2020, community services is hit pretty hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so various revenue lines, um, this is showing our estimate of overall revenue reductions at this point in time, um, other than what's specifically listed below. And there are a few other, you know, specific line items in revenue that are over 25,000. Um, so this is the aggregate of all of the minor revenue losses. Um, so, you know, there might be a, a few line items that are $5,000 lost revenue. There might be $250. It's, it's all of those combined in community services. Um, so throughout various departments and community services, there are some significant um, reduction in staff costs and SWB costs um, related to COVID program and facility closures. There are also some um, specific in facilities. Uh, there are some savings in SWB because of staff vacancies and turnover. Um, this is partially offset by an increase in custodial costs at the library. Um, so also in facilities, um, you know, with the, the facility closures, there's, there's a, an estimated um, reduction in hydro costs as well. Um, at this point, we've estimated $41,000 in savings. Again, as I mentioned in uh, the 2020 year-end report, it's a bit difficult to estimate these savings because there's no separate meters for each aspect of the building. Um, and you know, we, we don't have a lot of historical data to go on in, in forecasting during a pandemic. So that's our current cost estimate. Um, the next two items are revenue reductions related to COVID, um, specific for minor hockey and um, other ICE revenues. So those two specific line items were over $25,000, so they're being reported separately. Um, in the bylaw department, um, a couple changes here. So the streetscape coordinator was originally um, budgeted in the bylaw department. That's been moved to marketing, um, and, and they're really... Um, there's, that didn't really change, right? That position didn't change, it's just where it's being reported. Um, so the, the net levy impact, that $4,200, is, um, is the result of a, a position evaluation for the part-time bylaw officer that was budgeted in 2020. Um, and then again, the next line down is the streetscape coordinator position. Um, which is fully funded through uh, through reserves. So there's no net levy impact. And that's just showing that it's now in the marketing department rather than bylaw. And um, the last item was brought forward in a March 24th staff report. And that is the additional costs um, for the increase in scope of work at the beach, um, Port Sydney Beach um, and, and, and the associated grants with that. So there's no net levy impact, um, but we did get that inclusive community grant which will, will fund those additional costs. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm available for questions. Questions, Council. Okay. Um, I guess there aren't none. That one was pretty straightforward. Uh, okay, uh, you heard the resolution. Q1 budget deviations, all in favor. Not All right, Council, would you like to have a lunch break now or do you want to keep going for a bet first or how many? Wave your hand if you want to break now. Okay. Um, 30 minutes. Okay, let's let's reconvene at one o'clock.
still missing a few counselors. I guess we better leave. <laughs> That's a good idea. We, we don't quite have quorum yet, so. <laughs> there they come. Okay, Councillor Withy, Councillor Fitzgerald, Councillor Schumacher. It says I can't do my video because the host has stopped it. Uh oh. We'll get, we'll get the host to unstop that. There we go. Councillor Weeb, Councillor Withy, are you there? Yeah, there's Councillor Weeb. Okay, uh, welcome back. I'm always here. Hope everybody got some food. Um, the clerk just informed me that we might have to reset the Zoom because we're going over eight hours. And I, I replied with, no, we're not going over eight hours. So we're going to speed things up a little bit. <laughs> um, obviously, we're not going to take any shortcuts on uh, questions from council, but we are going to um, get the report presentations speeded up just a little bit. So um, we're back with the first report is a um, report. Where do we leave off? Hang on. Oh, report on grant applications. And that's for information only. Julia's here. Um, Julia, if there's a highlight, go ahead. Otherwise, we're going to go straight to questions. Any no highlights? highlights? No, no highlights. highlights. Are there any questions on the grant applications? It's for information. Seeing none, we will move right to the federal gas tax, um, one time 2021. And I have a resolution. Excuse me. I have a resolution moved by Deputy Mayor Alcock and seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald. It is recommended that staff consider the top up of the federal gas tax funds to be received in 2021 during the 2022 budget process and bring forward recommendations for infrastructure projects that have been identified in the town's asset management plan as priority items at that time. Julia? Um, so I'm, I'm here for any questions if, if there is any. Deputy Mayor Alcock. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Julia. I, um, my question is, so the resolution is saying we've received this funding and we're in essence going to tie it to our asset management plan, which is a requirement of AMO anyway, um, but we're going to deal with it later on, right? Is that? Um, through, through your worship, yeah, that's correct. So we, we don't have to do anything with this money at this time. It, it'll sit in our um, obligatory account until we have council approval to, to use the funds. Um, so, and the funds are to be used for um, high priority or high um, high risk, high priority assets that are identified in our capital asset plan because that's, that's what the gas tax is tied to. So um, we'd be looking at it for those projects. So if I may, Your Worship, my follow-up question then, uh, because I, I look at all of the categories where we could be spending, right? I know it's tied to the asset management plan, and I did actually have a, a quick look at that. Um, but it does identify things like culture, tourism, community energy systems, capacity building, brownfield redevelopment, um, recreation. And when I went to our capital asset management plan, I guess I'm putting this out here. I hope we don't lose sight of all of those categories because, you know, our capital asset management plan, I realize is a work in progress. You know, some areas are really detailed and others not so much, but a lot of it is focused on roads, roads and bridges and, and some parks and trails, right? And I, I fear, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we got this extra funding and we're tying it to a plan that we've got very detailed, um, you know, descriptions of our roads. And I, so 
by. I'm really saying that I hope that we don't say at the time we're going through budget review, oh, we've got this money and we're going to throw it all in roads. I don't want to lose sight of the fact we've got other areas that actually have been identified in our strategic plan that are unfunded and we're not following up on. So is that, is that sort of, maybe your comment on that would be great. Thanks, Julia. Julia? Um, thank you. So, so we do actually have a very robust um, capital asset plan. And although roads is the, the biggest dollar value of it, we actually have a lot of, and we're probably one of the furthest municipalities ahead for how much information we have on non um, roads assets. So we do have our parks in there. We've got um, our facilities in there. We, ha we have all of our assets most of our assets in there, the majority of our assets, not just tied to roads, also the assets that are tied to those culture and recreation, those assets are included in our plan. And we do have risk assessments on those as well. So definitely you're, you're correct. We wouldn't lose sight of that. And this definitely is not just, just for roads. As the report says, it can be used for any of those items that have been identified. And all those areas have been identified in our asset management plan. So we, we definitely won't lose sight of that. If I may, just one quick follow up to that. Yeah. Okay, last comment on that is, um, and I appreciate it, the logic in placing it with our 2022 budget process, but uh, was there any consideration of looking at unfunded projects that are part of our strategic plan now that are also related to our asset management plan? Um, because we're getting the money now. So I was just curious if there was any sort of connection or we just, it makes more sense to put it off. Um, so we can, we can certainly look at that if, if there is some items that have been brought forward. I, I think the thinking right now is we have some very big projects currently on the books right now. So we're, we're looking at getting those done. So we just don't want to have too much going on all at once. So um, it's definitely something that if something does come up that we, we do think it's urgent that we would bring that back to council um, in a report and get council's approval to go, go ahead with that. Council, I, um, I didn't like this resolution. I tried to get it changed before the meeting and, uh, and, and obviously I couldn't because it was already in the agenda. I do not want to identify this money that we received in 21 it, for the 2022 budget. We have things that may surface in 21 and the treasurer has advised me that this money goes into the gas tax reserve. If we simply defeat this motion, we will then make a decision whenever we want to use this money for whatever we want, as long as it's, it's eligible. So my suggestion is we defeat this motion and let the gas tax money sit until such time as we identify a need. Julia, have I got that right? That's mm -hmm. what you told me, I think? Yep, council can defeat the motion. It will just sit in that, in that fund. Okay, Councillor Thompson. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, just relating back to uh, what CAO Corey was mentioning during her report that 2022 is going to be a very, very challenging year. Um, and um, I'm just wondering if maybe it would be uh, uh, more prudent of us to uh, not defeat this and, and, uh, and wait to see exactly what's occurring in 2022. And I assume this is all because MPAC has uh, decided to uh, delay the, uh, the assessment uh, from 2020 to 2022 or whatever it is. So um, I'm just wondering if it might be wise if we didn't defeat this motion and, uh, and uh, uh, you'll look forward to what possibilities we might require in 2022. And I wonder if maybe CAO Corey could comment on that. Madam Chair, um, just before I respond to Councillor Thompson's inquiry, I would have to ask the clerk if, if this motion is actually defeated, if that precludes uh, us from using the gas tax money in the 2022 budget. I, I would, if she could speak to that, um, that kind of ties in, I think, to your question as well, Councillor Thompson. Madam Clerk? I believe that's a question for Julia. So, so just for clarification, the, what's been proposed by the mayor is that the motion on the floor, which currently states that the additional gas tax money received be used in the 2022 20, budget to bring forward to, to cover costs of infrastructure projects. So if committee defeats that motion, if the motion's defeated, does that mean that that can't be considered for the 2022 budget? I think that's actually a procedural question. 
Uh, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. I think it's a Julia question. Okay, and I do apologize, uh, your, uh, Madam Chair. I, if Councillor Thompson could just perhaps clarify the question that he was asking so I can make sure I answer it properly. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yes, with three, uh, I'm assuming from this resolution that the money will be received in 2021, but to be used in 2022. Is that not correct? Is that, I, I'm finding it a little bit confusing, but that's what I'm sort of getting from this resolution. So just for clarification, if I may, Madam Chair, just for clarification, the funds have been received. Uh, there is a specific time in which they have to be used, I understand, but there's no specific timeline in which we, we don't have to commence them at a certain point. They have to be used, I believe, within a certain time. Julia can confirm that. Um, so it's just been recommended by the treasurer that the funds that have been received just remain in that obligatory reserve. And then come the 2022 budget time, we make recommendations on which projects that are identified in our capital asset plan that have been identified as high priority items be funded from the additional funds. That, that's what the recommendation is proposing. I hope I've answered your question. Okay. The thing is, by by not by not by passing this resolution, we identify this money cannot be used until 2022. And if we have something legitimate to use it for in 21, we can't. And if we if we don't have something that we identify in 21, it's there for 22. So that's why I'm against it, and I'm not voting for it. But uh, Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. You, you, what you're saying is, I, I didn't say it as well, obviously, but that was the point I was trying to make as, as well. I, I just thought it was a missed opportunity because we know that there are things that perhaps we could use the funding for. So if we pass this motion as is, then it's delayed until 2022. So I just wanted, I, I agree with your, your recommendation, Your Worship. I think it, we should have it sitting there in case there's something that we feel as council that we want to speed up or it, that feels that there's a necessary expenditure and we have it and it's related to our asset management plan as well as our priorities. So I support your proposal, Your Worship. Councillor Withy. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to uh, pile on to that too. I think I, think I, uh, I know I support uh, defeating this motion. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I don't understand why we would tie our hands unless there's some rule that says we can't. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'm just curious why the motion was brought through the way it is to save it for 2022. Was there something that they were looking for? Is that just, or is that just an option they wanted to give us? Julia? Thank you. Um, I, I believe the reason we just wrote the motion the way it was is just to let you know that, or let council know that staff's recommendation is, is to not bring forward a, a new project at this time. But certainly with any motion, I mean, if council passed this motion and then, um, you know, next month there was a project that, that we wanted to bring forward, we could certainly, um, we could certainly come back and make that recommendation, which would, which would def you know, kind of overturn this motion, right? So I, I don't think our hands are tied if we if we do that. It is just considering it. So we just wanted to let you know what staff's intention was at this time. But certainly, as I mean, we, as you all know, everything changes month by month, and we could certainly certainly change that if if there, a high priority came up. Councillor Fitzgerald, does the clerk have a motion prepared that I'd be happy to to make the motion? Uh, just the one on the table is just, it, 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 if we don't pass it, if we defeat it, we don't need, it's not an amendment we're looking for. Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Tanya, you have clapping hands on. Does that mean you want to say something? Um, it's okay, Mayor Terziano, you've called the vote, so I'll let you continue. Opposed. Can, can we, hang on, let, let me do that. I didn't get a count. I want to do all in favor. Opposed. 
and that's defeated. Uh, the next report is for information only, and it was actually prepared at our request by Crystal, who's not with us today, but it is an update on the accessibility. Um, if there's any questions, uh, Tani can probably answer them, um, but if not, there's no resolution. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, through you, Your Worship, thanks. I do definitely, obviously, appreciate the report. Um, I guess as we were talking gas tax funding and I'm looking at some of the stuff around transit and it's saying pending budget, pending, and I'm thinking it might fall into gas tax funding, all of those things. I mean, I, I guess at some point, when do we look at that? When do we, we look at our bus stops? When do we look at, you know, our that's those things that, that have a budget attached to it. You're, you're absolutely right. We have a lot of uh, different things on the table as far as transit goes and accessibility that we need to uh, start focusing back on because we've just, we've just sort of let it go for a while. Uh, Deputy Mayor Alcock. I just very brief, thank you, Your Worship. Very briefly, following Councillor Schumacher's words, I think it was having that juxtaposition of the accessibility right after the other that it, I had exactly the same thoughts. I thought I, I did look at the list, and there are so many things, good things that we should be doing, could be doing, and there were a number that said pending funding. And to me, the two go hand in hand. So um, I, I thank you, Councillor Schumacher. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. I think maybe um, a good direction might be in considering we're getting very close to having a strategic plan update that we should see just where these issues fall in our strategic plan and specifically where we're at with them um, as far as whether they're in progress, not started. Um, but anyways, we can address that when we get to that report. Uh, municipal and school board election voting method. Madam Clerk. Oh, hang on, I have a resolution. Let me read it. Moved by Councillor Fitzgerald, seconded by Councillor Armour, is recommended that a bylaw be prepared to authorize the use of internet and telephone voting for the 2022 municipal election. And further that, the clerk be authorized to select vendors for the provision of internet and telephone voting services for the 22 election, subject to any budget approvals if required. And further that the mayor and clerk be provided delegated authority to execute any agreements necessary for an internet and telephone voting system for the 22 municipal election. Tanya. Thank you, Chair Trosiano. So this report is before you today seeking approval for internet and telephone for the 2022 municipal election. The report also outlines some changes that will be in place for 2022. And these changes are to modernize municipal election processes such as the clerk may now to choose to allow candidate nominations and third party advertiser registrations to file electronically. Um, as noted earlier, lots of processes are all going online now. You may notice the framework for the rank ballots that was put in place for 218 has now been removed. Um, as noted in the report, all six lower tier Muskoka clerks work collaboratively together with each election. As soon as we pass our bylaws with a voting method, we collectively begin preparing for our vendors, our processes, procedures, and advertising. This begins 18 months out from election day. So here we are. All six lower tier clerks will be presenting the reports in April and May. Currently, Bracebridge, Georgian Bay, Gravenhurst, Muskoka Lakes have presented their reports. Lake of Bays will be presenting May 4th. Okay, questions, Council. Councillor Stone. Um, so Tanya, we tried this twice. It uh, caused serious problems twice. What, how, why do we think it's gonna be better this time? Annie? Thank you, Councillor Stone. So in every method of election, you always have challenges and problems, whether it be a postal strike, or whatever. 
that's why the clerk has the authority to adjust. And we had two instances where we had to adjust. We still got the election results. There was no issue. It just happened to be a delay a couple of times, but you're going to have it with any method. There's no stopping issues. Thank you. Council Whitney. Thank you, Worship. Uh, my question is, do you, um, I'm looking at what happened in the past as far as budgets and expenses and it seems, I'm not understanding why it's jumping up so much. Is this because of these vendors charging more or um, how does, how does that work? Um, uh, you know, and, and I'd also add that I'm, I'm not sure that I like this internet and phone stuff because of the hacking possibilities, but anyway, um, seems like everybody's doing it. There's no option for mail as well on top of this. As soon as you start adding different methods on, the cost increases. The so, cost is increasing anyway. <laughs> We're not adding methods on. Are, that was are, my first question. Are you um, looking at uh, the 210, 214, 218 counselor with you? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. So the, the, with the 210 election, I can tell you that was internet and telephone. We added a component in 218 that um, brought in a security vendor that looks at the software that we use for internet and telephone. So I can tell you that that was a, an increased cost since 210. But if you look at 214, that was vote by mail. There's only $5,000 difference between the two. I think what council uh, committee needs to ask themselves is I can tell you that and I have a chart I can bring up if you'd like, but I can tell you that with each method, it's heavier in one area with an expense and lighter in another. So for instance, with traditional method, vote by mail method, you're heavy on staff costs. You're lighter on the other. With internet and telephone, you're lighter on staff, you're heavy on vendor. It's really not much of a difference. It's between ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 difference. What you need to ask yourself is what kind of election do you wanna provide for your public? Do you want it to be easier? Do you want it to be accessible? What, what do you foresee? I think that's the question you need to ask yourself. I want it to be secure. Absolutely. And, and that for me is uh, integrity of an election is key. Um, you don't, I don't see, well, I'm not sure what your, I'm not sure the chart on the election reserve. I don't know how much you're anticipating the, the expenses to be for 2022. Is, do you have that? I have to stay within the budget that's allotted. Again, I don't have the, the election budget will be created in the fall with the rest of, of the council budget for 2022. As I said, the, the difference is, is between the staffing and the vendor. One's heavier, one's lighter, depending on the method. Councilor Thompson. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh... Your Worship, I think Councillor Weeb was ahead of me, but I'm just going to make a very quick comment. And with regards to um, to uh, this method, I think this is much more secure. The the only, I guess, the most secure method is is the voting in person type of thing. But um, making uh, the ballot available to uh, to our residents and, and seasonal residents, this is the way to do it. I think there's a, more of an opportunity to uh, to have uh, fraudulent returns by vote by mail uh, than, than these other two that are being recommended by, uh, by our clerk. So that's all I wanted to say, uh, Your Worship. So I'm okay with this. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Weed. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I wanted to just um, be re, um, reassured that regardless of the method, if we do choose an internet phone method, that there will be a kiosk at town hall that anyone who's not internet savvy can come to town hall and essentially vote in person, right? Using one of the terminals. So I just wanted to be, I want that confirmation. Tanya? There will absolutely be an election help center just like we had last time. Yes. 
Deputy Mayor Alpha. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, Councillor Weeb beat me to it. That was one of the comments I was going to make, but I did have one other question. And just a curious one, Tanya, if you have a theory why um, the voter turnout was way down in 2018 compared to the other years. Danny? There's different, there's different reasons why a voter turnout is lower than others. There's many components to it. I, I think one of the biggest ones is the mayoral race. Um, as you probably remember, we had two running last time. Some years we've had five, six. So it just, that's a, one of the big components. There's multiple components, but that's one of the, one of the components. It's also, you know, how many candidates are running in each ward. It, it, it's, that's one of the big drivers as well. It's not necessarily the method. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people think, well, internet telephone, we're gonna have extreme, extreme numbers. That, that, that really hasn't shown the case. It's, it's a conglomerate of reasons why people will, people will vote. I appreciate that. That, that was my yeah, was suspicion as well. So thank, thank you for that. Councilor Armour. Uh, thank you, Worship. I was just gonna comment on that too. The fact that when you read the report, 35.15% voter activity in the 2018 election, and we had two who were actually acclaimed in that term. So that's a pretty, pretty good out, uh, turnout of voters in my opinion. Councilor Withy, did you have your hand up again? I don't know why I just put it up again, but uh, what I was going to, I was just going to say that in what I've uh, um, uh, understood, it's all about uh, uh, the con the contest for mayor that drives um, people. I think to pay because as you know, any. I think Brian's not on mute. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. that's what I. That's how I understood it. When there's a contested mayor seat, it's uh, more people show up. Councillor Schumacher. Yeah, I, I think I would agree. It probably didn't have anything to do with the frustration on that last day as people were trying to um, log on because they did get they were given the extra 24 hours to do so correct okay council you've heard the question all in favor opposed carries A strategic plan, Madam CAO, for information only, but I understand you need a few minutes. I will try to take less than 30 seconds. Thank you. So before you, we do have the strategic plan report card, uh, which we will have Andrew Zanier just quickly walk you through uh, the online version that you'll be able to go into later and, and check out different uh, locations. Andrew has joined us. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so just to remind council that the strategic plan is one of the most important documents that a municipality can have. It is a roadmap and clear direction to staff on the direction that council wishes to go during their term of council. We take the strategic plan and we develop our annual business plans, which then tie into our budget, which then tie into our, our work schedules, our business plan schedules for the following year. Uh, so again, a very important document, but I also think it's important that in order to see how successful we've been that we do have to measure it. So Andrew Zanier and Margaret Stead have worked diligently to put together an interactive document, which is similar to our strategic plan, that we can show you just exactly um, how, how we have done as staff implementing the directives of council. Um, I, I don't want to steal Andrew's thunder, but the one thing I do have to share is that uh, the plan has only been in place for 18 months, roughly 18 months. 13 of those months, we've had a pandemic. And as you will see to the attachment to the report that we have only about 12% of the strategic plan goals and objectives that have not been scheduled. And the rest of them have been completed, are in progress or ongoing. So I think that is something to be very, very proud of um, as an organization. And it's very difficult because sometimes we tend to forget to look at our accomplishments and just look at all the things that are undone. So Andrew will, 
walk you quickly through a process that shows you that in 18 months, uh, we've, we've done pretty good at meeting those goals and objectives. So with the chair's permission, I'll pass it over to, to Andrew. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Denise, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm uh, just gonna share my screen. And, uh, uh, and can you see that okay? Yeah, we can. Thank you. So, um, so how are we doing so far? So when, when we sat down to, to, uh, to, to do this review, we decided to, uh, to split all the goals in the plan into two uh, broad categories. So the first category are, uh, are passive goals, which um, are just items that, that are ongoing. They kind of more meet our say, mission, vision, values that the town holds. Uh, so, you know, an example of that would be uh, we have a, a goal that mentions that, uh, you know, staff reports will be uh, viewed through an environmental lens. And as long as we continue to produce staff reports, that is always going to be something we're going to do. So the, uh, the other category that we've come up with is, uh, is something called actionable goals. And these goals um, actually have to have something uh, happen for them to be marked as complete. And an example of that is uh, there's a goal to uh, create and adopt a sidewalk master plan, which, uh, which committee did uh, just very recently. So this is the, uh, the dashboard we created. And uh, this is a little small on my screen. Would you like me to make this bigger? A little bit if you can, Andrew. Uh, how's, uh, how's that? That's much better. Great. So this is the, um, the report card, uh, the interactive report card we've created uh, to report on this plan uh, from now on. And uh, the top half is essentially the complete list of all the, uh, the goals uh, and their, um, their category, what their status is, and uh, then some uh, additional commentary uh, provided by the senior management team just to provide some additional context uh, for each of these goals. And at the bottom is a, is a tally of those uh, uh, items in, in status. So the, uh, the, path, the ongoing goals represent a good, a good, a good chunk of the total plan. And the actionable goals represent represented here as either not scheduled, in progress, or completed. So the good thing about this is uh, there are several filters you can apply to this in order to rather than scrolling through this multitude of uh, items. Um, so so for example, if I want to just see what items are completed, I can just uh, click that section of the chart, and the list then filters to uh, show what I've what I've selected. So these are the just the items that are are completed. Or if, uh, if you, you so wish to choose, uh, if you want to say focus on say a, a specific uh, pillar of the plan and see how that's doing, uh, there is a, a section here where you can select uh, one or multiple uh, pillars to just to compare and contrast how they're doing uh, in, uh, uh, individually. And uh, just we'll use roads and infrastructure as an example. Um, so selecting that uh, automatically filters uh, the goals to just that one pillar. The, uh, the chart tallies uh, are updated accordingly. And if you want to go even further and see, well, how, how, is this pillar, uh, how is this pillar progressing? You can select that part of the chart and the, uh, the, uh, the list will filter again to show uh, the items in roads and infrastructure that are in progress. And the last thing I'll, uh, I'll just show you is the status of our actionable goals, which is the ones where I think we're a little bit more concerned with. And as Denise alluded to, we are considering we were only 18 months into the plan, we are doing fairly well in, in, in regards to completing these goals. So uh, you'll see here about a third of these goals are in fact completed. Uh, at least just about half of them are have been started and are in progress, which means a, a little bit more than three quarters of, of all of these goals, there's 67 of them in total and three quarters of them are at least completed or, uh, or in progress thus far. So, and not to be a broken record, but considering what, um, what challenges we faced over the last uh, year and a bit, uh, I think this is, uh, this, is a, a very, this is a very impressive tally thus, thus far. And I uh, do, do want to uh, remind council that um, your, your strategic plan is a living document. And if there's ever anything you want to see, uh, see added or taken out, we can do so at any time. And then this will be uh, updated accordingly to show those changes. And if there's any uh, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, council questions. Andrew, I think you have to stop sharing so I can see council. Sorry. No, oh, sorry about that. Oh yeah, because look at all the yellow hands. <laughs> I'm going to go in order of seeing them. Uh, Councillor Thompson. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Andrew. And uh, with regards to the ongoing portion of the uh, plan, um, is that quantifiable at all? Like the progress, is it, uh, is it quantifiable? Uh, quantifiable, I should say, at all uh, in, in re with regards to the ongoing uh, parts of that plan? I know the, with the actionable ones for sure, uh, but with the ongoing, I'm just wondering if it is quantifiable or how you go about doing that. So, uh, so through your worship to Councillor Thompson, uh, the, the answer is no, they're, they're, they're not uh, quantifiable, which I think is why um, we decided to take this route in, in, in terms of separating separating those from those uh, from the actual uh, actionable uh, goals. So um, there, there is another por portion of this report card that we won't um, get into now just for, for time constraints, but uh, um, these, are, these are things that, uh, that, I, that council did decide to, uh, to put into the plan just to make sure that we as you know, staff are making sure that we're at least adhering to uh, when it comes to our, our day to day work. And so they, uh, so even though they're not measurable, they, they, you know, they are still, uh, they are still being done. And in the data that we uh, will have available, it, it is shown, uh, it is being shown in, in there as well. Deputy Mayor Alpha. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Andrew, for your um, your presentation. Um, I do have a specific question, though. Um, at the very end, you said if Council wants to update or, or look at some specific targets or goals, we should just get in there. And I'm not quite sure how we do that, what the advice is. Be, and I'll give you an example. The example is around... Um, uh, climate change and, um, and and I think we've made reference here to the unity plan and we've got you know use the unity plan which was in 2010 um, through our, our notes and things like that but we do know that since then and it's there's a reference about ongoing discussions with DMM on climate climate action Muskoka there's a lot that actually is going on. A couple of other municipalities have already adopted climate action um, uh, emergencies. And um, there are a lot of things in the DMM um, initiative that would have a, an um, impact on each of the lower tiers. So I guess from my perspective, I think I wanna revisit that and make sure that we're, we're actually keeping up with it. Um, even if we're not where we want to be, but we're, we're trying to move with the pace in which our public is actually moving. I think we're, we're falling behind. And so, but I, I love the fact we have it in our strategic plan. How do we as counselors bring this up to date and move it forward? That's my question to you. I think maybe it looks like the CAO is going to answer that one for you. Okay. Thank you, Chair Terziano. So the one great thing about our strategic plan is that it's not a document that sits on a shelf that's in a binder that's a little more difficult to amend. So any time that there are changes that Council wants to bring forward during their term of Council, then it would be simply by resolution, and you'll actually see one later in the agenda today. Uh, it's, it's with respect to Ron Goslin's report about the greenhouse, where part of the recommendation is that it be added into the strategic plan. So we can recognize that it was a goal or an objective that has been supported by council that we wanna be able to track. So at any time that council wants to add items to the strategic plan, or if you feel that something no longer needs to be there, it's by simple way of motion uh, to committee through to council, and then we'll amend the plan accordingly. So for example, with the, the climate change strategy, uh, we do hope to have something before committee shortly uh, with respect to that. So if there's any specific change to the plan, if there's an actionable item that we want to add to it, we would incorporate that into the recommendation for council consideration, and then the plan would be amended accordingly. Councilor Withy. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I've got a few questions. Uh, first, first of all, can someone please tell me what the difference between in progress and ongoing is? Those to me sound like they're pretty much the same thing. Who wants that one? And if Andrew is comfortable, uh, Madam Chair, then that's fine. Uh, sure. So through Your Worship to Councillor Withy. So 
if we're looking at something let's say on pro it, that's in progress that just essentially means uh the item has it has has started so for example uh i know the um uh, one of the goals is the uh, say like the community master plan, for example, and that that goal is marked in progress because we have uh, we've issued we've uh, I believe issued uh, an RFP and, uh, and I've awarded that RFP to a uh, a consultant. So that so that's an example of a goal that is in progress. Uh, and compare that to say that's something that's ongoing. It's um, uh, that's just more something that we're going to be looking at more so in our in our in our day to day work. It'll it'll never be something that. Um, there's never going to be like one thing that's ever going to be completed for that. So it'll just be a continuous uh, process in our day-to-day -day work. So I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with this document on a number of levels. One of them is that I don't think the status is detailed enough. It doesn't, there's nowhere in here where, where it sort of says that, you know, other strat strategic plans that I've seen, I'm thinking of, of, um, the Lynn, for example, they had they had like color coded green, yellow, red, and 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 sort of when projects were started, they had an uh, when it was going to be completed, and and there really isn't that in here. It, the, the comments are sort of all over the place. Um, I still don't understand. I mean, I get it ongoing in progress. That's confusing, and there's still stuff in here that that. I thought we had already talked about taking out, um, for example, seek opportunities to make specialty health services available in Huntsville. I mean, that, that to me is not the job of the town, that's the job of mock. Um, and I thought we discussed that. Uh, the other one I see still in here, which I thought we discussed and removed was the splash pad idea. Um, because back in the 2010, 2014, we had a report that said the splash pad was gonna cost millions of dollars because you have to put in a huge freshwater recirculation plant. And so that's why it didn't get off the ground back then. And yet I still see it here. I thought it was, I thought it was gone. Um, anyway, some of the stuff is very vague. The status is very vague. Um, I think we need, I would suggest using a whole different uh, uh, way to record this because it really doesn't, isn't telling me a lot of a lot of stuff as far as status of these things go. And I mean, I would love to uh, um, go through this in a fine tooth, with a fine tooth comb and put forward a bunch of motions to get rid of some of this stuff in here that I thought was already gone. And my final question is, is does this sunset at the end of this term? Is this over at, at election 2022? Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just to answer so plan actually goes till the end of 2023. That affords us the opportunity to discuss with the new council what they wish for their strategic plan to look like for their term of council. We would always carry it into the next year because council obviously will be sworn in um, the end of 2022. That gives us time to do public engagement for the strategic plan for the next one. And we could simply have something and probably by mid 2023. So it gives us a little bit of room to actually get the plan in place with the new council. Um, with respect to the, the level of detail, it, it's kind of a, a two-step approach. So the first step is the strategic plan, which identifies the mission vision value and all the goals that council wishes to achieve. And then staff takes that information and they put it in annually to their business plans. That's where you would see the level of detail and when the expectation is for the, the item to be completed. So it, they're, they're kind of twofold. The strategic plan is the overarching roadmap on where council wishes to go. The business plan ties in the actionable item, the timing in which the project is to be completed, as well as the funding source. And then that ties into the budget. So, you know, we couldn't take the strategic plan uh, at, the, at the creation of it and say all of these will be completed at this time frame, it all ties into the, the importance of identified by council with the item and the budget to support that item. So uh, it, it's a bit twofold. Um, I understand what you're saying. It would be nice to have it in one document, but um, again, this is a higher arching, overarching document um, that we're working from. And then the business plans identify more detail. And I'd be happy to sit down and go over um, that process with you. And at any time, 
that council feels that the items need to be removed, we can. Um, we did have a motion, um, I believe I took a report one month after the strategic plan was passed and there were some changes made. Uh, I think it was in November, um, we did take some amendments to the plan because some of the items that were in it just it were almost impossible to be actionable or passive. So at any time that council wishes to make changes to the plan, you simply have to bring the discussion to council and pass a resolution and we'll amend it accordingly. Deputy Mayor I, I promise this is the last question. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, it's really uh, dovetailing on what Councillor Withy said, though, because I, I do think it's important just to revisit uh, some of the initiatives um, where, uh, and, and again, I'm using an example, moving the existing community garden to larger location, and it's in brackets, mandate. And then in the column, it says in progress. So I thought we had dealt with that, we weren't doing it. And what this would indicate is that staff are actually spending time working on that. So I, I would be confused if that's the case. I, I personally would rather not, but um, I thought that we had that discussion. And so if you look at our strategic plan, it would indicate that that's currently ongoing and under discussion and we're, we're, we're working towards doing it. So um, I do think it's important that we kind of go through and either identify ones that we've discussed or should move on, or maybe I, you know, or maybe there's lack of clarity on. Okay, I have a feeling that this conversation suggests that we might need a future meeting to actually put the strategic plan up live with Andrew, uh, maneuvering through it and discuss the items and see if there are some that we want to remove. And I, I'd also like to see some getting, getting some priority stars or something, because to me, we had some mandated things that haven't been done. And I thought that those should have been priorities. Maybe that's just what I thought, but I think we should schedule this for a future meeting, a, a live version of it. Okay, we're going to go because that was for information only. Andrew, thanks for that. And uh, and everybody, you, you can go on the site now and, and look at it and, and up, update to uh, where we are on things for yourself. So that's great. Uh, operations and protective services. Thanks for hanging around, Kevin. <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's you or Rebecca that are going to do the um, fleet management policy, but I will read read the resolution first. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Schumacher. It is recommended that the fleet management policy as attached as Schedule A to report Ops 21-16 be approved and further that the current municipal vehicle usage policy HREC 100 as attached to report Ops 21-16 as Schedule B re be repealed. Uh, who's taking the lead on this? Uh, hi, I, I think I was going to uh, uh, take the lead on it, um, okay. but uh, we didn't want to spend too much of your your time. Um, so recognizing that you know the policy is is 32 pages long, I believe. Um, it really is a, a collaborative effort with uh, with operations and the finance department to uh, to put into place a fleet management policy that really addresses kind of the the whole um, you know view of of fleet from right from budgeting to to our acquisitions to how we replace them how we assign them um, and as well as how we dispose of them and as much as you know what happens when we get into vehicle accidents so it's really a you know a kind of a full cycle view uh, or look at uh, at fleet management and it's incorporating an existing policy that uh, that we had that's several years old and, and, and expanding on that. So there wasn't really anything else I don't think we wanted to, to add to it uh, unless Kevin, you had anything else. No, that was it. It, it. It's a great policy. I actually, it's one I actually enjoyed reading. Most of the policies I find hard to get through, but this one was, this one was pretty, pretty concise and, uh, and pretty direct, I liked it, but uh, questions from council. Everybody liked it. <laughs> Councilor Withy. Thank you, Worship. I just uh, want to take a second to uh, thank Kevin for all the work he's doing. I think he's doing an amazing job. It did a major job this winter and the spring cleanup has gone really, really well. So I just wanted to 
to uh, point that out. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, totally, totally echoed there. Thank you. Okay, you've heard the resolution. All in favor? And that carries. Economic development. Mr. Oval, I have a resolution moved by Councillor Stone, seconded by Councillor Thompson, is recommended that $5,000 be approved from the Downtown Community Improvement Plan budget to support the facade improvement taking place at 86 Main Street East, and further that staff be directed to enter into a funding agreement with the owner of 86 Main Street East Algonquin Outfitters. Scott, do you want to highlight anything from the report? Uh, no, I think it's fairly straightforward, Your Worship. Um, just our first application that we've had this year, so exciting. Questions, Council? All the work's being done on Main Street, Scott. Nothing at the back entrance. Uh, as of uh, you know, as of this quarter, no. Uh, we've had lots of positive discussions with building owners and businesses about possibilities. So I think as we move through this, I you know, hopefully we'll see some possible works taking place at the back of the buildings. I know even Explorers Edge or not Explorers Edge, sorry, Algonquin Outfitters um, has talked about in the future about what they could do at the back. But um, I think right now, just a lot of discussion. So okay, all in favor of the resolution. And that carries. MHP Greenhouse Project. Ron Gosling, are you with us? Yeah. Hi, Ron. I've just got a resolution to put on the table first, moved by Councillor Weeb, seconded by Deputy Mayor Alcock. It is recommended that staff be directed to apply for available grants to fund the Muskoka Heritage Place Greenhouse Project and further the committee support the project as a priority toward future improvements at MHP and further that the 2019-2022 strategic plan be amended to include the MHP greenhouse project as a goal. Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Terziano. I'll share a screen. So primarily for the, I'll be as brief as I can, first of all, uh, primarily for those of you uh, on, at the meeting today who aren't part of the Muskoka Heritage Place Working Group. In a nutshell, we had the task of brainstorming ideas for the betterment of NH MHP and in part finding something new, something that can add value to the current visitor experience while increasing the number of local users and, and building some community support. Now more than ever, we know budgets are tight. That's why we feel this project being grant dependent for the build and carrying a minimal annual operating cost is a really good return on investment. We've established an initial set of goals. These may not all be reached in the first year, and we're sure that this list is going to grow. To increase community excitement and involvement at MHP, to create an additional feature that will increase community programming and add to the options of our visitor visitors that are already captured, to offer community workshops on sustainable food sources, affordable home growing, all things good about, about a garden, whether it be through um, personal wellness, uh, food choices, relaxation, to offer other workshops that may be completely unrelated to, to a growing environment, but in a really unique and cool space, to develop partnerships with the high school and, and programs that they may already have existing, to sell starter grower kits, to donate whatever product we can manage to grow to the food bank, to be able to sell education programming year round, whether it's based on agriculture or not, to have no impact on the authentic visitor experience of the Pioneer Village, but rather function separately and independently, to be accessible as growing or meeting space in the winter, and as always to build revenue streams to minimize our operating expense. The area we're talking about is between Can Lake and the, and the main entrance way to Muskoka Heritage Place. It's already flat, it's direct Southern exposure. Um, it will need some site prep and soil structure analysis. Uh, it's close to the road for accessibility and snow removal. Um, one thing that we think is an opportunity at the time that this goes forward, that it would be a great opportunity to dress up the entranceway of Muskoka Heritage Place, which is a little bit confusing and not so welcoming to our visitors as far as where the entrance is. The greenhouse is classified as institutional or educational. It's about 1,500 square feet, 60 feet by 25. The workshop programming space on the entrance side takes up about a quarter of the footprint 
and the growing bed space, the actual earth takes up about a third. Manufacturers tell me it's about a 10 week build and three week assembly on site, so 13 weeks. I figure if we, if we don't have funding confirmation by July 1st, we'll probably be pushing it off. I don't know how much of a good idea it would be putting this up uh, over the course of the winter. Just a rough drawing, semi to scale. Uh, you get an idea of the workshop on the entrance way, growing area partitioned off. And what those the gray rectangles are, are 13 12 foot by three foot rolling plant beds that make up the almost 470 square feet of growing area. The specs, we wanted the greenhouse to be as green as possible, which makes sense environmentally sound, which certainly carries over into how financially responsible it is as far as uh, annual uh, operating costs. It also has to be operationally functional because it's not really just a greenhouse. We want to do some other things out of that area. This list was, was far larger. It, it, it was presented to the working group and has been whittled down to what you're seeing today. So 60 feet by 35, we increased the size of the cladding or the thickness of the cladding. Poured concrete floor, floor connected to district water and sewer, uh, radiant hydronic heat in the floor, the rolling soil beds to uh, allow versatility by relocating planted crops, and we believe that open year round is, is essential. Um, staffing, this project will require paid manpower for the first year or two, however the goal is to minimize that through volunteer labor. Um, the Horticulture experience would, is going to be key. Um, that we, we see this person also being the lead on organizing, recruiting, and scheduling the volunteer manpower. This is going to require ongoing analysis to determine what works and what doesn't in this space. Uh, and I see that person having a split deployment with MHP as a seasonal employee and putting time in here. The time allotted to this is about a little over three hours a day of, of general maintenance and upkeep. So if it were a paid person, I can see augmenting that to make a full day in combination with MHP. The connection with Huntsville High School, about a month ago, I had a Zoom meeting with David and Daryl Scott. There's teachers at the high school. They know I'm speaking about them today. They're both avid growers. They worked in a commercial greenhouse at Croxall Farms here in Huntsville. I believe David just added a 15 by 30 foot greenhouse to his home. They preach and teach sustainable food options. They've been lobbying for a facility like the one we're proposing for years through the school board. They're very interested in partnering with MHP and the town on this project. I envision a shared use of the facility. They'd have a great teaching laboratory that would include crop maintenance, which would go a long way eventually offsetting some of our annual operating costs. There are three sets of expenses um, categories. However, depending on the grant, we may be able to include the initial startup cost in the grant itself. The majority of the annual operating cost is labor. And again, the goal is to offset that as much and as soon as possible. As far as revenue, just like the way we see building our initial goals, I believe that there are revenue possibilities and uses for this facility that we haven't even thought of. And it may come to light after we're up and running. Uh, but these are our initial targets. Our goal is, as always, to generate maximum revenue. However, I, I think we think it's going to just take a little bit of time to get there. The SWOT analysis, I'm, in the interest of time, I won't go through this. It's in your package. If you have any questions about this or any other part of the presentation, we can, we can discuss that after. Um, just a, a, an idea of what it may look like, obviously not attached to a building like this one is, but um, I do like the idea of the knee wall. It gives us more opportunity to really dress it up a little bit, and it just seems a lot more secure to me. Uh, we feel the project is the right fit for MHP and the right fit for the community, uh, not only for now, but moving into the future. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll take that off share. Thanks, Ron. Questions, Council. Councillor Withy. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thanks, Ron. This is a great idea. Um, you mentioned Croxall Farms. I don't know if you've ever been out there recently, but his is all hydroponic. And I, and I was wondering, I mean, that to me is, seems to be the way to go for the environment and everything else. And what's interesting with his operation is he's got these huge, two huge tanks of koi fish that actually fertilize the plants by a pumping system, he gets the fish this big and then they grow to this big and he sells them back to uh, Big Al's aquariums for sometimes 70 bucks a fish. Uh, so I would encourage you to go have a look at his operation. It's really amazing and uh, growing all kinds of stuff out there in, in the water. Um, anyway, that's my, but I'm, uh, I'm in favor of this. Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to make a comment. Thank you, Ron, for a great presentation. 
and I, um, I just thank you for doing all of the consultation on it. It's um, fantastic, and I'm really, hopefully, very excited if this approved, if it's passed today. Very exciting. I think it'll be, um, it'll be good things ahead. Council Weep. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I, I agree with those comments. I uh, I'm really was really excited when we first started talking about it, and uh, I'm excited about it now. I think that uh, there's we want to make sure we focus. There's one key that I was mentioned, but I want to reiterate it, and it's to increase the engagement with the local population. Um, too often, people have been to maybe a MHP once, or they go if if family are in town, but they don't. They're not return guests. But this is kind of a, this adds a new element, a new dynamic element that really is the whole crux of it is to engage the local community from young kids all the way, you know, eight to 88 type of thing, which I think is just fantastic. It's, this is, this is uh, very timely. Um, it's, it, it, for me, it ticks all the boxes. So I'm thrilled with it and I, I really hope for it. And then Councillor Armour. Thank you, Worship. Just, uh, I just want to echo those sentiments, and I, I like the idea that you're going to be donating the food to the food bank. That's a great opportunity for them and for the people in our community, so well done. Just hope you get the grant. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ron. And uh, yeah, I like the project as well. Where are you in the grant process? Uh, is there money available or a grant out there waiting to be, uh, to, to be had, Ron? Um, could you uh, maybe elaborate on that? Thanks. Through you, Your Worship. N not so much, Councillor Thompson. Um, I, uh, that's really uh, in Scott Oval's uh, portfolio. Um, this is really just a, is, is, is there interest for us to move forward doing this? Um, and I think the other part of this is that because there, there's a lot of competition for grants right now, um, we may not have a chance at it this time around. And that's why I think that the component of, um, of having this added to the strategic plan um, saves us a lot of time moving forward if everyone's in favor that it's a good idea and that's a good benefit to the community. Councilor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Worship. Ron, love your passion, love your energy, good luck. I know it's going to work out any way you want it to because it usually does. Keep your uh, nose to the grindstone, sir. Thank you. Councilor Withy. I just wanted to add, uh, apparently we've got a, you know, if the grant doesn't come through, uh, apparently we've got a $900,000 surplus. Okay, council, you've heard the question, all in favor? That carries. Thanks Ron for the presentation. Thank you. Good project. Okay, and the last one, community services, the repair of the auditorium floor, Simone, uh, have a resolution moved by Councillor Schumacher, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald, that is recommended that staff be directed to repair the auditorium floor at the Canada Summit Centre at a cost of 23,791.41 plus HST to be funded from the facilities capital reserve and further that staff be directed to use the auditorium for recreation programming and rentals where provincial and Simcoe Muskoka district health regulations and framework allow. Simone. Thank you very much through you, Mary Terziano. Uh, the report is in front of you. I believe all the details are there. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions, council? Seeing none. Nope, Councilor Armour. I uh, thank you, Worship, through you to Simone. I'm just curious why you didn't go with the first quote. I know it's pretty well double the cost, but um, I like the add replacement. With, I like the adhesive rubber flooring. I just wanted to know, if, is that more durable than the other style? Through you, Mayor Terziano, uh, great question because it, it depends. <laughs> uh, the answer is that depending on how we want to use the space, the rubber is fantastic. The rubber is more commercial, it's easier to keep clean, it's less on our maintenance fees. Um, that's a great way to go and that is what we're changing a lot of our tile spaces to. Um, our elevators, for example, are now this rubber um, material. However, if we were going to use this space and draw lines on it for indoor pickleball or you know, shuffleboard or, or any of those other programs that we do run, 
we can't paint on the rubber. So although we have the $50,000 in the capital um, um, budget line for the full 50,000, um, we're actually recommending for varied use and we're really not sure where this is gonna go after the master plan or after COVID. We just wanna be able to use the space now. The tile does serve our purposes. It does have us um, maintain, it costs a little more in maintenance because we could have to um, maybe maintain it a little bit more with detail. Um, however, it's a little bit more varied use. Basically, it's a more versatile flooring when we don't know what the long-term use of the space is going to be. And, and yet it gets the space ready to be used as soon as, as, soon as we can. All in favor of the resolution? And that carries. Okay. We are at new business. And with council's permission and a mover and seconder, sorry, Pete, I'm inserting one thing before we get to you, so. Um, with a mover and seconder and two thirds of council's permission, I would like to add the Algonquin Cafe license for Brendale Square on the agenda for uh, uh, discussion. Uh, Deputy Mayor Alcock, are you moving? And Councillor Fitzgerald second. It's recommended that the rules of procedure relating to additions to the agenda where public notice is not being provided be suspended to allow for discussion and consider consideration of a motion for a request from the Algonquin Cafe for a second refreshment vehicle at 6 John Street. All in favor? That carries. About two thirds. Um, so, I don't know if I have to, do I read the resolution before the discussion on this one, Tanya? Yes, or please. We, yes, please, then. okay. I need, a, I need a mover and seconder for this resolution. I'll let you know what it is before, oh, I've already got Councillor Fitzgerald as the mover. Uh, okay, the resolution would be, it is recommended that an exemption to business licensing bylaw 2017-111 for Walter Grice Algonquin Cafe be approved for 2021 for a second refreshment vehicle at 6 John Street. And further that committee support the CAO in exercising her delegated authority under bylaw 2020-37 section three to implement the committee's re recommendation. And the purpose of this is this wouldn't be ratified because we're only at general committee. Um, but we would like to possibly provide permission um, for the vendor to get set up for May 1st this year. And um, just by way of a bit of background, I, I spoke with um, Walter um, on Tuesday. Um, and uh, I think he really did get caught up in a different discussion. And had we had, a re had, we had this resolution before us without the rest of it, we may well have, have approved it. So if I can get a seconder for that, I'll open up the discussion. Councillor Schumacher, thank you. Okay, um, Council, Councillor uh, Fitzgerald. You're on mute, sir. my uh, space bar stopped working for sound. Everyone can hear me okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad this came back. I was um, not overly pleased by how we held this up on Monday night, but I do support council's decision as always, we made it together. Um, for me, it seemed that the application was so far along in the process that it, it it didn't seem fair and just for us to to hold that application up in a change in the way we do things with our bylaws. So considering it was there previously and the application was complete, um, I don't know when the application was submitted, uh, would it, whether it could have got to uh, council or committee sooner. I, I don't know, but um, I'm happy that we're going to move forward with this and hopefully everyone uh, is of my mind that uh, it's the right thing to do and, and give the CAO the authority to make it happen. Thank you. 
Deputy Mayor Alcock. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I'll be brief. I echo comments made by Councillor Fitzgerald. I'm very happy that this has been brought forward today. I um, I was hoping it might have been on, on the evening of council, but um, here it is today. And so I'll be absolutely supporting it. Councillor Stone. Yes, so I do agree with uh, your worship that this application did get caught up in a discussion about the food trucks uh, in whole. I really look forward to the staff's report that's gonna come back, but, um, but yes, I, I apologize to Walter and the uh, Algonquin Cafe for, um, for, for the way that we, we handled it. It was, it was caught up in a, a different conversation and he is a good steward of uh, business and he has a brick and mortar store and I wish him well. I will support this. Okay. Um... And I, and, and I assure you in my conversation with Walter, uh, he understood how, uh, how this came about and uh, there's certainly no hard feelings with us. So um, I'll call the question, all in favor. And opposed? And that carries. Okay, Pete, sorry, I jumped in there with one item of new business, but you're up now. And you are going to give us a bit of an update on the water filling station that potentially is going to be somewhere near the Civic Centre. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, Council. Um, I was asked to give a verbal update on the status of the water uh, bottle filling station project at Town Hall uh, Civic Square. Um, staff are working on moving this project forward. Uh, I just wanted to point out that this project is not connected um, or impact uh, with streetscape project. Um, it's in fact, we if we could uh, add it to the Tom, Town Hall uh, front step project, I think that would be best suited for it. Um, on Friday, February 5th, I met with, uh, sorry, um, with Councillor, uh, uh, Alcock and Morgan from the BIA in regards to uh, the town hall uh, location at the town hall square. Um, the BIA wants to purchase uh, two filling stations, I believe, for downtown. And one of the locations was uh, at town hall square. Um, I believe they have uh, $10,000 towards this project. Um, and then um, uh, and staff will bring a report forward to outline the recommendations, plans, and schedule costs for this project as it develops uh, a dependent on decisions on the town hall step project. So it would be added in with that, with that project uh, as well. Um, until we have that design, we're unable to attain reliable quotes for the water bottle filling station. Okay, uh, hang around for questions, Pete, Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for the report, Pete. I, um, as, as you alluded to council, as Pete alluded to, I, I did meet with you and with Morgan in February. The, the origin of this started, most of you will remember um, the hub, Graham from the hub came forward with the proposal of an O water bottle refilling uh, station. And after numerous meetings with Graham and Morgan, a couple of other people, um, it was just determined that the O, it's out of um, the Netherlands, it, it wasn't suitable for our, our climate and some of the demands that the um, owners of that product were making. The district couldn't approve it because of filtering systems. So we, we dropped that idea and we, moved to the idea of getting a more industrial, but a, a, a nice looking industrial, bright blue bo uh, water bottle refilling station. It's actually more expensive than the O. Um, and uh, it has been through, and Councillor Schumacher, you correct me if I'm wrong, it's been through accessibility and they are really thrilled with the most recent version because it, it does a few things. 
Um, so the, the reason why um, it's here today is uh, both the BIA, uh, had, they have not talked about it recently at the board. Originally, they had $10,000 for two. Now we're talking about one to be located. And there was agreement from the town that it would be in the, you know, near the wall around town square. I agree with you, Pete. It should be part of the facade um, improvement on the building. Um, but the, the hub has also has a couple of people who are willing to invest in it. But Morgan was waiting for some feedback from the council before going back to um, the BIA board, because at this point, we still haven't in fact signed off on whether or not we will pay for the ongoing maintenance as well as um, to determine um, that yes, indeed, we will locate this by town hall. And so I think it was really important to confirm for them that, that we're still really keen. This meets our strategic plan. We, you know, we've had lots of pressure for uh, a, a refillable water bot bottle station. And a lot of time has gone into this. And I, I think it's, it's kind of cool that um, we're being both BIA and the hub are offering to pay for it. So I hope that we don't miss the opportunity. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you through you, Your Worship. And yeah, just to, I guess, fill in on, on my areas there, we have worked with uh, a few members within the accessibility to sort of look at the different units. And we, um, with the BIA and the hub, have kind of gone back and forth on which unit uh, meets AOD, AODA standards, if not exceeds it, taking into consideration height for wheelchair. Um, if somebody doesn't have mobility of, say, uh, one hand, they can still be able to set the bottle down and push the button kind of thing. So it doesn't require the use of both hands to be able to maneuver. Um, working on that, the one thing we would, with councils, permission come back to accessibility is, is when we do decide where it does go, that it is viable for say someone to approach from the side with a wheelchair. So it's not like in a back corner and hard to maneuver and get to. So that's the piece from accessibility that once we determined within Civic Square where it goes, it does meet accessibility requirements to be able to approach it. Okay, so it, it sounds like as soon as we get the stair issue uh, resolved and, and ready for a tender process of some sort, we will get the meeting with Hub BIA accessibility and our staff and make sure that everybody's in agreement for where this water fill station is going to go and exactly what uh, attributes it's going to have, right? Does that sound fair? Okay. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Okay, um, we have the BIA request for parking. Andrew, have you got uh, have you got any mapping to put up for us on this, or just verbal if we need it? Uh, just uh, your worship, thank you. Uh, it's just a verbal if you'd like it. I didn't prepare any maps. Okay, so, so we have a request from the BIA and I'll need a mover and seconder where they're recommending that the town of Huntsville change the high street parking lot from a full day parking to a three hour time limit from April to October. And in discussions with staff, um, we wanted to identify where else we had all day parking that could be reduced to three hour parking for the summer months. And through that discussion, we were uh, discussing maybe June to September, as opposed to having April and October on the outside of that. So have the all day until um, maybe the 1st of June. Um, so Andrew, can you identify the parking lots that we're talking about? I know we've got 15 Minerva, 11 and 13 high, 10 and 12 Princess and 16 high. So just identify exactly where these are? Sure. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So I believe it was 11 and 13 High Street, and then the two on Princess Street, that is four separate properties that makes up the High Street parking lot. Uh, we're also talking about the Minerva Street parking lot at the intersection of Minerva and West, just down from the library. 
and behind town hall here, sorry, I'm pointing and looking behind town hall. Um, I refer to it as the uh, theater parking lot, but I think it's listed as a Sheridan parking lot. Okay. And, and we didn't, was the Royal Bank parking lot not supposed to be part of this? So the, the two parking lots, if they are identified in the motion, I don't believe they are. The Royal Bank parking lot and the River Mill parking lot are both currently signed, posted three hour limit. Okay. All right. So council, we can, uh, if I have a mover and seconder for the BIA request, I'll have Councillor Stone and a seconder for that. Councillor Thompson. So I'm going to first put that on the table. Moved by Councillor Stone, seconded by Councillor Thompson. It's recommended that the Town of Huntsville change the high street parking lot from a full day parking lot to a three hour time limit from April to October. And then I have a motion to substitute if I have a mover and seconder which would change the time frame to June to September and add the other parking lots as part of it. Um, Councillor Stone, yes. And a seconder. Councillor Fitzgerald. All right, now Tandy, do I, do, do I have to discuss the first motion before motion to substitute or can we just go to motion to substitute for discussion? If you, if you read that first motion to substitute and then go to the motion that substitute and talk at that time. Okay, so the motion to substitute is moved by Councillor Stone, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald. It's recommended that committee substitutes the downtown BIA motion for the following. It's recommended that the Town of Huntsville change the following parking lots from full day parking to a three hour time limit from June 1st to September 30th. 15 Minerva, uh, 11, 13 High, 10, 12 Princess, and 16 High Street. Questions? Councillor uh, Councillor Armour. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I'm just wondering why Veteran Way by the Korean Club is not included. And the second portion part of my uh, question is, we currently use the back part of the parking lot there on High for um, our town cars. So should there be a section that's uh, designated for um, yeah. municipal vehicles. So Veterans Way is already an all day parking lot. And that's where we would expect people that work downtown to park. Is that what we're doing? Okay. Yeah. And and I'm sorry, the where town vehicles park, I think that one's so, still signed two hours or has that gone to three hours already, Andrew? Um. Through you, Your Worship, if Councillor Armour is referring to the two spots in the, if you will, High Street parking lot, uh, it is signed uh, municipal vehicles. And just thinking, yeah, we probably would need an exemption for those two spots for municipal vehicles to park longer than the three hours if the uh, High Street parking lot is, in fact, signed as a three hour limit. Okay. Uh, Councillor Stone? So I just wanted to give a little background on this. So it is the, um, the, the parking subcommittee of the BIA that have had many discussions. Like usual, never enough parking. Oh my God, what's going on? And it's been perfectly clear that if the employees and the business owners don't park in the immediate area, there is plenty of parking for all the customers that may come around. And uh, we... So if, if we as a council can change these to three hour parking, and uh, we specifically uh, ask that the bylaw department uh, enforce it uh, strictly, heavily, constantly, um, the message will get through very quickly to the business owners and the staff that they need to park away and leave that spot, those spots for our visitors and customers. I agree. Um, I'm still confused where we need that exemption then, where these two spots are that are designated municipal. Andrew? Thank you, Your Worship. The two spots are right um, abut up against the, um, the business, the funeral home, and they're at the closest end to um, High Street. So as you pull in that open gate, 
They'd be immediately over to your left in the corner. Okay, so it's in the parking lot. Yes. So if I could just add, uh, accept the two municipal spots to that. Is that all right with the mover and seconder? Okay. All right, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion to substitute? That carries. And then the main motion as substituted with the exception, I think. All in favor? Okay, that carries. I have the feeling the clerks are gonna have a hard time figuring all that mess out, but. <laughs> all right, now we're back to our deputations and uh, apparently council, we've been doing things wrong for some time now. And when we have something like this on our agenda without having had a motion on it, we have to suspend the rules of procedure in order to put a motion on. So. Um, I need movers and seconders uh, for uh, the enlivened request for Avery Beach. Councillor Armour, moving. Councillor Withy, second. Moved by Councillor Armour, seconded by Councillor Withy. It's recommended that the rules of procedure relating to the additions to the agenda where public notice has not been provided be suspended to allow for consideration of a motion for the request for use of the Avery Beach Park shelter. All in favor? That carries. And then moved by Councillor Armour, seconded by Councillor Withy, it is recommended that the committee approve the request from Enliven Cancer Centre to waive the nonprofit park permit fees to a maximum of $480 plus HST for one hour of use weekly at Avery Beach from May 26 to October 10th, 2021. Uh, questions, comments? All in favor? That carries. And I, I, I take it that's understood that they need to still get the permit from Parks and Rec so that Parks and Rec knows who's where, when. All right, Huntsville Festival of the Arts. Again, I have a, I need a mover and seconder to suspend the rules. Councilor Fitzgerald, Councilor Schumacher. It's recommended that the rules of procedure relating to the addition to the agenda where public notice has not been provided be suspended to allow for consideration of a motion for the request of Huntsville Festival of the Arch to waive fees for River Mill Park for summer activities. All in favor. I'm not curious. So now the resolution that's been prepared that would need a mover and seconder is recommended the committee support in principle the Huntsville Festival of the Arts Summer 2021 Activity Plan and further staff be directed to report back outlining the full costs and agreements required for the plan. Uh, mover, seconder, Armour and Alpha. Questions and comments? I guess my only question would be if staff's being directed to report back on full costs and agreements required, I don't know whether that would include that our park staff so that they are having care and control over what space is being used and when and, and how congested things are getting. Or, does it, the park staff and the permit staff work together in that small? Yes, Mayor Terziano, they do. Actually, this will be uh, spearheaded by Greg and then parks will be kept in the loop. They'll be okay. consulted as well. Yeah. Because there was a lot of components and there was a lot of space being taken up and they weren't, you know, they were flexible to where they would go. So, so that would yeah. all get worked out together. Yes, Greg will look after it. Okay. All in favor of the resolution? And that carries. Uh, 
we have the request to lease space uh, in River Mill Park uh, for the floating restaurants. I don't know what else to call it, hang on. It's just got space. Uh, do I have a mover and second or to suspend the rules of procedure for this? Councilor Withy, seconder. Councilor Weeb. Recommended the rules of procedure relating to the addition of the, to the agenda where public notice is not being provided be suspended to allow for consideration of a motion for the Perry Inc. to lease space in River Mill Park. Have a resolution that says staff report back to general committee regarding the request from Aaron Asser and John Gallagher to lease a portion of River Mill Park and dock area for a dining tourist attraction in 2021. Is there a mover and seconder for that? And I think at this point, council or council, we need to have a maybe have a discussion as to whether this is something that we're interested in having in the park before we require staff to go back and prepare reports on it. Councillor Withy. Thank you, Worship. Um, Mayor Terziano. I, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I didn't hear that you called the vote on the motion to suspend. Did I miss that? I don't know. I, I didn't sign it. Maybe I didn't. So the rules to suspend, we had a mover second. Are all in favor? I'm always counting because we need two thirds. That's Harry's. Okay. Councillor with you. Um, this, I, 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 I really want more information on this. I think it's an interesting thing. It's obviously being done in other places in the world. And I, I, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't want to dismiss it out of hand after just hearing about it today. So I, I do want more information on this. I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying ultimately it's going to fly or get support, but I think it's interesting to look at. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I guess I would say that it, it is an interesting concept, but um, the uh, usage of River Mill Park for this just does not fly uh, at all with me. It just seems like a totally inappropriate usage of the park. And, and from the um, maps that we saw, um, it looks like a good portion of River Mill Park would be taken up uh, during this lease. So. Um, I guess I would be okay with this. It may be another location, but definitely not River Mill Park. Deputy Mayor Althoff. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I, echoing what Councillor Thompson just said, I, I don't want to dismiss it completely, but I, uh, so I, I think a staff report is, is not a bad idea. Having said that, I don't think I, I personally could see it in this location. I thought there were a number of issues that were raised and I'm not quite sure how they get around them. And that is the location of where, where they're proposing to do it vis-a-vis -vis our current existing docks. I think the number of us talked about, you know, we know various events use that for swimming and little kids as Councillor Stone said, use that for, for swimming. And I don't see the two being compatible. I also think um, there are some issues around planning and developing that particular uh, portion of, of the waterfront. Um, and so, and I, I, you know, again, I, I'm not poo-pooing the idea. It's great when people come forward with new ideas, um, but I'm not sure if our staff is going to spend time on it. I think it would be good if, if they could look at potentially altern alternate locations that might work for the applicant. So that would be my hope. Councillor Wee. Uh, thank you, Worship, through you. I, I was less than uh, overwhelmed by this idea. I find it a little bit, I, I just find it a little bit unsuitable and dare I say, just a, a touch tacky. Um, I don't know, it didn't, didn't excite me one bit. I think the location is a non-starter. I think we're gonna be sending our staff off to uh, do research on something that just simply, I think will not fly this year. It just won't. That's my that's my thought on it. I think maybe if they were interested in, in in the applicant doing some research for next year and doing a little more homework on 
the ins and outs of Huntsville. Um, that might be a little bit more uh, up my alley, but at this time I wouldn't consider it. I, um, I kind of agree with you, Councillor Weed, in that I don't really think this is something that we should task our staff with doing. If the applicant or the, the deputation came with an idea, but without enough detail for us to actually make a decision. And I'm not sure it's our job to go out and, you know, fluff up their plan for them. Um, but I guess they want to know whether or not we're open to it at all. And I think I'm hearing that we might be open to it, but we would need a lot more detail and this might not be the location. So how much work they would do based on that, I'm not sure. Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Your Worship. I think Councillor Stone was first, but I'll take the opportunity. Sorry, Bob. Um, I tend to agree with Your Worship and, and Councillor Weeb that um, we're going to, we think it's a great idea, but there's not enough information. And I think if we do send staff away, that we're wasting their time because I don't think there will be enough of an appetite for us to approve it. So I would say we don't waste staff's time. Councillor Thompson? Oh, sorry, Councillor Stone was first. Sorry. Councillor Stone. No worries at all. Actually, it's all been said. Uh, uh, I, I agree with Councillor Weeb and yourself and Fitzgerald that, you know, this is, this is clearly not the location. I could never support it there. Um, if I, I don't want to waste staff's time, if the applicant wants to reinvestigate after having heard this conversation today and bring back a proposal for another location, then I say, let them do so. But for now, the answer is no for me. Councillor Thompson. Well, thank you, uh, Your Worship. And on, on another matter, um, we recently uh, passed a resolution to uh, hire a consultant for uh, Waterfront in the town of Huntsville. And um, this kind of a, an operation might impact uh, uh, on recommendations coming from the consultant. So um, I would, in that vein, think that uh, this year would be totally inappropriate uh, to even consider this anywhere uh, on our waterfronts until we hear from our consultant and then we can maybe go forward from that. Madam Clerk, when I see you, I know I'm gonna get in trouble. Not at all, Mayor Terziano. Um, if council chooses not to, um, is, if council does not like this motion today, but might, may like it in the future if they have in more information from the applicant and therefore may want to seek a staff report in the future, I suggest maybe council might want to withdraw this motion um, so that staff report could come back at a later time should, should the applicant come back with more information than you choose. Um, I just also need to know, Mayor Terziano, the mover and seconder on this motion that put it on the floor. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't have one yet because I wasn't sure we were going to put it on the floor. I'm not, I'm not sure we have a mover and seconder for this motion. Okay. So to discuss the matter, you have to put the motion on the floor, but... Oh, that, right. that... <laughs> Hang on, can I, can I get a mover and seconder? Councillor Whitney moves. Is there a seconder? Councillor Armour, okay. So I'm still hearing that we don't really want to task our staff to come back um, with a report, which is what the motion says. So we're either going to defeat this motion or we're going to amend it. Councillor Schumacher. Sorry, through you, Your Worship. Do you mean defeat or withdraw? Tanya said something about withdrawing the, the motion. Again, I think what some people are wanting is maybe a little more information, but we don't want our staff to be the ones to do the information. And I myself have a bit of an issue, you know, licensing a public space and having it at a public river mill park, obviously, as we've said. Okay, so I have a motion to withdraw the motion. Councillor Withy, are you moving that? T Tanya's back. <laughs> yeah, Tanya. 
Thank you, Mayor Terziano. Um, with council's consent, you can withdraw the motion and that's all you have to do. Okay. With council's con all in favor of withdrawing the motion. Okay, that carries, that's withdrawn. And uh, I trust that staff then will communicate to the deputation the gist of this discussion. I think we were better off when we did things the wrong way. All right, we're down to the re request for reduction in the security amount for Huntsville Highlands subdivision. Once again, I need a mover and seconder to suspend the rules of procedure. Deputy Mayor Alpop. Mr. Schumacher, it's recommended the rules of procedure related to the additions to the agenda where public notice has not been provided for, be suspended to allow for consideration of a motion for the requested reduction for security amount for a plan of subdivision Huntsville Highlands, Muskoka, Inc. All in favor. All in favor to get to suspend the rules? Okay, carry. Uh, if I get a mover and seconder, I have a resolution for, for a staff report to come back on this one. Councillor Stone, Deputy Mayor Alcock, moved and seconded. It is recommended the staff be directed to report back regarding the Huntsville Highland Muskoka request to reduce the required security amount for internal works on, on a plan of subdivision from 100% to 20%. Questions, uh, Deputy Mayor Alcock? I, I thank you, Your Worship. I guess it goes without saying that if we're asking staff to to go back and do some work on on this particular request, that in that in that uh, brief there will be reference to what the district is is doing and why they decided to do it. Because I don't know if that's entirely as clear as how it was presented. I, I it's not that I don't believe Lanny. I do. I just I think. I would like more information around why the district decided to do what it did. So it, hopefully that would be included in the in the note. Okay, uh, Councillor Stone. Um, so we're asking staff to ask to uh, come back with a recommendation about this particular file. Um, should they not also consider this option for all applications? Kirsten, are you there? Yes, I am, Your Worship. Would you, um, if, if this direction was about this file, I mean, the deputation was only on this file. So where would you see it going? Would you see it going as a potential policy? Um, I think that that could be better determined once we've looked into it a bit more and have more information. But yes, we can actually... Um, I, I would be comfortable making it um, not just specific to this application. Thanks. Councillor Thompson and then Councillor Fitzgerald. Okay, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, and I'm, I'm good with uh, Kirsten's explanation on that. Uh, I think that uh, that's where I would like to go with that too. Thanks. Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't know if uh, Director Hearn's still with us. Maybe he could discuss the pitfalls of not having enough of uh, um, a security arrangement to finish a project that doesn't get completed. I think that um, he can probably enlighten us and do we want to spend staff time on it? Um, I know the district did it, and I think that if we could uh, do it some investigative work to have it for affordable housing. I think that would be a good incentive to make that uh, make that happen. But let's hear about the pitfalls of not having enough security. If you don't mind, Steve, I didn't see you again. Steve? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Terziano. So staff uh, received this request basically yesterday from the consultants when they sent the numbers through. And we, we've been talking about it and did some quick research um, to, to Deputy Mayor Alcock's point. District put some strict controls on there. Basically, no building permits be issued. 
Um, I can tell you from, from public works staff perspective and the short discussion we've had on it today, we will not be supporting this. Uh, we, we do cash securities to finish projects. It's not uncommon to have to finish a project for a developer and cash the securities. So we need to make sure that we have at least 100%. Uh, we're actually thinking the other way uh, because of inflationary costs, we sometimes get behind the eight ball because these projects take quite some time to finish. We collect securities at the beginning of the job and 10 years into it, and we realize the developer isn't going to do it. We sometimes don't have enough funds to complete the job. So we were actually looking to bring something back shortly um, or to, to, to talk to planning about amending the process where this could be updated and additional fees would be brought in. But if, if you know, we'll certainly review it and do a full full report, but I can tell you from, from an operations perspective, we would not support this at all. If it was going to be supported, there'd be some long, strong conditions in there. Namely, there would be no, no building permits issued, not even footing permits, because once somebody builds a road or once somebody builds a house, they have an expectation that the road is gonna be plowed and it's gonna be finished and it's gonna be maintained. And a lot of the time we're caught in the middle as the municipality trying to deal with this. Um, nature's way out in Woodland Heights is a great example. I think the road was, was probably 50% built with houses. Unfortunately, the developer had passed away and we were left holding the bag to finish it off. Um, luckily enough, we were able to secure enough um, security deposits, cashed them all in and finished the project. But uh, if we did not have that, if we only had the 20%, the developer would be in a position to walk away. Uh, we had a situation last year where we had to look at revoking and, and pulling in the development or the, sorry, the securities and realize the project had been on the books so long that we were, we were well behind the eight ball. And it was only through good luck that, that the developer had to come back uh, to, to us for other reasons. And we were able to get them to pony up the rest of the security money and have now forced them to finish the project. So the securities is a tool to get these jobs done. I, I, I hear what the developer's saying. There's other ways that we can help limit the cost. Uh, they can break their project down into smaller components. You know, they talk about today a $2 million security they have to put up, but they're also talking about building three roads. Well, let's do it one road at a time and that would reduce their costs. So there's other ways to look at it and we'll certainly work with uh, uh, Christian Maxwell's team to, to put the report together on you. But I can tell you right now, um, operations will not be supporting it. Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, quickly, thank you, Your Worship. I, just quickly to sort of further that, I, I would support the idea of, of our staff looking at um, the whole security issue with respect to affordable housing um, developments, because I, I have talked to a couple of developers then, and it's, it's killing them. So um, on that regard, on that front, I, I think it's worth exploring. I totally hear what, um, Director Hernan just said, and I absolutely respect where he's coming from. Um, but uh, uh, the thing I do want to add, while Director Maxwell is pursuing this, hopefully, um, I believe that the subcommittee at the Housing Task Force, the Finance Subcommittee, one of the issues that they have been exploring regarding, um, you know, how to make headway on affordable housing and financing, where they were looking at the issue of securities. So that was why I was asking about the district's uh, role before. So you might um, contact the people that are involved in that subcommittee, uh, Kirsten, because some of that work might be, may be already underway. Okay. The resolution asks staff to come back and let us know what's a good plan. So all in favor? Opposed? That carries. Uh, our last deputation was for the bistro at the Port Sydney Beach. Is there a mover and seconder to put that on the table? No mover and seconder to suspend the rules. Councillor Whitby, moving. Deputy Mayor Alpha. Seconds. It's recommended that the rules of procedure relating to additions to the agenda where public notice is not being provided be suspended to allow for consideration of a motion for the picnic bistros to go request to operate a refreshment vehicle on town property in Port Sydney. All in favor. And that carries. 
So would need a mover and seconder for a resolution that says it's recommended that staff be directed to report back to council regarding the request received from Rob Taylor, Picnic Bistro to go to lease space year round at the waterfront or community center in Port Sydney for an outdoor dining establishment. Is there a mover and seconder for that resolution? Councilor Withy, are you moving? Is there a seconder? Councilor Fitzgerald, is your hand up as a seconder? No. Is there a seconder for the motion? No, well, then I guess, no. Councilor Fitzgerald, you seconding? Okay. Discussion. Councilor Fitzgerald, your hand's up for that, I know. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I second the motion in, in fairness to the applicant to uh, give him an opportunity to have a food truck. Um, I think we should probably wait until we review our, our bylaw process regarding the food trucks. Um, it's not a completed application and uh, I got the thing he's just feeling the waters out and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Andrew, if, if you're still with us. Um, I'll reiterate what I said in council on Monday that I don't believe that the municipality should engage this kind of activity on, on public municipal owned land or, or public land for that matter. Um, unless it's for fundraising or a special event. So, um, and I think there may be a question of whether or not that is actually town property or MNR property. So I, I won't I won't be supporting this um, until we have our bylaw addressed. Okay. Councillor Thompson. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, the problem I have with this is the uh, fact that it would be a year-round uh, structure. Um, and uh, it sort of flies in the, in the, uh, in the face of the uh, food truck idea, which is traditionally a seasonal thing. Um, seasonal would be one thing, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't support a year-round uh, uh, facility for, uh, and, and as Councillor Fitzgerald said, uh, particularly if it is on, uh, on municipal property. Councillor Weed. Councillor Schumacher. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. Yeah, I, I mean, I echo Councillor Fitzgerald. I wouldn't be supporting it. I don't agree. I mean, Port Sydney, they use that opportunity, Canada Day, and different things to be able to do the odd barbecue and event. So I want to be able to keep that space viable for Parks and Rec to get the money they need to do the events that they would need. Um, again, I've had <laughs> two or three calls already today, just as people have heard this come forward. So, um, I, and, and as he said, year round, but of course he wants the best of both worlds. He wants to have it uh, for six months of the summer, right on the beach, and then move possibly to uh, Smith's or by the highway and get the gas uh, revenue. This, this year, for sure, definitely with COVID, those businesses there in Port Sydney right now maybe can have two or three people that can come in. They're not large businesses, and I really would want to support the ones that are there currently. And I would really not want to see a licensed venue on a public beach. Okay. Any further comments? Uh, Andrew? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. If I could just clarify for, I believe it was Councillor Fitzgerald, um, when he made a, a suggestion about waiting for the refreshment vehicle bylaw, um, this this vehicle or, or structure here would not actually fall under the bylaw. The process would be the owner would have to enter into a lease or a rental agreement with the town. Um, and I believe that would be through uh, Jessica Smith. Um, because they're renting the property, there would be no refreshment vehicle license, but we would make them, uh, if you 
will jump through the hoops and have all the inspections and certifications done prior to opening. The, the reason for that is if he's paying rent, uh, be it monthly or an annual fee, um, we don't want to, uh, if, if I could use the expression, double dip and charge him for a pressure vehicle license as well. Andrew, is that because we would be the owners? Because I mean, they, they, the uh, licensing that we do on food trucks in town, they pay somebody to be there. True. Uh, thank you, Worship. That's a great question. Uh, that you are 100% correct. But when it comes to the bylaw, all I need to see is a piece of paper with the owner of the property giving them the refreshment vehicle permission to be there and for what length of time. If, if they get it for $100 a month or $1,000 a month or $0, that's really uh, not my um, really not my business or concerns. I just need the permission factor. I guess that might bring us to the question, do we have a bylaw that deals with refreshment vehicles on town owned property? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Great question. The answer is no. Councillor Fitzgerald. Okay, I got it. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Exactly why um, we agreed to revisit this on, on Monday night at Council. So I think the bylaw needs to be more comprehensive to include things like that. I, I just really feel that strongly that the groups that do their fundraising and the special events that, that raise funds for everything that happens. And we have wonderful groups in this community that raise a lot of money. Um, I think it's just too restrictive. And, and again, to Council Schumacher's point, we need to uh, support the local businesses as well. So. Okay. Um, so the resolution was to have staff uh, report back to council regarding the request. Uh, all in favor of that resolution? And opposed? And that's defeated. Okay. That is the end of our deputation. And we have to go into closed session still, but Councillor Thompson requested to give us some information at the end of the meeting. Councillor Thompson, do you still have something that you want to briefly update us on? I, uh, <laughs> I do, Your Worship, and I, I heard very briefly. <laughs> so um, I will be as brief as I can here. Just want to do a little bragging uh, on behalf of the uh, of public works. Um, as we uh, heard earlier on, the all the roads have been swept. Um, and this was proactive on the part of, uh, of our director and, and our manager of operations because they saw that it was in early spring. So, hey, get the sweepers out early rather than having a set date on that. And so as of right now, all of the uh, roads have been swept and, uh, <clears throat> and the district roads as well. And so we'll be uh, charging uh, $20,000 to the district for doing their their, um, their roads. Um, one other thing is since we've gone to this new, uh, this new system, uh, there's, there's a lot more I could be talking about, but I'm, I'm going to sort of touch on the highlights here. But since we've gone to the uh, two ship system, uh, the last three years uh, implemented by, uh, by Director Hernan, uh, we have not lost any time to uh, WSIB at all this year. Um, so, and that's, that was not the case uh, up until we went, uh, we went to this, uh, this system. Um, at, at, at that time, we were relying a lot on staff overtimes and that kind of thing. And um, uh, there was a lot of burnout, whereas we didn't have that problem at all this year. So we didn't have a single uh, lost time to injury this year uh, to WSIB. And the other thing that I think is really, uh, uh, really uh, worth noting is um, starting, I think, I think it was probably two years ago, we started recycling the winter sand. And if you notice the sweepers were out, they were accompanied by a, uh, a tandem truck. And so the, um, this, the uh, sand that was picked up uh, was, was brought back to the yard and then it was actually uh, recycled. And um, the net result of all of this is that um, we saved a whack of money by reusing the sand. It, 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 it's not just brought back, it's recycled. It's, it's, it goes through a screening process and there's a cost to that, but the net saving 
to the to the taxpayers is uh, around twenty thousand bucks by using this particular process. Twenty thousand uh, dollars is what we'll save this this year. Uh, we usually start the winter um, with at least fifteen thousand tons. Uh, we have five thousand left over from last year, and we reclaimed another three thousand from sweeping. Uh, from the 10,000 that we, that we would have put on roads this past season. So anyway, we, uh, th these are just a few of the highlights. So your worship, I appreciate the time to uh, do a little bragging on behalf of, uh, of, uh, of our staff down at, uh, at Public Works. And uh, um, that's basically it. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Councillor. And uh, the bragging's justified, although I, and I really appreciate you guys sweeping early, but you swept before I had a chance to push my sand out in the road. So could you come back? <laughs> Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I just really had to say, I thank you, Councillor Thompson, for, for saying that. Um, it, it's one of, funny, those things. I uh, was out walking my dog the other day with a, a friend, and um, <laughs> out of the blue, I said, oh, my God, the sanding trucks are here. That's early. I was so excited and I think she thought I was a little, a little bit off because I'm noticing the, the, the sweeping, not sanding, the sweeping trucks. I, it's, it's amazing, it was such a great job has been done this year and really noticeable. So I thank you for raising it and thank you to the team, great job. Okay, Council, I have a resolution moved by Deputy Mayor Alcock, seconded by Councilor Armour, is recommended that the next portion of the meeting be closed to the public, commencing now at 3.02 p.m. for the purpose of considering the following matter pertaining to Section 239.2F of the Municipal Act. F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that pur purpose. Confidential Report Development 2021-46, Appeal Decision, Reasons for Short-Term Rental Accommodation Property, 207 Woodland Drive. And uh, I think we will be quick and close and there will be a resolution coming out. All in favor? And that carries and we have to leave the meeting and zoom back in under close.
missing one but I think we're all right okay I have a resolution moved by Councillor Fitzgerald seconded by Deputy Mayor Alcock be it resolved that committee provide the appellant the following reasons as to why the STR license for 207 Woodland Drive was reinstated with conditions upon careful review of the documents submitted by the appellants committee feels that the complaints lodged against the property were valid and are concerned about future complaints. The outcome of the charges laid by the OPP or subsequent conviction is not a relevant factor and not a determining factor. The fact that charges were laid constitutes a strike in accordance with the STR bylaw. The owners and the representatives were asked if they would allow the same infractions to occur again and they indicated they would. If the license was reinstated without a probationary period to the end of 2021, this restriction of one strike may remain for the duration of the property being subject to this program. And if the license was reinstated without limiting the number of strikes an additional three separate occasions, occurrences would need to take place for staff to revoke the license. Further, that staff be directed to forward a copy of the reasons stated above to the app appellant. And further that it is for these reasons the committee will opt to re reinstate the STR license with the identified condition. Questions? All in favor? That carries. And that's it, Council. I have a resolution moved by Councillor Stone, seconded by Councillor Armour, is recommended that we do now adjourn at 3.08 p.m. All in favor? And that carries. That was a long one. Thanks, everyone.